Good evening, everyone. I'm calling the meeting to order. And we'll start with roll call. Certainly. Mayor Brook? Here. Vice Mayor Sara? Commissioner Simmons? Here. Commissioner Bowen? Here. Commissioner Carter? Present. City Manager Babinick? Here. City Attorney Hearn? Here. Thank you. All right. And Vice Mayor Sarah is here. So before we do the moment of silence, I'm just going to share with you all my planned order for this evening. We're going to come a little out of order. Uh, we anticipate a lot of speakers on two particular items. Uh, we're going to save that for last. If you are here for the public hearing on either of the public hearing items regarding uh, the property um, on the northwest corner here or regarding Chick-fil-A, you don't have to speak during public comment, which will come in order. You'll be able to speak during the public hearing items uh, at that time. Uh, I love people when they clap for the pledgers. But today, because we have a longer meeting regarding the other matters, if you really love what, something say, what somebody's saying, I'm asking you to just clap this way, right? So it's a silent clap. Everybody clear with me? If you have any objection to that, you are welcome to leave the room. Great. No objections. Please rise for a moment of silence. For whoever might be in your heart. Thank you so much. And my prayers out there for everybody that's suffering. So we have with us tonight Sydney and Avery Skolnick that are going to lead us in the pledge. Hey. Avery, <laughs> Sydney, come on right up over there. And Avery, what grade are you in? Fourth. What school? Oak Springs Elementary. Beautiful. How do you like it there? Great. All right. What a big smile. And how about you, Sydney? Where do you go to school? Park Springs. And do you like going to school with your brother? Yes. Awesome. Are you ready to do the pledge? Yes. yes. All right. We're ready on the count of three. One, two, three. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fantastic. Vice Mayor, will you join me? Here you go. Is there any idea what you guys wanted to do when you grow up? <laughs> I already did something. So you do anything. Uh, thank you. So we're, oh, can we open up the T-shirts for the pictures? Awesome. Uh, you guys are special. So it's so nice to meet you guys. And we have things for you too. Thank you. So I don't usually make this offer, but Skolnick family, if uh, you would like to have a lunch with me, all four of you, during the holiday season, be my pleasure, be my treat. You're welcome. All right, we have no recognitions or proclamations tonight, and next up is public comment. Do we have any public sign speakers? We do. Our first sign speaker is Richard Goldman. Great. And, and Mayor White, Mr. Goldman's coming up. Just to re reiterate what you stated, if you are here for the City Village or the Chick-fil-A items, they need to be done during the public hearing for those items. Otherwise, it won't be considered part of the record for that case. As you know, those uh, 
or quasi-judicial and have to be handled that way. Great. All right, so again, uh, public comment. We have the first speaker. All right, and the next speaker. Rob Scheip. Rob. And you're not here on uh, the other items. Great. And Rob, if you come on up, if you can give us your address. All right. My name is Rob Scheip. I live at 6786 Northwest 43rd Place in Coral Springs. Um, thank you. I'm a resident of the estates at Turtle Run. We're having problems with our leadership and management of our homeowners association. As you may be aware, residential HOAs have no gov government oversight or departments to help with oversight issues. The estates at Turtle Run HOA has not held a meeting in over a year and refuses to hold our annual meeting, which in our govern doc governing documents state is required to be held on the first Tuesday of December unless changed by a duly held meeting. Board member elections are to be held at the annual meeting and our HOA documents state that board member tenure is for one year, so we have, had, have no legally sitting board since uh, 2022. The reason I'm bringing this before you today is that Chris Capish, the sitting Turtle Run Estates board member and president is trying to have the zoning department change an agreement between the city of Coral Springs, the estates at Turtle Run, and the Turtle Run Community Development District. The city zoning department is scheduled to have a meeting with Chris Capish on or around November 15th to discuss removing the Turtle Run CDD from the agreement for responsibility for three brick paver entrances into the neighborhood. These are city streets, not HOA property. There are multiple problems with this request. We have had no elected board for the year 2023. The paver replacement work spending was not authorized by the HOA board as it was tabled at the last meeting that we had for, um, in October of 2022. But Mr. Capish has already signed contracts for the work with three companies totaling approximately $180,000. And this violates Florida statute 720-3055 which requires any work proposed that exceeds 10% of the HOA budget that, that it must be put out to the bid and this was not complied with. So please be aware of these issues occurring at the Estates of Turtle Run and do not enter into any new agreements with Mr. Capish or the Estates of Turtle Run until a duly elected board is elected and all Florida statutes are complied with. Thank you. Thank you for coming before us. And that while I didn't give this preface before, if you are here for public comment, our commission doesn't usually necessarily engage in back and forth banter, uh, but we will reserve comments for later in the meeting for the city commission comments. Next speaker. Deborah Leah Isa Kovics. Okay. And the next one. Randall Cutter. Good evening, Randall. Good evening, Randall Cutter, 423 Northwest 118th Avenue. I'm the pastor of New Dawn Community Church. I co-chair the Clergy Coalition. However, tonight I am here as an advocate for the Jewish community. Esteemed mayor, vice mayor, and commissioners. May I first offer you my compliments for taking swift action after the October 7th terror attack on Israel by releasing a statement on the 11th supporting Israel and our own Jewish community. However, I believe events have taken us to a point where a simple statement is now not enough. In addition to the genocidal hatred of Hamas, we have watched as the UN refused to condemn Hamas for its clear crimes against humanity. We have seen growing protests against Israel around the world and even at many universities in the United States where protesters chant genocidal terror slogans. We have seen Israelis hunted by mobs at airports in Dagestan. We have even heard about young people shouting anti-Semitic slurs after a service at Congregation Kol Tikva. Since October 7th, I have been to many events where our community has gathered, and I am here to report that many of our Jewish friends are afraid. Israel has been a sure sign to them that never again really means never again. However, that confidence has been shaken especially because of the strong strains of anti-Semitism that have revealed themselves in our country. I do not celebrate war, but I do, not, but I do recognize when it must be waged. I have been appalled to see many social media posts that diminish the atrocities that Hamas committed against Israelis by stating that Israel is also killing civilians as it wages war for the safety of its citizens on many fronts. 
While the world should mourn over every innocent life lost, we must not allow such false equivalencies to stand. We cannot allow those who hate Israel, who hate the Jewish people, to equate the war Israel is now fighting for its very survival to the intentional targeting of civilian men, women, and children for torture, rape, abuse, and murder. War is awful because it costs so many lives, but what happened on October 7th was not war. It was wanton destruction of human beings for being Jewish. I urge this commission for the sake of our Jewish community to issue a public proclamation or resolution once again taking the strong stance you took on October 11th. I believe this is especially appropriate now in view of world events. I also believe it is important because, of a, pub because a public proclamation from this dais has far more profound impact than a press release and will greatly encourage our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And Remember, remember, thank you for this. This is what I'm asking you all to do. Silent claps, thank you. And uh, my heart is heavy as a result of October 7th, for sure. And I'll reserve more of my comments for later in the meeting. Thank you, Randall, for being here. And our next public speaker. Jean Kasberzak. Welcome, Jean. Good evening. Coral Springs Commission, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, 6879 Northwest 113th Avenue, Parkland, Florida. My name is Jean Kasperzak. I just recently heard a slogan in radical Islam that terrorists sometimes use. Today we come for Saturday people, tomorrow we come for Sunday people. I'm a Sunday person, but what I've seen in the last few weeks is beyond shocking. As a community, we have stood by the thousands and shouted never again, referring to the MSD massacre. But for years, we have studied never again as we were taught about the Holocaust, assuming it would never happen again. But now the terrorists are open and active. They have chased students in New York into libraries and attics. They have raided airports in Russia. They are here in Florida and bold enough to ride into synagogue properties yelling anti-Semitic slurs. I'm a proud I am proud of my city of Parkland who issued a very strong resolution condemning Hamas. And I ask that the city of Coral Springs, a sister city to Parkland that I have great respect for, do the same. I've often said that resolutions are often used to divide populations and often a waste of time, but this is a resolution against pure evil and hatred and must be stopped before it spreads one inch further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I really do appreciate this, everybody. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes, next one. Ronald Dadio. If you'd be kind enough to state your name and your address, we'd appreciate it. Welcome. Ronald Dedeo, 10371 Northwest 44th Street, Coral Springs, 33065. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this opportunity to be able to speak. Speaking before the Canadian Parliament in 1961, our president, John F. Kennedy, said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Best stated by the political theorist John Stuart Mills in 1867, let, let no one pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to accomplish their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. I am not here tonight to detail the atrocities committed against the civilian population of Israel, including innocent women, men, and children nor to defend the action of Israel in our defense of those same innocent civilians, which is causing harm to innocent Palestinians. My motive tonight is simply to add my voice peacefully as a way to display my conscience in petitioning the city of Coral Springs, in which my family has been a resident homeowner for 25 plus years, as well as a business owner, to vote for a resolution of support 
for the nation of Israel. For me not to do so would be nothing less than a callous dereliction of my God-given duty. All one has to do is turn on the TV to see the forces against Israel and watch their despicable, despicable actions. From the halls of Congress to the college campuses to our very streets, they do not remain silent. Their voices are raised in anger, protest, and even violence against Jews who have to remain silent and hidden. Tonight, we have the luxury of going to bed, feeling safe and secu secure, our family and community protected from those who are bent on doing us harm. We can choose to tune out the noise of those that hate us, that want to kill us and destroy us. The nation of Israel does not have the same option. Visions and nightmares of their enemy breaking their doors down, shooting them as they lie asleep, raping their wives and daughters, taking their children as hostages, exposing them to weeks of hellish treatment, having to endure over 27,000 rocket and mortar attacks over the years, and then asking them to engage in a ceasefire is unrealistic. In the book of Ecclesiastic, chapter 3, verse 7, Solomon says, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. And I believe this is a time for our city to speak with a clarion call. Proverbs 18.1 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. It is with that mind that I respectfully ask this commission tonight to search their hearts and vote for a resolution of support for the nation of Israel. This vote most certainly will not appease everyone in our city, but I can assure you it, it, who it will please, our, our creator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker? Rabbi Brad Boxman. Welcome, Rabbi. It's good to see you. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, my name is Rabbi Brad Boxman, 6750 University Drive in Parkland. I cannot add to the eloquent words that have already been said. I'm humbled by Jew and non-Jew alike who have come to ask this august body to proclaim your detest for hatred. Yes, my congregation this past Shabbat was targeted by those who drove by on bicycles and said, kill the Jews as they came out of the synagogue. So it's right here in our backyard. I just want to say one thing. To take a stand against hatred against Hamas does not mean that one is for war or for the casualties and deaths that inevitably come because of it. And anyone with a heart can feel the pain of the Palestinian people as well. And whatever proclamation you make, I hope that you include a recognition of the pain and suffering of those innocents in Gaza as well, and recognize that the only solution will be a negotiated peace at some point. But in the meantime, Israel must do everything it can to extinguish the existential threat, not just from Gaza, but on all of its borders, all backed by one support, Iran. Just ask yourself one question. Palestinian Authority, the only ones that do recognize Israel's right to exist, Given all the grievances and all the conflict, the other three on the borders do not recognize Israel's right to exist, period. And so I thank you all for listening to the beautiful words that have preceded me. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. And our next speaker? Mayor, that is all you have. OK, would comment. somebody else from the public like to be heard on anything other than the couple of public hearing items that are coming up? Sounds good. Our public comments are closed. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, in order to be efficient, I am asking for us to rework our agenda a little bit tonight. Um, and obviously, I'm asking all, all of the colleagues. So I know that we have items four and five regarding Chick-fil-A to deal with. We have consent. We have all of that. So I am asking, um, I am asking for us to pretty much move Items one, two, and three. Uh, items one, two, and three to the back of the agenda, um, so that we can take care of consent, which doesn't take usually doesn't take that long of time. We'll get Chick Fil A um, going first because that should not take as long as items one, two, and three. 
Um, or yeah, one, two, and three. I believe. So we've already moved two and three. Oh, we have? Did we I have. miss that? Yeah. When did that happen? At the beginning. Where was I? Was I sitting here? I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you think item one would be long as well? No. <laughs> sorry. Okay. No, it's already done. We're good. Oh, gosh. Okay. We're on to number one, Ordinance 2023-121, first reading amending FY 2023, operating budget. This is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, pursuant to Section 166.041 Florida Statutes to amend Ordinance 2022-114, as amended by Ordinance 2023-113, finalizing and adopting the annual operating budget and capital improvement program for fiscal year 22-23 by amending Exhibit A, the annual operating budget, Provided for conflict, provided uh, for severability, provided for an effective date. This request to hold a public hearing, approve, and set second reading. Thank you, JJ. Good evening, Eliana. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. We're bringing our charter school fund for fiscal year 23 an amendment. It's about $279,000. Uh, there is a overlap between the charter schools fiscal year they begin July 1 and we begin October 1 so we do have an overlap the $279,000 is going to cover books that were purchased and this is being covered through uh, state FTE dollars and grants there is no city millage no ad valorem taxes go into the charter school fund this is all covered by grants and state FTE monies that the charter school receives any questions for Eliana? All right, it's a request to approve. Move to so, approve. And it's a, to hold a public hearing. So there's a public hearing item. Would anybody in the public like to be heard on this item? Okay, Commissioner Carter has moved to approve it. Second. Second by the Vice Mayor. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, next item is the conditional use petition on item number four, uh, Chick-fil-A CA 23-0004. So again, if you came late to the meeting, items two and three will be heard at the end of the agenda, item number 15, but before commission communications. And Mayor, item four is the conditional use petition for Chick-fil-A, and item five is the special exception pe petition, so I will read those. We will, we will have those uh, uh, as one hearing. Got you. Thank you. Yep. So uh, item four is a request to hold a quasi-judicial hearing and public hearing to approve petition of Nicole Cinchetti on behalf of CFNA NC Townridge Square LLC and Karen and Revere Living Trust seeking conditional use approval in accordance with the Land Development Code Section 2505685 to permit improvements for the expansion of the drive through of an existing fast food restaurant, Chick-fil-A, within the, within the community business B2 and low medium density multifamily RM15 zoning districts located at 1331 through 1341 University Drive, east of lots 13 block W, Ramblewood South, and authorize the city attorney's officer to draft an order approving CA 23004 and adopts that order. Request to hold a public hearing and a quasi-judicial hearing in this case has been waived approve, authorize, and adopt. The special exception is a request to hold a quasi-judicial hearing, public hearing to approve petition of the Cole Chianchetti on behalf of CFNA-NC Townridge Square, LLC, and Carol Ann Revere Living Trust seeking special exception, approval from Land Development Code Section 250819, drive through service windows, lanes, markings, and stacking spaces required relative to drive through lane configuration to accommodate proposed improvements to an existing fast food restaurant, Chick-fil-A, within the community business B2 and the low medium density multifamily RM15 zoning dis districts located at 1331 through 1341 University Drive, east of University Drive and south of Northwest 14th Street, legally described as a portion of parcels L and lots one through three block W, Ramblewood South, and authorized city attorney's officer draft an order approving SC 23-06 and adopt said order Request to hold a public hearing. The quasi-judicial has been waived, approved, authorized, and adopt. Thank you, JJ. Good evening. Good evening. If you can have the presentation up, please. Thank you. So I'm here to present on behalf of staff for Chick-fil-A for their 
conditional use application and their special exception application. The conditional use is for the expansion of the fast food restaurant and drive through lane. And the uh, special exception is for the drive through lane. And I'll walk us through what that special exception is for. Here is the location map. The property consists of 2.91 acres. It includes the three parcels that are outlined uh, along the rear of the existing Chick-fil-A. This is their existing site plan. If you look at the screen and see the arrows in red, currently the drive-through comes from university and you circulate along the southern portion of the parcel and then exit. Chick-fil-A has submitted a site plan to increase the building about 232 square feet and add an additional drive-through lane. We've been working well with the Chick-fil-A team to ensure that the drive-through improvements that they're proposing would be, would be more efficient for their circulation so it doesn't, their, their vehicles do not stack up onto university. So if, if you look at the screen now in yellow, you can see that the additional drive-through lane and uh, the existing drive-through lane are now circulating through those three properties along the rear, and they have added some more parking spaces. The special exception that they are requesting is for the bypass lane. They currently have an escape lane. These are the proposed elevations. Not much is being ch changed from the current elevations. And at PNZ, in, during the PNZ meeting, we heard some concerns about the landscaping and how it looks and feels along the rear. So the Chick fil A team um, met with us and met with the residents, um, and um, they came back with a landscape plan that was a bit more beefed up. And um, Casey, our city arborist, reviewed it, and um, she thought it was a great improvement. This is the criteria for the conditional use analysis and for the special exception. These are staff uh, recommendations, which are very typical of the recommendations that we uh, provide for the fast food restaurants and drive throughs And I'm here to answer any questions that you have of staff. The applicant is here as well, and they have a presentation to provide to you, too. Great. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> This is a public hearing. Would somebody from the public like to be heard? Okay, come on down. And you can have the mic over here. And if you'd give us your name and address, please. My name is Cynthia Weiner. I live at 2639 North Riverside Drive, apartment 904 in Pompano Beach, Florida. I have a property in Coral Springs, but I'm also the personal representative for my father's estate, which is the property that butts up against um, Chick-fil-A, 1335 Northwest 94th Way. Um, I was at the last planning and zoning meeting, and I was one of the only residents that showed up, or owners, um, and I just want to say thank you to planning and zoning, to the Chick-fil-A attorney. Um, and to everybody, because they have been responsive. I did bring up the concern that they're taking away my beautiful wooded area, my view, um, and that we were just gonna look at a wall. And I said, can we do anything else? Because they were just proposing shrubs at that point. So I was concerned about my investment. Am I, you know, am I, is my property value gonna go down? And then also the noise issue. So I have been in touch with planning and zoning, as well as the attorney. And they reassured me that if there's any problems that I can always come to them or um, code enforcement or whatever and report the issues and that they're gonna help me out. So I just, I'm just here to say thank you for everybody listening to me and hopefully it all works out. Thanks to hear, thank you. Thank you. 
Would anyone else from the public like to be heard on this item? <coughs> so the public hearing is closed. With any, without any questions, we'll entertain a motion. And you want a motion separately for number four? Yes, for the conditional use and for the special exception. Mayor, the petitioner is here. I don't know if you need to have any questions. That's fine if you don't. Anyone have any questions for the petitioner? Yes, Commissioner Mateo Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, good evening. For the record, Christina Belenke of Dunning, Miss and Backman. My address is 14 Southeast 4th Street in Boca Raton. Thank and I did speak with Christina earlier today. Okay, we'll, we'll fill, out, fill out the form for you. Great. Thank you, Christina, for being here. Um, as we did speak earlier, one of my concerns was the uh, landscaping. And I would love if you can clarify, will there be both uh, landscaping on both sides of the wall to create a buffer? Yes, um, I do have a presentation with a couple slides. I do have the landscape plan that I'm happy to share with you. Um, I'll go through this quickly. I know, uh, you know staff has done a great job explaining the requests. Um, we obviously know where the property is located and uh, Tina went through kind of how the drive through is going to function differently. Um, so again, this is our site plan walking you through the uh, reconfigured drive through going to the rear of the property. Um, and here's our proposed landscape plan. Mm -hmm. um, so we did meet with staff between the planning and zoning board meeting and uh, this evening and also um, understood that the concerns yeah, of the residents, so thank you. <laughs> um, so we really did work with staff. Um, your staff is incredible, I must say. They really advocate for the city and for the residents. And uh, they asked us, to see what we can do to increase the landscaping for the residents. Um, specifically, the area, the larger area to the northern portion of the site, that's a retention area. Uh, previously, we weren't proposing to put any trees in there, um, and the city's arborist said, okay, let's find trees that will thrive in that area and let's see what you can put in there. So we've added all of those trees since the last meeting. Um, in addition, we've worked with, again, the city arborist uh, to ensure that there is landscaping on both sides of the wall. So we have a variety of palms on the northern portion, um, northeast portion of the site. Um, as we go down, there's live oaks, there's satin leaf, there's a hedge on both sides of the wall, and there's canopy on both sides of the wall. And the canopy is staggered. We have a variety of trees, so, so, so some will be larger and some will be smaller so that um, you know, the canopy growth goes in between the trunks and it's not all just at one level, but there provides a pretty significant buffer to and view uh, buffer uh, between the residential units and the drive through. Um, in addition, one of the conditions of approval is that we provide uh, certain canopy trees at 14 to 16 feet at the time of planting. In this instance, we've actually worked again with the city arborist to uh, identify trees that can be planted at a minimum 18 feet at the time of planting. So we have live oaks, we have satin leaf trees uh, that will actually even exceed the condition of approval that asks for higher trees and will be exceeding those by two feet at the time of planting. Um, so we've really worked with the city and city staff to ensure that you know we're replacing this green area with something that is going to provide a really attractive appearance. It might be different from what is there today. I understand um, on site there's actually a lot of invasives that would be required to be removed anyways. Um, so it's not gonna look the same, but we are providing you know, a nice attractive landscape area. It will be more manicured, but um, we really do believe it'll be beneficial to the residents as well. Thank you, Christina. That's all for me, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions? Just one. Yes. Well, the residents, um, because the northern wall is open, that area is open, so the residents will have access to that area because that was one of the concerns. They said that they had used it for play and things like that. I'm, I'm sorry, what area is open? The northern area that faces the street. So regardless of the wall, they'll still have access to get into that area if they wanted to. Um, are we speaking uh, above that retention area? Yes. Um, so I believe the wall extends along the eastern perimeter of the property. I don't believe there's anything on that northern property boundary, so they would be able to access through there. Okay, thank you. 
And thank you for the extra tall trees. Of course. Hey, was there a motion on the floor? I don't recall now. Okay. Well, we'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Vice Mayor first. This is for the conditional use. For the conditional use. Yeah, I too want to thank Christina for her time on the phone because um, I was really trying to wrap my head around how this was going to flow. Uh, Julie and Tina, I appreciate your time on site today. Um, Ms. Weiner, I, your concerns were heard loud and clear. Um, when I went out to the site today, I, I was trying to kind of get a feel because there are a lot of evasive trees there and overgrown bushes. And um, looking at the um, opportunity here to clean up that space and put in some new trees and, and make it more attractive um, is a great opportunity. And, and also from a traffic standpoint, we've all experienced a university drive back up um, which has created uh, potential opportunities for accidents out there. So I appreciate the petitioner being uh, sensitive to the residents that live in close proximity. Um, I definitely feel like they've had an opportunity to be heard on this. And uh, I do feel like this is a much needed upgrade to that uh, parcel of land um, to benefit not only uh, the petitioner, but also the safety of our residents. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to echo some of uh, my vice mayor's comments, uh, you know, my four-year-old daughter after soccer practice, she always wants to go to Chick-fil-A. I don't, you know, I guess I'm blessed to be able to go to Chick-fil-A after every soccer practice. Um, but I do, you know, understand how, you know, the safety concerns are there with all the cars that back up, um, back up onto the street. But initially, uh, when we heard about this, I just imagined they were ripping all the trees out and it was just going to be some concrete scape and that was it, you know. Uh, so I am very uh, happy to see that, you know, uh, the petitioners and city staff are able to work together um, and that everybody was able to hear the concerns about the green, you know, that green area being removed because I drive around there daily uh, and I enjoy seeing that area, whether it's invasive or not, but it always looks kind of nice. It's, it's unique. Um, but I am um, happy to see that, you know, there's going to be more... Um, you know, trees and, and different landscaping going on there to make it look even more beautiful while also solving a pretty uh, critical problem with the backup on to university. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any further discussion? Yes, Vice Mayor. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, one of the questions I forgot to ask, uh, what's the timeline of this project if it gets approved? Hi, good evening. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I know Chick-fil-A is getting ready to move pretty quickly on this, and uh, I believe it's in their budget to, to get started as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? No. You gentlemen have uh, taken the words out of my mouth. Nothing else to share. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Can, carries unanimously. Uh, next, we're looking for a vote on item number five, special exception petition SE 23-0006. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, carries unanimously. Thank you. We're on to the consent agenda. Are there any polls? Somebody move like consent. Move Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> All right, carries unanimously. Now I've lost the agenda, so let's go here. Mayor, next is item number 12. Great. Policy formation agreements, general contracting services. Thank you, Frank. Yes, sir. Good evening, Commission. This item is for general contracting service for various utilities and streets project. This includes a lot of underground work that we have throughout the year, as well as concrete work, flat work, curb work. We put out an LOI for general contracting services, and we had four respondents, Ansco Incorporated, Johnson Davis Incorporated, Mark Dan Incorporated, and Pavan Engineering. 
This contract is for three years with three one-year extensions with an estimated expenditure of about a million dollars per year. This will be funded through our utility fund and our stormwater utility fund. And I'm here to answer any questions. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Norris. Uh, can you please, for the record, share why this um, is important and why, how it will benefit our community? This is important because it, has, it provides us with standby contractors for emergency or short notice projects that we need to execute quickly. Larger projects we do put out for competitive bid and this LOI is a form of a bid process mm -hmm. and we can go to these contractors. We've already vetted them. We've checked the references, everything's in check and we can proceed with uh, executing an agreement with them. Thank you, Mr. Norris. That's all for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions? No, All right, would somebody like to move the request to award? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next is item number 13, technology-related items and services. Good evening. Good evening. This is to expand uh, the amount that was approved before, like $350,000 to $950,000 to cover the Microsoft uh, renewal that is coming uh, uh, soon. Any Mayor, questions? If I may just add, uh, this is within the existing budget and it's moving from one vendor to another that provides a higher level of service to the city of Coral Springs at no additional cost. Any questions? Okay, we'll entertain a motion then. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Carries unanimously. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is number 14, appointments of Stephen Arbogast, Arbro, Arbogast and Robert Costick to the Nuisance Abatement Board. Mayor Chief McKean can answer any questions if you have any on these uh, appointments. Chief, you turn sideways, you disappear, you disappear. man. <laughs> You're looking great. Appreciate that. You're welcome. <clears throat> any questions? All right, is there a motion Move to Move to approve? appoint. Second. Any discussion? I'm always happy to have volunteers. Yeah. Any further discussion? Yes, Vice Mayor. Just want to go on the record. I liked both of the videos. Longstanding residents don't want to give back. So wonderful. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next is item number fifteen. We have uh, applicants: Ian Dunn, Sandy Lobel, Michael Monas, Roy Gold, Stephen Scally, Jackie Bolden, Joe Marrera, and Audrey Wong. Uh, these are reappointments to the Community Involved Government Committee, the Environmental <coughs> Sustainability Committee, the Historical Advisory Committee, the MLK Junior Committee, and the Multicultural Adv Advisory Committee. It's a request to reappoint. Move, Move to appoint. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, thank you to the volunteers that have sought reappointment. Ian and Sandy, you are recognized, as well as the others in the room. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for honoring my request to show your support this way. Uh, we're about to hear uh, what we think is con a controversial item. Um, and what I would ask of everybody, uh, and this is to follow our lead, and how this commission leads is with love, with grace, and respect. So we have our differences at times, and we share them with respect. And differences don't make people right or wrong. Differences are just differences. So I ask everybody to follow our lead. Any objections? Wonderful. All right. We are on to item number two. It's a special exception petition for City Village, SE 23-0001. And Mayor, items two and three, uh, one is the special exception, one is the conditional use for the same property. So we'll have uh, one hearing on that item. Gotcha, on but two, two separate votes. Two separate votes. Right. 
So, and, uh, uh, and just to get the time frame uh, correct, uh, should there be a limit of three minutes per speaker? Is it up to me? Does it depend? So, so Mayor, in, in this case, and, and, and I'll go into it, we have five affected parties from mm -hmm. three properties. Those affected parties in a quasi-judicial uh, that has not been waived uh, have the same rights as the petitioner. So those will not be limited, Correct. other than redundancy mm -hmm. and, and, and controlling a meeting, as you would for a petitioner or staff. Um, anyone else uh, is uh, qualified as an affected party is part of the public in the public hearing. So, for example, the affected party gets sworn in, has witnesses. Uh, gotcha. uh, the, the public is the same as anywhere else, and depending how many public is here, uh, you can you can uh, regulate the time. Gauge that. Okay, at that time. Okay. And I do want to confirm with you, uh, Amera is my landlord right. uh, at my law firm. Uh, do I have a con conflict of interest on voting on this item this evening? You, you and I spoke about that, um, and there's uh, the conflict law is on 112.3143. Um, if you were, uh, there's a business associate um, conflict that can occur, but business associate as defined is not landlord tenant. Uh, the Commission on Ethics has an opinion uh, discussing a mayor actually voting on, on, on a settlement of a landlord on the property that, that, the, that the, the mayor, uh, under his private capacity, uh, has leased, had leased, and they found that not to be a conflict. So it's, it's our opinion, based on 112.3143, that there is no conflict. You are one of several tenants at the walk. Um, this, it, you are not in negotiations with your lease. You've had that lease, I believe, from 2019? Correct. We, as I've ex expanded office space, I've had a new lease. Okay, but not, not in the last two months, or no. not during these negotiations. Okay. Um, and uh, this property is separate from that property. So the issue is, does this inure to your family's benefit? Um, there's no... Obviously, you have a lease. If you you have a law firm that has that lease, and is it someone who's a business associate of yours that would ignore to their benefit? And under the law, Amir is not your business associate. You don't represent them uh, legally. Correct. I don't. Yeah. All right. Thank you, John. You're welcome. So I will read into sure. the record the two items, and then I'll, I'll walk through for for everybody out, out here how we're going to proceed. So. First is the special exception petition. That's a request to hold a quasi-judicial hearing and public hearing to consider petition of Amira Downtown Development, LLC, seeking approval for special exceptions, SE 23-01, from Land Development Code Sections 250-1049, <clears throat> Downtown Regulating Plan, 250-1055, Circulation, 250-1056, Block Length and Perimeter, 250-1058, Building Typologies, 250-1059, building type table and 250-1061 general design standards relative to maximum building height when located near single family zoning districts, required building frontage, street design standards, block length, maximum floor heights, parking zones, street setbacks, ground floor transparency, blank wall separation and permitted building types within the core subdistrict to accommodate the construction of a mixed use development in the downtown mixed use zoning district, located the northwest corner of Sample Road and University Drive, Legally described as parcels A and B, Coral Hills Sample, and parcels A, B, lots 1 through 30, Canal and Maintenance Area, and Service Drive, Village Square, and authorize the City Attorney's Office to draft an order concerning SC 23-01 and adopts it order. Um, it's a request to hold the public hearing and the quasi-judicial hearings we discuss, approve, authorize, and adopt. The next item is a conditional use on the same property, which is also a request to hold a quasi-judicial hearing and public hearing to consider petition of Amira Downtown Development, LLC, seeking conditional use in accordance with Land Development Code Section 250-1052.14 to permit a large-scale retail establishment greater than 40,000 square feet to accommodate a mixed-use development within a downtown mixed-use zoning district. Locate the northwest corner of Sample Road and University Drive. Legally described as parcels A and B, Coral Hill Sample, and parcels A, B, lots 1 through 30, Canal and Maintenance Area, and Service Drive, Village Square, and authorize the City Attorney's Office to draft an order approving CA 2301 and adopt said order. Request to hold a hearing, quasi approve, authorize, and adopt. So those are the two items that Tina will be talking about in a, in a minute. I want to remind this commission that uh, the law requires, for, since it's a private development looking for conditional use and a special exception, it's site-specific, so it has a special effect on the owner of that property, 
the law, the state law says, and anyone within 300 feet, if they um, apply uh, using the affected party process, they can go ahead and be an affected party. The city, years ago, we decided we would make that 400 feet. So of those 400 feet, there are five individuals <coughs> Uh, representing three properties that, that have qualified as an affected party. Um, and so they will be sworn in along with staff and anyone from petitioner who, who is going to be providing evidence uh, in a minute. Um, what I would note is, and Mary, you talked about this, there is a um, requirement here to treat this like a court. That's why it's quasi-judicial. And there's two requirements that the city has to comply with. One is procedural due process and one is substantive due process. So the procedural due process is the notice which had to be sent out and, and to allow the public and specifically the affected parties to be treated with the ability to provide their case uh, because they are, are, are of a higher level of effect under the law. And then the substantive due process is that you, whatever you decide has to have legally sufficient evidence to support, to support your decision, decision. So the way this works, Mayor, and, and I, I think you do have your document there. My document. Um, we would start, right. and so for the public and, and the affected parties to know, um, we're going to start with the petitioner, and then, uh, sorry, start with staff, and then we'll start with the petitioner, and then if there's any affected parties in favor, they would come out. Any affected parties who are opposed, come. When you come, um, you present whatever you want the commission uh, to have presented. You can ask questions of staff and, 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 and of the petitioner um, and, and, and provide your, your reasons whether you're, you're in favor or not in favor. So um, then, Mayor, we, we open it to the public, um, and, and those individuals are not sworn in, and, and you can give the time limited as you would for a normal uh, public hearing. Um, then there can be a final presentation by the petitioner, a final presentation by the city. And that's under our, our ordinance and consistent with Florida law. Thank you for making that clear. My, my pleasure. So before we move forward, because this is a quasi-judicial, I have been provided, uh, and thank you all, um, with the ex parte communication disclosure for quasi-judicial proceedings, which lists the individuals that each one of you have spoken to. This will be made part of the record. Um, and I'm looking, and, and it looks like everyone spoke with the petitioner, and everyone spoke with several individuals who who are in, in, in the neighborhood that's affected by this. And I did have another conversation with George Rahal earlier this afternoon. Okay, if, if that's I think you already have that on yours? I had one with him previously. Okay, so we can update that as well. And right. thank you for that. And if anyone else has, we will update these, but this is the, the first uh, iteration which will go into uh, the file. Also, if anyone has any documents, um, although it is like, like a court, hearsay is allowed in. I'm going to be very generous in accepting any documents you feel are relevant. And th what, what the law states is why hearsay can be used. It can't be the sole thing that the commission decides on. So um, I will help all of you who are not familiar with this process um, because it is much more formal. Um, but the key here is for everyone to have their due process. And that's, and that's what our goal is. And that's the goal of the commission. For sure. Um, so Anyone from the city that's going to speak, I'll ask uh, to stand up. I'll ask anyone from the petitioner and their team that's going to speak to, to stand up. And then I'm going to ask the following. Um, is Mark and Lily Magley here? Okay, great, stand up. Is Frank Zingali here? Thank you. And William and Nadine Stone. Okay, and if anyone else that, 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 that you have as witnesses, I think you listed yourselves as witnesses, which is fine. Okay, so all I'm going to ask is I'm going to have the clerk swear you guys in and we will go from there. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Um, thank you all. <clears throat> Mayor, that's the, uh, <clears throat> the procedure, and uh, it's your meeting. All right, very good. So uh, we're gonna hear from you, Tina, first. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Can we have the presentation up, please? Good evening again, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commission. For the record, Tina Ju, Assistant Director in Development Services. I am presenting on behalf of staff for the City Village Project for the special exception and conditional use petitions. 
The zoning is in the DTMU Downtown Mixed Use Zoning District, and it's on the northwest corner of Sample Road and University. And the applicant is Amera Downtown Development Com Company. The conditional use is to permit a large-scale retail establishment that's greater than 40,000 square feet to accommodate the mixed use. This is the location map of the property. The total acreage is 12.82, located at the northwest corner of University and Sample Road. As you can see from the aerial, it's located where the old city hall site used to be and the now vacant Village Green Plaza. It also includes portions of Sunshine Water Control District Canal, which they are proposing to develop over and culvert over. The property is adjacent to the RS3 zoning district, single family residential zoning district. This is the proposed site plan that was submitted to staff. I will step us through the development uh, proposal. If you look to the screen uh, towards the right along the east, uh, the, we have building one, which is a four story building and they're proposing approximately 18,257 square feet of retail, 40,269 square feet of grocer, as well as a 720 parking space garage. This is the building that is subject to your conditional use uh, approval. Moving further along the north is building two. Is It's a one-story office building with approximately 3,000 square feet. And along Sample Road, we have buildings three, four, and five. That range in square footage from approximately 14,000 square feet to about 17,000 square feet. All three buildings are three stories and they contain um, a mix between office and retail. Moving a little bit west, we have apartment A that's proposed at eight stories with ground floor retail, about 1,300 square feet. Building six, which is one story, about 3,000, I'm sorry, 3,000 square feet. And then we have apartments B and C, which are proposed at eight stories. Apartment Apartment B has ground floor restaurant or real retail space at 5,600 square feet. And apartment C is eight stories with ground floor retail or restaurant on the corners with uh, 6,257 square feet. We have also building seven slash garage B, which is proposed to be six floors with rooftop amenities along with retail and office space. Further to the west, we have apartment D, which starts at four stories along the northern uh, portion of that building and then steps up to eight stories. And on, along Coral Hills Drive, they are also proposing a, a pocket park. The yellow arrows signify the internal circulation and entrance and exit to the site. Along the north, we have Broken Woods Drive, um, access from Broken Woods Drive, and then an access from Sample Road, and another from Coral Hills Drive. They're right now, they're proposing full access um, on all three of those entrances, but it's important to note that staff provided for uh, several um, conditions of approval for their conditional use and their special exception related to the traffic circulation. One of them is to eliminate the right turn out of the project site onto Coral Hills Drive. The other is to, per, to submit a signal warrant study six months after the uh, occupancy of building one. The other is to work with staff to maintain an opening off of University Drive and the final one that's related to traffic is 
on um, uh, regarding Sample Road to reduce the taper length there to accommodate for vehicle stacking. They are proposing internal walkways and pathways along with outdoor seating and um, a sidewalk that lines the exterior of the property that ranges between seven feet to 12 feet along uh, Sample Road. So I wanted to take um, a step back for a moment and uh, just go through and remind us that our downtown mixed use district is based on a vision. And that vision is to promote the downtown as a zone of pedestrian activity, social life, and civic activities to create that sense of place that we want that's new, unique to Coral Springs. Okay, so um, in, and in order to achieve this vision um, that we um, came up with 20 years ago, we adopted a form-based code in order to ensure that we can really promote these mix of uses as pedestrian activity and social life. And the, there are advantages of our form-based code over a conventional code. A conventional code really focuses on the separation of land uses, residential here, industrial there, while a form-based code really, really focuses on that mixed use. And it focuses on the form of development, on the functional streets, blocks, circulation, public open space patterns that conventional code does not consider, and not just for the development, but for the overall downtown. It emphasizes design frameworks that focus on the building faces and the public realm. So it focuses on more of the pedestrian um, look and feel rather than automobile to ensure that we can create that sense of place and character that we seek. And as I mentioned before, it allows for more mixes of uses and more pedestrian connections. That's that social interaction that form-based code can give us. And it addresses critical elements such as building orientation, scale, massing, the location of parking, and architectural treatments to our buildings. I wanted to say that you know, this is a really ex exciting period for our city. Right? This is the last puzzle piece for our downtown. And um, as staff, we were, were really excited to see this project move um, and, you know, be proposed to the city and we ultimately want a project that is successful and achieves this vision while also, you know, maintaining that, that look and feel and giving us that sense, uh, that unique um, character that we seek. And we've been working with Amera for over two years now. And we've expressed concerns to them as far as what they're proposing and whether or not it meets the vision or not. And we've also expressed um, the uh, concerns of the residents whenever we've heard them during our review. And they've gone back to the drawing board for a few times while working with us. But there are some items that they have not addressed. And these are the special exceptions before you tonight. The items in green are the ones that staff supports. The ones that are not in green are the ones that do not, are not supported by staff, mainly because they did not demonstrate, um, according to our technical review, that they met the criteria for the special exception. Um, and others, we found that they did. And what I hope to impart to you tonight is what our, um, what the code, the intention of the code is, what those requirements of the code are, how the, the plans do or do not meet the code requirements, and um, again, based on our review, what we uh, found with the special exceptions being able to meet the criteria or not. Uh, the applicant does have a presentation for you to, tonight, uh, and they will step through what their justifications are for their special exceptions.
These are the special exceptions that meet the criteria for the, from the code. They all um, have a common theme. Most of them are related to uh, lot requirements, elevations, and circulation. And I'm going to step us through the ones that meet the criteria. The first one is for lot frontage. I'm sorry, the first one is for building frontage. And that means how much of the building lines the road. We have a requirement along Sample Road that the building frontage must be a minimum of 75%. And they're proposing 68%. And we felt that it met the criteria because they're, not, they're proposing a public art pad on the north on the corner of Sample and University, as well as the driveway opening, so they weren't on, along Sample Road. So we found that, you know, for the most part, it meant the intent of the code. The next one is for circulation um, along the pedestrian street and the main street design. The code says the maximum through lane that you can have on a pedestrian street is 11 feet they're proposing 12 feet. And based on their justification, they are stating that, you know, they need the trucks to be able to maneuver throughout. And on Main Street, it's required that you have a minimum of five feet and a maximum of seven feet of a separated bike lane. They're proposing 11 foot sharrows, which is a shared bike lane and vehicle lane, and which is consistent with other approvals that we have um, seen in the past. That's the pedestrian street in blue and main street in purple. The next is for a minimum and maximum block lengths. The code states that you can have a minimum of 300 feet and a maximum of 500 feet. And um, because uh, the way that the lot is configured and the natural division of this parcel, we felt that you know th this justification was um, it was ju the special exception was justified because they wouldn't be able to physically meet those numbers without selling or purchasing property. The next special exception that meets the criteria is for maximum floor heights. The code says you cannot exceed 20 feet for your first floor height, and they're proposing 22.5. For any floor above the first floor, you're required to have um, a maximum of 12 feet and they're proposing 13 feet. And the reason why we found that it met the criteria is because they're stating that they want to um, attract a class A office space and that's what the market demands at this time. So because they were providing for a better product, we, 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 we felt that this enhanced it. The next code section that met the criteria was for blank wall separation, um, which can exceed 20 feet, and they're proposing 33 feet. For buildings uh, three, four, and five, uh, the code requires that you have a minimum of 60% ground floor transparency, how you can see inside you know, the building through windows and doors. They are proposing 41, 41%, 48%, and 44% for buildings three, four, and five. The code says you cannot have a single story building within the core subdistrict. They are proposing uh, buildings two and six to be single story, but since they're um, providing for greater floors and um, make the building look and appear to be multiple floors, uh, we were okay with that. So going into the special exceptions that do not meet the criteria. As I mentioned before, based on our review, we did not see that there is uh, sufficient justification for this special exception request, but also these special exceptions had the greatest impact to the residential, um, the neighboring residential communities, and uh, because ultimately it doesn't meet the vision of our downtown that we seek to achieve you know, 20 years ago. So the first code section that I will uh, bring up is for building height when abutting residential. 
There are two code sections actually that relate to this. The first code section says, no building greater than four stories can be within 100 feet of single family residential. This blue dashed line is that 100 foot buffer, right? That you cannot exceed four stories. These are the portions of the building that exceed four stories where the blue, um, where the blue line is surrounding the building. The second code requirement says that no buildings greater than five stories can be within 250 feet of single family residential. In the purple dashed line, that's your 250 feet of, um, that's that 250 feet foot buffer. And in the purple solid line, they're, they're exceeding the five stories. And the reason for this code requirement, there was intention behind it. And um, when we adopted the code, we wanted to make sure that there was as minimal impact to adjacent single family residential as much as possible and locate all of the larger buildings that had the most um, intensity to them, more, most um, amassing in scale towards the, art, the roads. I spoke a little bit about frontage requirements in the beginning of, of my presentation, and um, there are two other uh, sides that do not meet the building frontage requirements. The first one is along University Drive. The code says you're required to have a minimum of 75% building frontage along University Drive, and they're proposing 10%. For Coral Hills Drive, they're required to have a minimum of 50% building frontage, and they're proposing 46%. The code says that you cannot have surface parking within zones one and four. And they're proposing surface parking within zones one and four. And the reason why we found that this does not meet the criteria for the special exception is because um, the building is so far back and the requirement that the parking, the surface parking be concealed from the road, it doesn't allow for that you know, walkable mixed use um, district that we're looking for with the buildings closer to the street. The next is for mid-rise setbacks. Um, we have minimums and maximums in our code. The code requires that you have a minimum of 10 feet and a maximum of 20 feet. And they are proposing for buildings one and three, 165 feet and 189.5 feet. Along Sample Road, we're required to have a minimum of five feet, a maximum of 30 feet, and they're proposing 32 feet for apartment B. For Coral Hills Drive, you're required to have a minimum of five feet and a maximum of 15 feet, and they're proposing for apartments C and D, 26 and 23 feet. And again, this goes in line with our vision to have um, buildings closer to the road, to, for it to be a walkable, uh, mixed-use downtown development. And without, and with buildings being so far back, you don't tech, typically, um, you're not tep typically able to, to meet that. So these are the special exception criteria. The applicant has responded to number one, that the result is not only burdensome, it's not only a burdensome hardship, but is inconsistent with the general public welfare. And these are the criteria for the conditional use analysis. This is, um, so th this, this recommendation, um, tip, 
let me backtrack. So normally when we bring um, a petition before you and we present it and we have a recommendation, um, we either recommend approval with conditions or recommend denial with conditions. Um, in this case, we found, just as I mentioned before, that there are some special exception requests that su staff supports, and there are others that do, we found that do not. Um, so we wanted to make sure that um, our, our recommendation to you was based on that. Um, so you'll see in the first one, um, and that deals with the large-scale um, retail establishment, um, we're, ask, we're recommending that the commission include this recommendation that the building, that building one comply with the setbacks of the code to ensure that we're meeting our vision. And the um, this B um, relates to the phasing. Um, we review this as one development. We didn't review it as a phasing plan. So we felt that it was uh, pretty you know, necessary that if the applicant does decide to phase the property, that we're able to review it and come before you again. The other recommendations either have to do with the circulation and the transportation um, related conditions that I mentioned before, but there are also other improvements that would be um, required to accommodate the development. And the rest of the conditions have to do with our um, landscape conditions that we typically place on the projects. And um, that's the rest of the recommendation from staff on SE 23-0001. Um, I will say that the conditions that are provided for you in the conditional use are the same as the conditions within the special exception. That concludes um, staff's presentation. I would like to um, submit um, as uh, in the record um, staff's uh, staff report and backup for the conditional use, the special exception, and our presentation. So Mayor Wilkes, if that's all right with you, Mayor will accept the uh, special exception as uh, city's exhibit one, the, uh, the conditional use is city's exhibit two, and then your PowerPoint is city's exhibit three. Thank you. We'll Sounds good. Uh, anybody have any questions of staff at this point? All right, Vice Mayor. Tina, I may have missed it. Um, on ex on ex exception three, could you go into that? Because I wasn't sure if we covered that. You may have, and I may have missed it. Exception three being? Uh, the buildings seven. seven with garage B, six floors. Sorry, I thought you were referring to the condition of approval at first. So um, the special exception request has to do with the, um, the, the height of the building in relation to that buffer that um, I had discussed earlier. And I can, um, if we can put back the, yes, thank you. So um, I'm sorry, which one were you referring to, B? Let me uh, I'm just looking for an explanation on um, the six-story garage B. And it's regarding building seven. Correct. On uh, the special exceptions, you have it on here is request number three. The, the garage is six floors. 
and um, they, it varies in height um, depending on which elevation you're looking at. Um, so while you'll have uh, a fifth floor surface parking, there are rooftop amenities that um, increase the height of the, of the garage. Thank you. Great. Any other questions of staff at this juncture? And you will be able to ask more later. Okay. Seeing none. So uh, now we're going to hear from the applicant. Correct. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Matthew Scott. I'm a zoning attorney with an address of uh, 16383 Pantheon Pass in Delray Beach. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, America Downtown Development, LLC. Uh, before getting into our presentation, we have a, a, a presentation just, just like staff does. First off, I want to, of course, thank staff, thank the commission. Obviously, this has been quite a long process, with numerous meetings, uh, lots and lots of iterations of the plans, and trying to figure out how to, how to um, help the city with this vision. The, the, the word that Tina used made a lot of sense for the vision for this area. Um, and, and so before going into our presentation, I wanted to sort of piggyback on this idea of a vision here because I think um, it, it, will help, it will help the commission and the community understand how we got to this place with our plan. Uh, so your code, the, the, the downtown uh, mixed-use zoning district, in the very beginning lays out a purpose and sets forth uh, four purposes, basically, of what we're trying to achieve with this form-based code. And I think two of them are uh, very much illustrate um, why approving this plan makes so much sense. The first one is that your code is looking here to establish an identifiable character and an economic vitality for the community, community redevelopment area. As you know, this entire downtown is in a CRA. And then the second item here that I, that I think uh, sheds a lot of light on our vision for this project is to recognize with the downtown mixed-use zoning district the challenges of redevelopment within a built environment and allow for modifications to standards to promote reinvestment within the downtown mixed-use district. So if we can go back to the presentation, uh, the name of the project is City Village. It has generally an address of 9301 West Sample Road. We know where it is. And before I uh, bring up my client to run through the plans in detail, I wanted to just provide an outline of, of what we're going to present. There's obviously a lot to digest, and we tried to simplify it as much as possible. So we're going to start with, the, with our specific requests for the special exceptions and the conditional use. <clears throat> I can do that now. There are the special exceptions are the various deviations from code to allow for this dynamic mixed-use project. The conditional use is fairly straightforward. Uh, your code limits the size of uh, large retail uses uh, to, I believe it's uh, 38,000 square feet or 40,000 square feet. And we're proposing to exceed that slightly uh, to accommodate uh, the request of a Whole Foods so we can bring a Whole Foods grocer to your downtown. Then we're going to present the project. We're then going to provide our justifications for this project. And then finally, if it's okay, I'd like to talk through the conditions, just a few, that uh, we have some concerns with and, and that we, we would seek there, if the project is approved tonight, uh, that those conditions be modified slightly. And so with that being said, I'd like to call up uh, Giselle Rahal from the applicant. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, City Commissioners, neighbors, residents, thank you. Giselle Rahal, 2960 Northwest, 107th Avenue, Coral Springs. So on the screen, we have a plan that reflects the original vision for downtown, formulated in December of 1999. Tina was absolutely right. This is over 20 years in the making. When we, Amera, first began working with the city to shape the vision for downtown Coral Springs, the original plan, although it has residential components, it's purposely dominated by commercial activity, including retail and restaurant spaces with courtyards and open spaces to encourage social interactions. The plan we're presenting tonight for the Northwest Corner City Village is intended, despite shifts in the market over the last 20 years, this plan is intended to fulfill that original vision, 
a vision for predominantly commercial activity with restaurants and retailers, with courtyards and open spaces that will encourage pedestrian activity and provide an opportunity for people to gather and come together, at least on this, the Northwest corner. As you all know, prior to this version, we submitted plans in 2021 reflecting a 20,000 square foot grocer with substantial retail and 300 residential units. That 2021 plan did not require as many special exceptions as this one does today. We were moving forward with that plan up until Whole Foods showed up. And let me just tell you, Whole Foods is a game changer. We were compelled to pursue the Whole Foods as we believe they will generate the energy and the vitality needed to support not only this corner, but all of downtown. Whole Foods will attract a variety of successful and desired restaurants, retailers, and other small businesses. And in fact, we're already seeing this and hearing a lot of interest since this was officially shared in the media at the PNC meeting. As you all know, grocery stores, given their small margins, do not pay the rents needed to justify the costs to build their buildings. Their presence, however, brings people in, brings in the social interaction, brings in the opportunity, and it supports the other retailers. It's kind of like having to take medicine that is bitter and hard to swallow, but needed in order to get better. So that deficiency has to be made up elsewhere. With this 40,000 square foot Whole Foods plan, in order to accommodate them, we had to give up a two-story 40,000 square foot medical building at the northeastern corner of the site and replace it instead with a 3,000 square foot retail building. That's a loss of 37,000 square feet that would have generated market rents. Added to that is the fact that the anchor size is now twice as much as in the previous plan. And therefore, there's a larger deficiency of costs, of rent to cost to overcome. Because of that increased deficiency in revenue from those changes, it was necessary to increase the number of residential units to help bridge the gap in order to have a shot at making this project viable. It was never our intent nor is it our intent now for this project to be a pre predominantly residential one. And so rather than doubling the number of residential units, which we've resisted, to compensate for the doubling of the grocer, we only increased by 100 residential units. Even with these changes, the project is still dominated by that commercial activity and the courtyards and the protest pedestrian feel that we feel is consistent with the original vision. This really is the last puzzle piece. This is the last corner left to help us to fulfill the intent of that original vision. It's 12.8 acres, and with this plan, we will have 150,000 square feet of commercial space, and yes, a little over 400 residential units. The other two corners, the two most recently active corners combined, have less than 11 acres and their projects will have close to 1,100 residential units. And they have less than 60,000 square feet of commercial space. So if you do the math, our project has two and a half times the amount of commercial space than the other corners combined and City, City Village, our project, has only a third of the residential units that they do. So our ratio of 32 residential units per acre compared with their ratio of 100 residential units per acre only underscores Amera's commitment to commercial activity, to pedestrian walkways, to interesting retailers, to restaurants with courtyards, as envisioned in the original plans for downtown. 
Of all of the components of a mixed-use project, residential is the most profitable and commercial is the most challenging. In commercial, you have to look for and find and attract good quality tenants. It is not easy. It takes months, sometimes years of negotiating, and they have to want to come here. In residential, well, the tenants, they find you. I'm gonna hand over now to Georgia Hall, who's gonna walk you through the layout of the plan. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> good evening. Good evening, Georgia Hall, 2500 Northwest 107th <laughs> Avenue, Coral Springs. Thank you. I'd act to follow folks, and she's pretty good. I, I have to admit, very proud of her. My job here tonight is to. Did you get a little closer to the mic, George? All right. My job here tonight is to walk you through this plan, and I'll start with how we oriented the plan. On the the the, the retail is indicated by what looks like a light blue. Um, ground floor, they're all ground floor and light blue. So behind the, the grocer is in green. There's a light blue behind the grocer that's about 18,000 square feet. That, that can be divided, but we were actually going to seek a, a small bo smaller box of um, retailer to fill it if we can. The three buildings in front are um, Primary on the ground floor, they are retail, and they have two floors of office that we hope to fill in half, uh, uh, above it. For all three buildings. Three floors each. Now they're separated by courtyards. This is part of our commitment to creating open space, to creating areas where people can socially interact. Um, as a result of that, I'll, I'll get to that later. The, the other, the um, the other blue spots are, we took the ground floor of the residential buildings that's hard up on Sample, on Sample Road, and we decided to fill in the corners of those residential spots with, um, with, with small retail, primarily so we could have coffee shops, small restaurants with outdoor seating, again, to activate and to provide that vision that we've talked about that formulated over 20 years ago. So the, four, the two buildings has four corners, and each of those corners will be a small restaurant or coffee shop. On the garage, garage B, we're actually going to have um, at the bottom of the garage, on the ground floor of the garage, facing the residential, we plan to add some, re some uh, retail there, mainly for small businesses, hairdressers, uh, you know, lo lower paying people that can't afford to pay the higher rents that, that you normally would have to pay for this. So we found some room in there that we could justify um, users to provide as amenities for the entire place. The, the, the middle shows a courtyard, uh, shows a bil apartment building A with a small bil uh, one story building up front. Um, and that one-story building will read like two, but it really is a restaurant, and, the co and it's surrounded by the courtyard. The ground floor of that apartment A is earmarked to be retail. The, there is a typo on it. Um, Tina indicated that it's 1,300 square feet. It's actually over 13,000 square feet. So that was a typo that we'll give staff to correct. Um, the other... The other building that I want to point out is building two, right up at the corner or the northwest corner. Orig in, the, in our first plan, that was a two-story, 40,000 square feet medical building that Whole Foods essentially forced us to get rid of. And we pleaded and begged and ended up with a three-story as a, to, to at least create some activity at that end. Building two is three-story, not one-story. It's one-story, but we have made a commitment that any one-story building we build, and we have two of them, the one in the courtyard and the one that's up against university. That's where we got our 10% <laughs> coverage on University Drive, that little building. 
that building is going to read like two stories, and we have elevations. The, the, it, it, will, it would not, it will look like two, but it will really be one. The, the, the resident, the other part of the residential component and the, the building A, which is this building here, is eight stories. It was five before we changed the plan uh, to, to get the additional 100 units, so that went to eight stories. The buildings had up on, on, on Sample Road, these two buildings here, just barely made it out of the 250 foot setback. A uh, little more, we'd have had to build them on the, on the street. <laughs> but that building is eight stories. Those two buildings are eight stories, residential. This building here is, a, it is part of this building, is four stories. We try to honor the four story requirement. The rest is eight stories. And that gave us 412 units, I believe. The other, the other item of note is the parking garage, and the one I want to, meant to address here is this one here. This is six stories, and it's supposed, according to the code, it's supposed to be four stories. In fact, all of the buildings within the 100-foot setback has to be four stories. And later on, I'll get back to, um, I sh I'll show wh why for it, the, the code should really have addressed it in feet rather than stories. And we'll talk about it in, in, uh, in a few minutes. The, the last item I wanted to point out to is that the code did not address, and we and we have highlighted it here, the canal, which adds as an additional buffer. The code does not recognize the canal. So when you you're setting back, you you have, you have a hundred foot setback, but there's a canal on the other side that is not considered. Nor are these green areas that, although they belong to the homeowners, they're supposed to be designated green areas and can't be built on. So that provides. This area here provides even further distance from the homes that are behind here to, to, these, to these buildings. This, this is the view from Sample Road for those three. There's two of the three story, um, three story buildings on Sample Road. This is a, a frontal view. You can see the separation of the buildings with courtyard, with the courtyard, with the outdoor seating. Uh, we, we, we try to do as much as wide a sidewalk on Sample Road as we possibly could, um, landscaping, etc. This gives you an, a factual vision of what it would look like. This this particular slide shows, yeah, this particular slide shows the ent the entrance, the main entrance of a Sample Road that aligns with the City Hall entrance. Guys, if you can be quiet, please. Thank you. Yeah, if you're speaking at a turn the next time, you'll be asked to leave. You are leaving. Will somebody escort him out, please? <clears throat> yeah, anyone from the public will have a chance to be heard, I promise you. Now is not your chance. Please proceed. We have a grand entrance here. That, that is from Sample Road, it aligns with the grand entrance on the cornerstone side and City Hall that lines up that street. These buildings are the two residential buildings that we refer to, building C and D. They're eight stories high. The ground floor of each of these buildings and the corners are where we pl plan to activate with restaurants and coffee shops. This, this, this view shows uh, the roundabout uh, um, looking down the main drive, looking east. On the right, you have the same three-story buildings that are built on Sample Road. This is the back side of those buildings. Across is the, is the top of the 18,000 square foot retail space that we have, and that's for parking to support not only Whole Foods, but the rest of the um, commercial activity. I think we have 700 parking spaces in that um, in that building. S since our since our PNZ meeting, we've had numerous. She can't do it out. 
<laughs> know the feeling. She's now reminding me that um, we're here now on this, on this point to talk about the special exceptions and, and the, the concerns that were raised by the citizens. The code that we're living by is what we're here to talk about, special exceptions from that code. I have yet to see a perfect code or perfectly written code, which is why each of the codes have a provision for special exceptions, so that if the code needs to be adjusted, you can apply for a special e exception and justify it, and, and that decision will be made at that point in time. But, but so the codes, codes are written knowing that they're not perfect and that they they can be adjusted via this, this particular process, a special exception. So after the PNZ meeting, we met with each of the commissioners, mayor and each of the commissioners, to sound out their concerns, what, what, what they would have liked to see happen. Um, we had three group meetings with residences uh, three different occasions and two different locations and we had these three meetings to give everyone a chance to to come out and let us know what they felt what they thought what suggestions they had and they had a lot of suggestions uh, we have a list of all those suggestions commissioner Bowen was at one of those meetings and she was she got got that first hand so we took note of every single suggestion and we looked at each one and which the suggestions that we felt was merited um, us pursuing, we did, and I'll get to that later. We visited the neighborhoods. We actually went into Broken Woods, Michael, Giselle, and myself, one afternoon at, our, at around five o'clock at the invitation of the residents, and we actually stopped at one of the Howie homes and we walked the streets, and we were actually pleasantly surprised at what we saw. There were kids playing on the streets. The, the neighborhood was quiet, it was peaceful, except for the kids playing. And it wasn't just one, one set of kids, they actually had two different sets of kids at two different points, at the, um, right at the Broken Woods entrance, on the, at the entrance where the canal is. You had kids playing hockey on the street. It, was, it reminded me of my boyhood. But that, that was delightful and it, it, it drove home their concern and the need for, for something to be done to safeguard Broken Woods Drive and to protect it as much as we can. And we have some suggestions that we explored with the residents that we think is doable. Um, so we'll get to that in a few minutes. And finally, we had discussions with city staff, again, to talk about um, the meetings that we've had with the residents and to, and to hear and get more suggestions. And we listened. As a result of those meetings, we went back to look at our plan and see how we can modify the plan to address some of those concerns. And that is listed here, and I'd like to walk you through it if I can. Uh, we proposed, we, 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 we looked at the buildings again, and we feel that we can reduce building A a part of building A and a part of building D that is within the 100 foot setback, we can reduce those to four floors. So we can take four floors off of those two parts of the building, but it's only a part of those two buildings is within the 100 feet. The, uh, the rest of it is within the 250 feet. So let's at least see if we can reduce the, the parts that are in the 100 feet down to four floors, and we, we've, we've come up with a, a plan that would, would do that, and we'll show that a little later. The other, the other um, suggestion was to, we have a pool at the top of the garage that's, that is oriented further to Sample Road. It's not at the, it's a large garage, so on the side that's closer to Sample Road, we have an amenity pool, which is what I think Tina referred to as activity above the, on the, on the top of the garage. Well, that activity is on the Sample Road side, which, is, which will be within the 250 feet. The garage, part of the garage is within 100 feet. The other part is within 250 feet. So it's, it straddles that line. The other item was 
residents and PNZ recommended that we have no right turn onto Coral Hills Drive, and that that, that we've we, we've accepted. Um, we, after talking with the residents, that, um, we also believe that it will be appropriate to have no left turn onto Broken Woods Drive. So no right turn onto Coral Hills, no left turn onto Broken Woods. So traffic coming out of our project will not be able to go into those neighborhoods. They have to, you know, they can't go directly into the neighborhoods. Broken Woods, um, after seeing the case, we, we talked to, with, the, with the owners and the citizens of the properties close to, to, to that entrance and talked about how, whether the street can be closed off, whether we can put a gate, um, what, what traffic can, and what, what can be done to, to prevent traffic from just flying in there and, and potentially hurting the kids. We, we discussed it with staff um, and because it's a public street, there's, a, there's only so much the city can do to modify or change what's there. If it was a private street, obviously that it, a lot more could happen, but that would require the forming of an association with some of the residents don't want, and we, we, we understand that. So we have, we've decided to do some brainstorming and see if we can come up with some other ideas short of, of making the street private and, and keeping it public is there something else that we could do? And we have some ideas for those as well. That, that, that you know, put some features up on the street, do some calming that we will, we, we are prepared to pay for, to, to, to try to uh, do some ca traffic calming at the entrance into Broken Woods from right after you pass our entrance and you continue in, there's a bridge. In that area, we think we can do some traffic calming and try to slow down or, or at least make cars or, or vehicles that are coming off into that be aware that they're now entering into a residential zone. This is something different, watch out. So we feel that we could do some, some traffic coming with signs and, and features that could help uh, address that. Not perfect, but it, we think it would help. The, Installing of a gate at the entrance of Broken Woods, if it's allowed, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, we don't know, unless, again, the challenge of it being a public street, I don't know that we could do it. But if that is possible, we'd be happy to do it. We've already agreed that we would apply for a traffic light at Broken Woods. Whole Foods want it, the residents want it. It's, 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 it also provides um, better access in and out of um, Broken Woods and, and, on the, and off a university. We looked at the, the rear of the buildings uh, on our northern border, all the homes on our no northern border, and some of them are shielded with beautiful landscaping, dense landscaping, and some are not. We propose to make sure that all of the entire northern border is well shielded with with um, dense landscaping, and we have some photos that uh, indicate we actually, on our visit to Broken Woods Drive, one of the homes there had a, a what I a, what I considered a green wall. You could you could can't see through it. It was it was just very very tall, and it was done out of bamboo. And we took some pictures. We'll show it to you. But there are other plants, other other um, veg, uh, trees that can be used to get the same effect. And, we, we, we'll discuss that in a few more minutes. The, the other item, the last item that we came up with was to create a pocket park and put it on, on Coral Hills Drive so that not only the residents of the 400 plus units can access it, but so can the, the rest of the community. So it'll, it will be on Coral Hills Drive, it will be open to the public, and it will be a park that we will be maintaining as part of our project, but it'll be open to the public. Thank you. Uh, and finally, it was suggested that we have supercharging stations. We, we are going to have EV charging stations, um, and it was recommended that we have some of them be supercharging stations, and we will do that as well.
what we are not able to do. And, and this is where we wish we could, but we, the consequence of trying to do it is it's, it's severe. We can't close the entrance in and out of the project, out of Broken Ridge, which some of the residents want us to do. Close it off completely. We can't do that. Whole Foods will require access to the corner. Me, and as also for so that vehicles coming from the south to the to the north can turn into the median and come into Broken Woods without having to do a U-turn. So that that's not practical. We just can't close off Broken Woods. We restrict the left turn, but we can't close it off completely. Move Whole, Whole Foods building closer to the street. I wish we could. We we spent over a year pleading with them, sending diagrams, talking to them that this is not fulfilling the vision of what this, this city wanted, buildings hard on the street, and we pleaded with them, just couldn't get through. We do have um, a compromise that we will show in a minute to try to soften the impact of having parking hard on the street, which is something we did uh, on Federal Highway in Fort Lauderdale when we did the um, fresh market um, there, but I will share that with you later on. And to comply with the 250 foot setback, which, and to bring those eight stories down to five stories. Can it be done? Yes. But what are the consequences of doing it? What do we have to give up? And that's where it becomes really difficult. To bring those, uh, to to lower those eight floors to five floors so that we can conform to the letter of the code is doable, but at a price. And the price is we, we'll have to take building A, and maybe I could get to that. This is building A here. There's a courtyard here. There's a little retail building. There's retail on the ground. We can, we can take this building and create a U-shape, res, pure all residential unit. Um, now, that will give us another leg here of residential that will be five stories, and we'll, we'll have the entire building here. This entire thing will be a, a five-story apartment enclave, so we can get back some of the units that we lose on the, um, by reducing it from eight floors to four floors. Over here, we can, we can extend this, this leg, and I'm not an architect, and my architect is right here sitting on a rock, wondering what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> but we can extend this, that, that means we lose the pocket park, and we can extend a wing of residential, which actually would, would get rid of a cup of another special exception, and that we'll get to later, which that says that we need coverage, we need to have, and I'll get to that in a minute. Let me just jump around. But, there are consequences to these. One thing that we wish we could do, uh, but it's in Whole Foods, and there are four special exceptions that are being driven by Whole Foods. You know, we have 29 special exceptions here. Half of them was approved by the city, or recommended by staff, the other half not. But how, how, how do you end up with 29 special exceptions? You know, even our attorney says, hey, I've never seen 29. That's a lot of special exceptions. A part of that is that we have multiple buildings. An example is that we have three buildings on Sample Road for office and retail. And the code says the ground floor needs to be 20 feet, but retailers want higher ceilings, higher shop fronts, and they're now demanding in today's world they want higher ceilings. So our, build, our ground floor is going to be 23 feet. The code says maximum 20 feet. The second and third floors, the code says you can't go above 12 feet from ceiling to floor. Today's world, office space, classy offices, they want 13 feet. Now, staff has recognized that and has recommended these special exceptions. That's in, in the bucket that staff has recommended. But if though that one, what I just described there, just those things, is counted as four special exceptions. Because although it's one item, two items, it's on three buildings, so it, it, those things multiplied three times. 
We ended up with three or four special exceptions. We have two single story buildings, one on each end, the one in the courtyard, the one at the top, as two special exceptions, and we could go on and on. So what we've done here to simplify this is to categorize and group these special exceptions and treat them and have and discuss them by groups because to go through 29 special exceptions when some of them are just repeats is a waste of everybody's time. So what we're doing, what we're about to do here now is to walk you through the four groups of special exceptions um, and they are related. First one is related to Whole Foods. The other one is frontage. The frontage is used with regards to the code. Street setbacks and heights. We've grouped these so that we could address them collectively. Whole Foods, the Whole Foods frontage of 75 to percent. Um, I, I, I don't have I don't have an excuse for that except to say that it's a Whole Foods is insisting on it, and if we not going to do it, we're probably going to lose Whole Foods. Um, as Giselle indicated, um, we're doing this not because we think Whole Foods is a big money maker, but we think it will energize and support the other tenants that will be in, the, in, the, in this project and the other projects across the street. The 161 parking spaces is just a, another is another demand from Whole Foods, and not another one that is that we're placing at their at their feet. In fact, all four, the fact that we have to step back 165 feet, and that the building B, building three, has to go back 189 feet. This this even this one we they they were insisted on, and we you know. This was brought to us at the 11th hour that we should pull back building three. I, I, I don't have a, a good, clean explanation for justifying this except to say, without it, we don't have Whole Foods. What we did do to mitigate this is I, this. What we did do to help soften it is this is what similar to what we did with Fresh Market. We did this across the street at Starbucks and Holy Cross. And if you look at that, we talked about installing a landscape trellis that will help soften it so you're not going to, when you drive by, you're not going to see the parking that's behind it. You're not, you're not going to have a building hard up on the street, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're shielding the actual cars that will be parking behind us. You'll have the sidewalk, you'll have the landscaping that comes with, with that type of feel. It's, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's, a, it's a solution to help soften the impact of having full, Whole Foods so far away from the street. The other item I'd like to talk about is frontage. The other group of special exceptions is frontage. You have three three streets that that frontage is an issue. The first one is the University Drive, as he said, that's Whole Foods related. The second one is recommended by staff. Um, that is Sample Road requires seventy five percent. We have sixty eight percent, and a part of the reason for that is that we've separated some because of the separation of the buildings, creating courtyards and open spaces. We 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 have. In, um, have, haven't been able to conform to this code, to this, to this particular, but staff recommended it and we're grateful that they did. Coral Hill Drive. Coral Hill Drive is a secondary street. There's a code written for secondary streets that require buildings to be hard up on the street and to be, and to be covering at least 50% of the frontage of the street. We, our, these buildings, as we have them, covers 46%. Yes, if we put another leg, we'll get to 50%. But that might encroach, may affect the pocket park. So we don't think this is material enough. This, we think this fulfills, the inte this fulfills the intent of the code, and maybe not the letter of the code, but the intent of the code is fulfilled with this, and this, we believe, is justified. But, you know, we, 
we think they should be definitely justified. The where where the code where the where, uh, this is a question of common sense prevailing over the code. If this is a residential entrance. This is a residential street, and we, we as far as we're concerned, we think that this is a non-issue. The other, the other group of items are the, set, the street setbacks. And we've done a diagram here that will show you the three, the three streets and the setbacks that, that the top arrow on the right is 165 feet, the bottom arrow is 189 feet, both are Whole Foods related. The one on Sample Road where, that, where you see apartment B, that is not recommended by staff, neither is University Drive. Um, is that the requirement for sample road is that you must be no more than 30 feet from the street. The other four buildings conform with that requirement. Building B, however, there are some indentations in building B, as, we've, as you can see at the, at, the, at the circle at the bottom. There are three indentations that those, with those indentations in the building, you're now an extra two feet away. So you're now at 32 feet instead of 30 feet. Again, the, 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 the intent of the code is fulfilled here. And to, to force us to pull this building up two feet so we could satisfy that has the consequence of narrowing, the, either narrowing the landscaping in, on Sample Road or narrowing the sidewalk. Yes, we'll get more landscaping, more sidewalk at the back, but. We, have, we think we have enough at the back, and any surplus that we have should be to, should be visible to the entire city and more, and more open and more and be able to enhance the, the the entire project from the street. There are thousands of cars, thousands of people that drive by every day. Why not make it look pretty for them? Coral Hill Drive. You have two arrows there. The bottom arrow, I think it's. You're supposed to be, I think we're 26 feet and you're supposed to be 15 feet, is that right? And the reason, and one, and we've, we're grateful for the extra space there, because that's your outdoor seating for, the, for that corner restaurant and, uh, uh, or coffee shop. That's the outdoor seating area for it. Rather than pull the building harder, closer to the street, which is what is required, we think it's better used to landscape, have outdoor seating, create an outdoor patio, so that when people drive Along Coral Hill Drive, the buildings are not over them. It, it's a, and it does not violate the intent of the code. The Whole Foods University Drive definitely does because you have parking in front. There's no parking in front of these buildings. There, there's, there's public space. There's place where people can sit outdoor and, and fulfill the vision of the code that was just uh, articulated. Same thing with, um, with the other building, that, although that does not have residential, uh, a, a retail on the ground floor, but to pull that building closer to the street, I, we honestly don't see the value of doing it, just so that we could tick off that we've, we've fulfilled the letter of the code. The, this fulfills the intent of the code, and if it does, then let's just let common sense prevail and not be George, if you don't mind me asking, of the 29 special exceptions that are being sought, do you know which number that is that you're referring to at the moment? For Giselle? 18. I think we have it written at the bottom of the slide. Number 18, is that correct? Okay. Number 18, on the, so it's in the corner, the lower corner. Gotcha. It's kind of hard for us to see because of the, um, Matt's name is showing up on the 16. Side. Oh, apartment C is 16, and apartment C is the one hard on Sample Road. Apartment D, building D, is um, number 17, and that's the one right behind the second arrow going into Coral, Coral Hills Drive. So what you're referring to is apartment C in the lower left-hand side and apartment B? Apartment, apartment C is at the corner of Coral Hills and Sample. And that one is item, item 7. Item 16 yep. on your list, right? Yep, and then apartment B is 18. 
Apartment D is 18. No? Vice Mayor. B is 18. B is 18. Yeah, I, I see it on here. Okay. At least on our version. Vice yep. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I also had 19 and 20 that he had talked about for setbacks. Okay. There are, th there are six. There's, there's apartment C, apartment D, apartment B, building one, building three, all uh, are related to setbacks. The buildings, um, nine, number 19 and 20 is University Drive. Number 16 and 17 is Coral Hills Drive. And number 18 is Sample Road. Did I get that right? Yeah. Thank you. Now we get the heights. The code is written that on the within the hundreds within the hundred feet, there must be the, the, the maximum height is four stories within a hundred feet from the, the uh, boundary of a residential single family residential home. We uh, the actually let me first talk about your you want to go up the slide? Yeah. Right. Uh, gotcha. Uh -huh. This this here, what we what we show here is what we try to do to reduce the eight story parts of the eight story building that is that we can bring down to four stories, that is within the hundred feet. Those two arrows point to the two corners of these buildings that are eight stories, and we, after talking to residents, after looking at it again, we figured, well, wait a minute, we can drop these corners, and that would bring us in conformance with the 100 feet. More, you know, within, more or less. There's still a sliver at the northern boundary that will encroach by a few couple of feet, that will still be within the 100 feet, but the intent, the, the, the reduction of taking those, those, two, those two blue areas will reduce that, those corners down to four stories. So we'll give up four out of the eight stories to get down to that, so we could materially conform to the 100 foot setback. And George, have you shared this with staff before this evening, this particular uh, proposed reduction? Have if we? you know. We, we did mention it, but when we did, it was already too late for staff to change their submittal to you. The submittals had already been pre prepared, had already gone. In the last three weeks, we've literally worked nonstop to see how we could address a lot of these things, how we could respond to the citizens, how we could respond and make, make this as much as we could. Our meeting with staff occurred at a point where it was too late for them to make the adjustment that, that we're now suggesting that we could do. But they, so they're I'm, aware of it, but they so didn't. I, I'm glad to intervene. I'm glad to have you answer that question. And obviously staff needs whatever time they need to process some of the of course that they're seeing, although you may have spoken about it with them before. Yes. And we, we, again, we were grateful. Staff has been there for us all, it, all the way. Whenever we needed to meet with them, whenever we needed any information, whatever we needed, they were there for us. So we're very grateful for that. It's just that when we came up with this idea, it was too late for them to change your package. Understood. Uh, oh. this, this here is, is the parking garage. Again, this is where we, the code was written in a way that instead of re referencing to heights in feet, it, 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 it dealt in stories. So you could only build a four-story building, or four, you could only build up to four stories at the northern boundary. Well, this is a four-story office building that is 56 feet high within code. The code allows for that office building to be 56 feet high. Our six-story garage is less than 54 feet high, so it's a couple feet less than what a four-story building would be. So the four-story building is allowable, but the six-story garage, which is lower, is not allowable. We think that is one of the places where the code was not perfectly written. And what the code should have done at the time, and no offense to the code writers, is that it should have referenced heights by feet and not by stories. 
that's what we think it should should have been done uh, because it it would have avoided this type of confusion. Um, there was a mention about the amenities being on the top floor. We have a pool on the top floor of the garage, but I also what I'd like to mention while we on this subject is that the amenities that we have on the top floor of the garage is the garage is a pretty wide garage, so the amenities will be on the on the sample road side of the garage, which is within the 200. The garage straddles part of the garage is a hundred within the 100 feet, and the other part is within the 250 feet. The code allows for five stories within the 200 within within the 250 feet, and only four within the 100. We placed we pulled the pool and the amenities away from the rear of the garage towards the front towards the sample road so that it really does, that extra amenity layer with the pool and everything is not sitting on the 100 feet but on the 250 feet um, line. This, this is an actual rendering of, of what it would look like. Um, and again, we, 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 we only came up with these ideas days ago. We, we couldn't get the renderings changed so we kind of fudged a little bit and put some yellow blockers to show you what will be eliminated to bring these to bring these areas down to four stories. That's what is there. The other and this this is a great photograph because it also shows a, the the it also shows beautiful row of trees here that stands as a wall protecting the residential from from uh, from, from the um, activity on the other side. Um, you know you we actually, we actually, at, at the invitation of Ed Pozzoli, went to his home, Michael and myself, and we actually wanted to see what, what impact it would have from his cul-de-sac. Well, he's, he lives in the cul-de-sac, and what impact it would have. And we actually sent a, dro a drone up to eight stories and positioned the drone where the buildings would be. And Ed and Michael, I couldn't find I couldn't find the drone. They literally had to walk out of the cul-de-sac onto Coral Hills Drive to find the drone that was eight stories where the eight-story building was going to be. Um, and the reason the reason for that is there's unbelievably beautiful trees, tall, mature trees that are actually hindering the, the that would block the those eight-story buildings from from the cul-de-sac, and that was demonstrated. Um, with Ed um, when we visited him and you know so those trees there now not all of the properties are protected by these trees some of them are need helps in some in some areas where it is needed we need to plant new plant more trees and in some cases maybe build walls and that we we, we think we would we would do we would love to do it on a on a case by case, uh, where there is a, a strong, don't, we're not going to remove the trees, we're not going to take them down, but we do intend to add trees where there are no trees and where they, those trees would be needed along the entire northern, northern boundary to ensure that at least we can give some privacy to, 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 to add to some of the privacy that the, the neighbors deserve. Um, Where am I? I think I got it. Huh? Thank you very much. Thank you, George. When I went to see Ed, he bought me um, a birthday gift. It was my birthday when I went to see him. It was on Monday, la this Monday, last month, this Monday gone, two days ago. And um, he bought me a gift, so I asked him to thank his wife, who I thought made it. He looked at me like he came from Dor Doris, <laughs> but it was delicious. Nice. We enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Thank you all. Happy belated. Thank you, George. Uh, Matthew Scott again. Um, so as, as we all know in the room, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. That means we have a burden. We have a burden of um, presenting evidence and information uh, that 
our applications meet the criteria. And so I have up on the screen uh, specifically what the code what the code says for special exceptions. Um, the special exceptions that uh, but we're seeking approval of the special exceptions under the first criteria, which is that literal enforcement of the code here um, relative to these special exceptions would produce a result which is not only a burdensome hardship but is inconsistent with the general public welfare. And so that for us to meet that burden, we need to, we need to as George did, talk about the various dynamics of the plan as to why it makes sense uh, to, to proceed as we're proposing. But there are some other factors you need to consider that I want to make sure we get on the record. I think the first and uh, most important one are the existing lot constraints. So the code, as Tina said, is a form-based code. What that means is it creates a structure. And if you comply with that structure, the uses are permitted, and uh, you can go get your site plan approval and go straight to building permit. Well, the code dictates that if a, if a project is over four acres, it must have a main street. So it must have a spine road that is give or take 40 to 50 feet in dimension. So that strips away 40 to 50 feet of developable area. Well, in addition, the code says that there can't be residential, uh, excuse me, over four stories within 100 feet of single family residentially zoned property, and it can't be over five stories within 250 feet of residentially zoned property. So stick with me on the math here. I just told you that we need to provide a 50-foot give or take main street. And I told you that we can't have over five-story residential within 250 feet of single family. Well, the vast majority of this project has a north to south lot depth of give or take 400 feet. So this is a substantial hardship to meet this vision of the city of having a dynamic, mixed-use, uh, multi-family heavy commercial project. There's just simply not enough depth to accommodate the variety of uses. And so this is sort of our, uh, one of the key elements that justifies the special exceptions relative to the height along, um, along the north side. And then uh, going to the Whole Foods component for those special exceptions. This was a real challenging one, right, to come up with the criteria. But it's our obligation to show how the special exception would uh, better comply with the general public welfare. I think it is a fact that bringing a Whole Foods to our downtown, where the other parts of the downtown don't provide such uh, premium commercial spaces, uh, is definitely something that benefits the general public welfare. In comparison to just more apartments across the board, which the site is entitled for, which the city said could be built there, allowing for this Whole Foods with their quirky requirements will uh, drastically increase the general public welfare in this area. It will cause an increase in property values. It will attract a lot more uh, commercial tenants to this area. And so allowing for the special exceptions relative to the Whole Foods uh, will help promote the general public welfare for the downtown area. <clears throat> and then as to the, some of the smaller setbacks along Coral Hills where we deviate moderately by two feet here and there and along Sample Road uh, two feet here and there, as you heard from my client, uh, as I'm sure you could tell, he's very, very passionate about this. He's worked on this for a long, long time. The vision there was to give the city a premium product, not a form-based, simplistic product that just meets code, but rather a highly walkable, inviting pedestrian experience on all sides of the project. And so, literally, the reason why we don't meet code relative to the setbacks on Coral Hills is because they wanted to be thoughtful that this is historically more of a residential street. It's an entrance to a residential neighborhood. And so they wanted to make, to, to break that space up and not have it have as much of a, um, a building hardscape closer to the road. They thought that more landscaping and some building breaks along those spots would soften it for those residents. So with that being said, I uh, want to jump to the issues. I thank you very much for allowing us for this long presentation. We know we've gone a long time, but as you know, it's a pretty complicated, uh, dynamic project. Uh, the vast majority of the conditions the staff proposes, uh, we're happy to agree to. There's a few we, we, we want to discuss. Um, relative to the conditional use, the, the, excuse me, the conditions are the same for the conditional use and the special exception. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll address both. Um, I'll address them, them together. So the first condition I want to discuss quickly is A, that uh, if the condition use is approved for the Whole Foods, if the special exceptions are approved, that Whole Foods be required to um, comply with the setback requirements. As I said, in order to bring Whole Foods to the city, to, to our downtown, it's not gonna work for them to bring the uh, building up to the street. 
And so we'd ask that this, if the project is approved, that we'd ask that this condition be eliminated. <clears throat> the next one is relative to the phasing component. Uh, so staff said that if there's gonna be phasing, we need to come back to get city uh, staff and city commission approval of any phasing. Uh, the plan is to bring Whole Foods here first, and then that would uh, create the conditions for the rest of the project. And so we're asking that this condition be eliminated uh, because the phasing is something that is contemplated in our project as it stands today. And with regard to landscaping, uh, there was the request that landscaping be installed along rights of way and adjacent residential. I'm not entirely sure if staff meant to say right of way uh, because it sort of conflicts with the request that the buildings be brought to the street. But relative to um, adjacent residential, let's see if we have it here. We are happy to agree to a condition relative to landscaping. So what you see on the right in the yellow oval are what are called fishtail palms. And this is, I've used this on other projects I've worked on. What's great about it is the fishtail palms create a, a substantial and really thick buffer. They, they grow to 30 or 40 feet. And so they create a really great landscaping wall. And so we'd ha be happy to agree to this sort of condition. What you see on the left is bamboo. I'm not sure if Casey Lee, your, your landscape uh, reviewer, will love bamboo, but I'm sharing these images to show you that we're happy to comply, to, to provide a condition and work with your staff on a landscaping buffer. Uh, there's just concern about it being tiered because tiered means hedges, uh, multiple hedges in front, of, in front of trees. We think it might be better uh, for the residents if it just be a really substantial tree wall. The last condition I wanna discuss is that we enter into an agreement for the long-term maintenance of landscaping and provide a cash bond. Uh, we're happy to do the landscape maintenance agreement, but as you know, my, my client, longtime member of this community, a longtime property owner in this community has never had to do a cash bond before. That would create a real, uh, real financial hardship uh, that we don't think is necessary, particularly based on their uh, proven and long track record in the city. So we'd be happy to do the landscape maintenance agreement, which of course makes it our obligation to maintain. We'd ask that the 50% bond requirement uh, be removed. So again, uh, just, just to kind of sum it all up, thank you very much for this, this allowing us to, to do this long presentation. I think it's really important that I sort of close to speak to the community here that I didn't have the privilege to meet with on this project. There's a vision for this area, as we've said a lot of times tonight, and the vision for this area is dense, um, highly active, mixed use development on all four corners with lots of residential units with lots of commercial activity. That's been approved by the city prior to my client presenting these plans. And so while there may be some aspects of the plan you don't agree with, my sense is your larger gripe is with the intensity of development. And so I just wanna share with you that my client has spent countless hours, has met with many of you, and is open to trying to do as much as possible to address your concerns. But this is an area of the city that the vision, the long-term 20, 25-year vision is to make this a mini downtown. And we believe that the, the project we've proposed does a better job of providing an incredibly dynamic, exciting downtown area than strictly just complying with code. And so with that being said, um, we'll yield and of course reserve time. Maybe I should enter into the, the record. Everything we've submitted with our application and of course our testimony and presentation. Maybe our uh, backup is uh, you yeah, tell so, me how you so um, you have a PowerPoint which we can enter into as positioners exhibit one, and then what other documents are um, are those everything documents in the, in the PowerPoint? In everything in the backup. Oh yeah, sure. The backup would be petitioners exhibit. Make, let's have the backup petitioner exhibit one, and the PowerPoint petitioners exhibit two. Thank you. Are there any any questions of the petitioner at this juncture? I have several, but I'm going to ask in a little bit. I'd rather hear from the affected parties first, recess, and then come back. Yeah. Okay? Right. Great. So we're reserving our questions for now. It's not that we don't have any. Thank you very much, Mayor. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so at this point in time, uh, I believe we have five affected parties that we'll hear from. And then we'll probably take about a 15-minute recess and then come back for everybody else in the public that wants to be heard on this item. So who is the first affected party? I think on the sign up it was Mark and Lily Magley, is it? Yep, you're welcome, come on up. Um, yes, you can. So if you state your name and then uh, 
provide your presentation, that would be great. And, and just so you know, you do not have a time limit. You share what you need to share, whether it's evidence, argument, okay? Thank you. And feel comfortable. Uh, 9603 Northwest 35th Court in Coral Springs. Good evening, my name is Lily Magley. I am a resident of Coral Springs and have lived in the same home with my husband and son for almost 15 years. During that time, my husband and I have hosted holidays, birthday parties for our son, graduation parties for family members, and numerous gatherings each year. Our residence is a home. The backyard of my home, which I share with my husband and son, is lined with palm trees that separate my property from the vacant lot where the old city hall building used to stand. As staff stated earlier, code states four-story buildings must be 100 feet from a residential property line, and anything over four stories must be 250 feet from a residential property line. Current plans show the developer want to build a six-story parking garage 26 feet from my property line. And a two, and excuse me, two eight-story apartment buildings 38 feet from my property line on that parcel of land. The proposed distance of those two buildings from my property line is closer than where I am standing to the back wall of this room. Picture looking up at an eight-story building from your back door. Strangers peering down at my son, swimming in our pool with his friends and looking into our windows. I am here because my husband asked me to go over to Cornerstone to see how that will look. We measured the proposed distance from that eight-story building, and I was devastated. I hope you saw the picture my husband included in his email to you. I hope the commissioners and the mayor did their due diligence as well. We cannot help feel that our fellowship with family and friends will be ruined. Nobody will want to be watched by a bunch of strangers. This will wreck our active way of life. We will no longer feel safe in our home and always be worrying about our son, his friends, and our family playing and gathering at our home. Please consider our family and neighbors when making your decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just remind you all, and thank you for those that give that silent clap. I ask you not to clap like this for any speaker. Thank you, Ed. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, beautiful lady has come here tonight. Um, we've been here a couple times before. I despise being here, obviously. Okay, Not because I don't appreciate what it is you guys do. And quite honestly, being able to sit through a number of these things and be tasked um, with what you are um, is much appreciated by someone like me. Um, I've had a chance to speak to a number of you. I don't even know if you all recall. The reason why I didn't seek you all out individually is because we've had that conversation. Okay. Um, the issues are obvious. Okay. I hope and I'd ask. I sent an email out to all of you this week. Did you all see that email and read it, Mayor? I have not. You have not. Because no. that's important. But I, but I have it here. Okay. And I'll be reading it before I make my decision. Well, in this world, and I've countless, been told countless times, but I disagree. And I could go through the thing about how the vision has changed over 20 years about 800 times. Heck, it's changed a lot in the last month, okay? We're trying to do things, work around things. I understand that. They're here for profit. I'm here to sustain my family, okay? Safety, financial. All things impacted. Okay, we talk about values going up. Clearly, mine isn't. My, my future legacy to my son that starts in the form of home ownership is going to be destroyed. 
the sanctity of us being able to live in a home we hope to live our whole lives, or at least until my end, you know, is in jeopardy. And what I can leave my son, that I worked so hard to get the American dream and came to this city, set up over here. You saw my backyard. Anyone see the picture of the backyard with the gigantic rendering right next to it? Up on it? Yard looks beautiful, no? I work real hard at that. I try to make it presentable. Hell, I made it presentable for my friends' families before I even had a son. That's how long I've been there. Okay, I don't know if any of you have taken the time to come over. I think a couple of you have wandered out there, maybe. I, I wish you would. You know that in my, my email, I provided a picture, okay? And it was that thing that my wife referenced. Um, and I strongly encourage you to look at it. And for those of you there, I apologize. I did submit it, but somehow I didn't submit it in a PowerPoint form. I'm just a resident guy. But looking up, looking, I don't even know what a camera is. That would be me, the bald-headed guy, staring straight up at a building like this to get a concept of what that looks like. Because we can sit here and talk about what that might be. But that's undeniable, okay? If you've been over by Cornerstone, which again has changed many times and the commission has been faced with a lot of challenges there, you know, it's, it's an expression and I, don't, I do not gamble, I don't do anything like that because that's just not me. But it's called chasing the money. When bad things happen and people just keep chasing it and chasing it and chasing it and I just think that sometimes we're put in a position where we feel we have to do something and you just can't disregard what that does to the people around. The codes were put in place for a reason. And we can talk about the intent, but isn't the intent to protect us? Isn't it? Isn't there nothing in there to protect us? Should we just disregard all your codes of ordinance and say, hey, you know what? The intent was there, but it, you know, it doesn't matter. As it is, working around and even getting up close on a four-story building is terrible. Not real sure where the, parking, the pocket park is going to do, but I appreciate the idea and concept. But ultimately, when you look at this, and I understand their challenge to get a store in there, which we have already on the other side of town if someone loves Whole Foods that much. I have to tell you, I'm not a real big fan of Whole Foods right now. <laughs> nothing against the company. I know nothing about them. But obviously, they're very impactful on my situation. When I first got into this way back, people would say, come down. Former city managers, former assistant city managers, come, let's go to this meeting, go to a CRA, go to this. I'm like, what, what, what? I wanted nothing to do with this. I'm not a zoning attorney. Don't want to be a zoning attorney. I know too much about this now. But at the end of the day, when I watch my wife sit up here, heartbroken, and as a man, I'm here trying to protect my wife and my family and all that I've worked so hard to do. Some of you know where I've come from in life. Some of you don't. I've worked very hard for the community, I, in this community and the whole entire county, to try to get people to do what's right, to appreciate the taxpayer and what they stake. And I would hope this film would do that for me. I put into my letter, and I'm not going to read the letter, but I mean, it went so far as in the beginning, they were trying to convince me about gondolas, that they were going to have gondolas in the canal by my house, which EV is nice, and that's a great little attribute. But at the end of the day, we're going to fill in a canal and all the wildlife that goes with it. But we're going to pop up some EV. Not against it, but do we disregard one thing for the other? So I would ask you in this case, this thing has gone through, God bless them. I, it, this is very challenging for me, and, and they've done their best to keep me informed. Mr. Babinek, appreciate your consideration. It's not easy because... You guys know what I'm faced with here. And I appreciate your, your patience with me about that. It was never meant to, if you know me, I'm never one to be disrespectful. I will stand my ground about stuff. But I'm not one that seeks this. I'm not happy to be here right now, okay? But I have to be here. I have to hope that you have the compassion in your heart to look just past something and push it along because time, time is gone. I had a long time to figure out this thing. It's true, 20 years has been in the works, okay. And yet, and we still don't know exactly what we're doing. That's no offense to them, they're trying to make money, I understand that. But we are popping up apartments all over this town, and there is not a person that I've ever spoken to that says, you know what we need in this town? A 
apartments, especially high-rise apartments. And God bless the up and down sample and up and down Riverside and, and, and up and down Coral Springs Drive and all these other places that people have to live in an economical setting. It's not what's happening. Okay? And, and as I spoke to those folks, I'm not going to live in those buildings and work in the coffee shop. That little dream of a downtown where we work in the apartment and come downstairs. It was a condo back then, by the way. Then it became apartments. Across the street is all apartments. It looks like a tenement building. Those of you who've been to New York, small, small man's version. So the point being, guys, OK? I do want you to look at that picture. And think of that in your backyard. You talked about flying zone, drones over, and, and we spoke a little about that. Think about 300 zones sitting over your house every day. In your pool, in your windows. Okay, are you a grandfather? I think you're a grandfather, right? You got five grandkids. God bless. Do you want to have those people all staring down at your grandkids when they come around? Whether it be your house or someone else's. You have children, I know. Yours are grown, I think, if I remember. Yours are grown. But it doesn't matter. It's the sanctity of your home, protecting your stuff. And it shouldn't just be thrown out the window and talk about codes that are intended. Because intended. I think the codes and laws that are out there in our world are there to protect the citizens. It's not a matter of trying to hold back development. We all know I wish that was a park. <laughs> I understand. We all understand there's development going on. But we want it to be good development. And I don't think the whole nature of what happens to me and my family should be about a Whole Foods. Okay? I understand their thing. But it, it affects me in such a negative way that I just I can't embrace that. Expanding profit should not become the hugely unfavorable burden of the adjacent residents. And there's a limited amount of us, and there's probably more, and the residents have been speaking for weeks. Development staff has opined, the PNZ board reviewed it all, and opined in the similar fashion, in recommendation. So for you to just take that and cast that away, it's not only not fair or just, it's downright with intent. So I would hope that contrary to what so many people say, and I've had to explain this process to my son who takes civics right now and he's trying to learn about what you guys do, that it is a task that people take that has a heavy, huge burden and sacrifice. But it's the individual shouldn't be lost in this game, in any of these things. And there is a way. And I trust that you're gonna do the right thing by us and act in a way that's both professional without impairments, without undue influences. And those undue influences can be in a lot of different forms. Okay? And we know many of them are. But don't pull the rubber stamp out like people say you will do and do. And I don't believe that. I believe you're going to listen and you're going to do what's right. But once again, unfortunately, this thing got pushed to the end of the night. My son's coming home to a house right now from baseball practice that we had to drop him to run over here, okay? And God bless him, he's a great kid. And I hope one day you'll all get a chance to meet him and you'll see how important these things are. This particular area and my particular residence, we've been impacted by, and I don't want to get into all of that, kicked out of Douglas High School, okay? Now we have this going on, okay? It's just, it's, I, I, you know, come on. Consider these things, guys, really. And I, like I said, I uh, appreciate what you do. I really do. Um, I have faith you'll uphold and implement the spirit, the spirit and intent of these protections. And at the end of the day, what's right is right. Thank you. Thank you. And who is our third speaker? Um, As an yep, Mayor, and before we do that, um, we'll take the, uh, the email that was referenced and everyone has a copy of. We'll make that Mark Magley Exhibit 1, the email. Uh, next up on uh, my list is William Stone. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Commissioners, staff. Um, I live at 3506 Broken Woods Drive, the house right across the canal from the old City Hall parking lot, or now the 
end of the canal that's going to be shut off <laughs> or covered over. My name is Bill Stone, and I'm here to try to kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> um, and I'm going to cut right to the chase because there's a lot been said, and the, the flowering got to go away in the interest of time. So building height. This city village project has grown like all city, especially Coral Springs projects. It's expanded to fit the space available. We fought for years to limit the height of buildings to minimize the impact on properties against the canal and the homes in the clusters that border the north side of the project. We're trying to avoid privacy issues and the loss of sunlight and visibility to skyline. Having eight-story apartments and six-story parking garages on the north side of the project will eliminate any possibility of backyard privacy. I'm not going to speak any more than that. The Maglis did a great job. <laughs> but um, having six, eight and six-story buildings will wipe out any reasonable view of the skyline and eliminate any sunlight in our backyards and on our pool areas from surrounding uh, from the fall equinox to the spring equinox. Uh, I took a couple photographs. They're lousy photographs because they're <laughs> taken with my cell phone. Uh, they're pictures from uh, right outside our sliding glass doors. The uh, if you'll uh, you have them, mm -hmm. good. Um, sorry, folks, I didn't make powerpoints, but um, uh, I can show this one maybe. Um, this is a picture with some palm trees on it, and that's all you're seeing except for the crane on the far side of uh, Sample Road. If you look very carefully just under the fronds of that palm tree, you'll see kind of a beigey, orangey colored roof line of the now defunct um, strip mall that's going to come down. And we know that's two stories high. So we have some palm trees that nicely cover two stories, but you can see that those palm trees aren't going to cover four, five story. Um, the other photograph, taken just slightly a few degrees to the south, looks like a mass of trees. Um, there's a little bit of the canal that runs by our house in the area that's going to be covered over. But if you look at the very top of those trees, look carefully at that picture, look at the very top of those trees, and you'll see the AC units from this city hall building. I believe this is a five-story building, is that correct? Am I correct in that? Yeah. Okay. So if we were to move that five-story building, which is hundreds of yards away, to within 100 or even 250 feet of our property. There's no chance that any trees or anything is going to, number one, cover the building. But the building is going to block our view of any kind of, you know, blue sky. Uh, and it's certainly going to block sunlight during the winter months of the year when the sun is lower in the sky. And we're going to have a swimming pool to invite friends to, but without sun. We're going to have a backyard to try to enjoy, but without sun. So the heights of these buildings are very important to us. Uh, I'm not going to belabor that anymore. Um, my second target, the Broken Woods Drive entrance to Broken Woods Estates from University Drive. We live in the fourth house from University Drive on the south side of Broken Woods, right up against the canal. Fourth house. Between us and Broken Woods and uh, University Drive are six houses. When we, when we moved into Broken Woods in 1995, there were zero children in those six houses between University Drive and our house. Today, 2023, there are 24 children in those same six houses. <laughs> 24 kids, six houses, yes. If we turn and look west, 
to the next cul-de-sac up, and the next two cul-de-sacs, there's another 25 children. These are all the kids that George Rahal was referring to. You go further into the Broken Woods development, there's a total of about 75 children in our little 50 house uh, area. Those children are active children. They're not sitting in front of TV or in the house playing video games. They're outside on lawns in the street. They're playing whatever sport is current on TV, hockey, baseball, basketball. They're, they're riding scooters, they're riding tricycles. A little two-year-olds riding tricycles, zooming across the street. Um, I even saw them pushing a boat up the street the other day. Uh, I, <laughs> huh? I mean, the point is that we have a neighborhood conducive to the kind of children that I grew up with. Active kids who love the outdoors, whose parents feel that they have a neighborhood in which it's safe enough for them to be out playing and running from house to house. Isn't that what Coral Springs wants? The Broken Woods neighbors are very cautious driving through the neighborhood. We watch out for each other's kids. We put up signs, kids playing. We try to do for one another. We try to slow people down. Uh, I sometimes get a little vociferous with cars that speed through the neighborhood. If the city village project moves forward as proposed, it will pose a severe hazard to the life on Broken Woods Drive. Those children be faced with many times the flow of traffic. People who come out of the city village desiring to access University Drive will likely become frustrated with the backup. Currently it takes from two to five minutes to get out on University Drive. So they'll turn left through our development. Now, I know George has proposed that no left turn, and that would be great. But now what are they gonna do? They're gonna sit there, locked at the end of Broken Woods Drive trying to get out on University Drive. There's a small apartment complex, or not small, an apartment complex to the north that also comes out on that end of Broken Woods Drive. So all these things feed into one point. These people, if they can't turn left and they can't turn there, why would they want to come out that entrance or exit to, to uh, just get blocked up on University Drive? And now let's compound that with trucks. Whole Foods and others in the village will require tractor trailer trucks. These range from 60 to 80 feet long. The distance from University Drive to the center line of Broken Woods entrance to the city village is 220 feet as measured by me and my neighbor friend who's here. So we can get two tractor trailer trucks in that space. If you had one there, it's gonna take 10 minutes to get out from behind it to University Drive because a tractor trailer truck doesn't get the same oomph that we get to you know, take the risk to you know, slam the accelerator and try to make it through the hole. The tractor trailer truck has to look at everything going on on the street, and it takes a long time for them to get out there. You put two of them in line, now you're sitting there for what, 15 minutes? 20, I don't know. Um, somebody can calculate it, it won't be me. The frustration builds and the children are put at risk if they happen to be playing a little over the border of the canal. I propose that a minimum of all truck traffic is banned from entering or exiting Broken Woods Drive or 38th Street north of there. Uh, there may be codes that prevent that now, but I think the, the commission should and the staff should ban that. Um, these actions won't solve the gridlock. They may only be solved by the critical haircut and the size of the city village, which I don't think will happen. So paying attention to the height of the buildings is very important to, to us. Paying attention to the gridlock that's gonna form at that broken woods entrance to the development, the, the new development, broken woods as a development, and the apartment complex is gonna be a madhouse. Okay, I'm gonna close with this. Your invitation to this meeting states Special exemption is a relief granted by the commission which may be subject to conditions whenever the commission finds it and determines that a literal enforcement of any section of land development has one of the two following effects. One, 
produces a result which is not only a burdensome hardship, but also inconsistent with the general public welfare and produces a result which is not only inconsistent with municipal intent in the adoption of any particular section of the Land Development Code, inclusive of comprehensive plan, but also inconsistent with the general public welfare. We believe this project as it currently stands is inconsistent with the general public welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stone. Next affected party. Franklin Galley. That's the last affected party, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Frank Zingali. I live at uh, 9605 Northwest 35th Court, Coral Springs, with my wife, Gwen. And um, I'd like to thank the uh, City Commission and the Mayor for allowing me to speak at this. Um, I'd also like to thank the developer. He had taken the time to reach out to us, to talk to us, and we had a great meeting. They listened to our intent and our concerns intently, excuse me, and at the end of the meeting, there was no real resolve or commitment to adequate and change. Things were listened to, talked about, but nothing that was resolved. And while I understand development and I understand building, I have to disagree with a lot of the comments that have been out here today. The zoning that has been in place for 20 years, they had a foresight. They seen what the development could be. And they showed that with the four core of development within the main core of the city planning, it shows that the edges in the 100 foot setback. I understand that putting a property together and, and um, being able to put buildings up to meet a, a desirable, viable commitment, that it'll work out profitable, I can understand that. But I think there's a way to develop properties that we can stay within the resolve of the original zoning. I also say with the special exemptions, I will tell you that I'm always wondering why is this special exemption going to be our hardship and our burden? It will devaluate our property. It uh, will also make it more restrictive to sell it. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I want to have coffee in the morning sitting out on the back of my property looking up at an eight-story building. At 36 feet and 26 feet, it's not enough of setback. And the heights at eight stories, I don't agree with. I think that we can resolve the issues and design a property that is to a maximum effect, but a minimum effect on us. I don't think it was the zoning's idea to impact the residential neighborhoods, whether it's two of us, four of us, six of us, I don't know how many is in Broken Woods. But I don't think it's there that we wanna take and approve these special exemptions and make them our burden and our hardship. I'd like to know where our special exemptions are. Um, I don't really want to continue in this manner because everybody else has said everything and it is also getting late. Um, I do appreciate your time. And as I said on every one of these, this is going to be an interesting development. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> so you've indicated that uh, that's the last of our affected parties? Correct, Mayor. We, we have, a, uh, I think, 24 signed speakers for public. So there are 24 signed speakers. Uh, if you are not a signed speaker, but would like to speak on this issue, would you kindly raise your hand? So about one, two, four, six, maybe seven, eight. So about 30. So um, I'm gonna ask you to limit your speaking to two and a half minutes for each of the public speakers. So almost the full three that we'd normally do. Um, and then I just wanna share with you as the mayor uh, and as a representative of all five of us that serve you, uh, we are listening to all of you. We haven't prejudged anything. Uh, we have questions that we're gonna be asking and we have comments that we're gonna be making. 
uh, this meeting will not finish in an hour and a half. So we're gonna take a nice 20 minute break, make your calls, call your loved ones, hug each other if you feel like it. Uh, we will not be talking about this off the dais uh, with one another. We may talk about it with our city attorney or our city manager. Uh, and we will see you back here in uh, 20 minutes. So it's not almost 9.30, 9.50 we will resume. And, and Mayor, if I may, also this, the commission will not be speaking with the public because you are judges and you're not- That is correct. We will not be speaking with you as a public during this 20 minute, 22 minute break. Thank you. So we are adjourned for the moment.
We're going to get started in the next 30 seconds. And you want her to call two people and then one person so there's people are Yeah, we'll stagger. Okay. Your name, Aaron. So, since hopefully many of you will be too tired to be here for commissioner comments, <laughs> I want to invite you all before you all leave to our Veterans Day ceremony. It's November 11th. It's a great way to help be a part and lift our community, recognize our veterans. Uh, and we're at, thank you, can clap for that. <laughs> for, for veterans and for the pledgers, we can clap for them. Uh, and I believe we get started at 10.30, where we had the seating at 10.30? We'll finalize, we'll get that information to you. Uh, but it's a really important day for our community and it's a great way to give acknowledgement. And if you have children and they haven't been to a Veterans Day ceremony before, uh, it's wonderful to bring them to that. So uh, at this juncture, uh, we are going to have a public comment. And what I'd like to do is I will recognize two of you at a time. The first speaker will come to my right. Second speaker will come to the left. Then we'll have third and fourth, fifth and sixth. And again, Georgia will take the timer. Now, the time limit is two and a half minutes. But if you want to make it only 30 seconds, that's OK, too. So uh, and do we have signed public speakers at this juncture? We do. OK. Okay, we, can we have Devra Lee Isovis? Eis you could go ahead, come, come over here. And Mayor, we're going to call Ryan. Ryan up to here. Yep. Uh, so the question has been asked from the public, and I don't mind answering this. Can somebody that has signed up cede their time to someone else? They can't. And, the, and Mayor, the way they do it, we usually do that, though, it's not the full time if you're ceding. Right, you have to cede all of your time. So you'd come up, identify yourself, and then say, I'm ceding my time to Jimmy. I'm ceding my time to Doris. Yeah, we'll get it closer, closest enough to you, Ryan. Oh, we'll we grab a hand mic for you, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, you're up first, welcome. Thank you, good evening. Um, I'll start by saying I've actually never publicly spoken but for the protection of my children, my people, this is a first for me. So um, please forgive me. I don't have an official um, speech written as all my fellow neighborhoods do, but I just felt it was very important to stand up here. I am the second home, 3502 Broken Woods Drive from the development opening. Um, yes, it is true, within our three and four homes, there are 24 children. I'm the mom of seven children who live in under one roof. My neighbor across has 10 children and so on and so forth. You'll be hearing from some of them tonight. Um, as Coral Springs motto is everything under the sun, we welcome you know, the new development and things in, that are good for the people, good for, we're not against, we're all, on, we're all here together. But I do want you to understand how important it is that there are, yes, like you've heard everybody say, there are 100 children in that community, just in the four homes, 22, seven of my own, who play outside. We don't have TVs in our homes, and they play outside daily, and it is, we are very, very, very scared for their safety, because if you allow the trucks to come in and out, and all the traffic and everything else, we are very scared for our children's safety. I don't wanna say you can use your imagination. Um, so please consider when you're bringing in a commercial development to a residential home and backyard, it is my backyard where my children play and my, my pool is right there and strangers and I'm just scared for my children's safety as everybody else in my neighborhood. We are begging you please to reconsider, to consider that just for Whole Foods, all of our lives are gonna be impacted. Please consider keeping university open. All other 
junctures anywhere on university, whether it be Walmart, Publix, all down university. I've been living in my home th 13 years and some, m many, much, much more time. Um, you know that there's an entrance from university to every single Walmart, Publix, all the main, there's that Bed Bath & Beyond Plaza, which is, it escapes me now, but all the while, all the plazas in the corners from Wiles, that's my two and a half minutes. You have, wow. you're complete, okay. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I hand this Ryan, to you? Ryan, nice or? to see you. Can yeah, I if hand you have something you want us to see, you can give it to Frank. With yeah. title bomb. Come over to here. Riff can title bomb. Josh, can we get that mic? Come on. Testing, testing. No, all right. Let's grab a different one. No. Okay, you yeah, we're going to have you go, and no Ryan is uh, being patient. No problem. Um, Rifke Teitelbaum, 9502 Northwest 38th Street, Broken Woods. Um, I'm here about my concerns regarding the city village. Currently, they're proposing to close the traffic opening in, on University Drive. This is going to cause major traffic besides the trucks to go to Broken Woods Drive entrance instead. There are 22 kids, as she mentioned, over 100, and directly in the path. This is the main concern that, you know, what we're talking about. Um, at night, which I think I spoke last meeting, we drive very slowly to search out all the little kids that are riding on the scooters without any lights, coming from synagogue or even in classes. And it's perilous to think of the onslaught of heavy traffic that, are, that this development will bring. Last minute shoppers rushing through our development to beat the traffic on university. None of them are aware of the kids at night coming from synagogue, coming from those, you know, those classes. This road was never meant to be used in the capacity it's being proposed. There's no, so, no sidewalks, no divisions on the road, no traffic lights on 38th or Broken Woods. Um, these kids play on the road, they ride their bikes on the road, they hang out with their friends on the road. Um, it's gonna become a shortcut for anyone who wants to avoid traffic on university, especially if the proposed light on Broken Woods Drive happens, because what they're gonna do is they're gonna use 38th Street. Um, 38th Street is the other entrance to Brookwood's estate, and they're going to basically use our small development that don't have sidewalks, where all the kids are in the street, to cut into the shopping mall and avoid any traffic. Um, and if you look at the proposed map, map, you can see the heaviest traffic flow from Whole Foods and the building two is also from that main entrance into Broken Woods. I know they said they're going to make a no left turn. Um, probably easily enough, they'll just go into the attached apartment building and come out and make the right turn. Or you'll have cars coming down University and just going right onto our block. Or like I said, 38th Street. So there's very, there's still a lot of traffic coming into the small little development. Um, we're very much for progress and new development. We just want Broken Woods to be closed. I know Whole Foods doesn't. I mean, Whole Foods, kids safety, it's just we don't understand the comparison because this is the most important thing are the, are the residents. Um, I think you all, I've given you all the pictures, I've given you all my letters, and we have the signatures that everyone signed. Um, I think all of us very clearly see the exact, you know, danger that exists for the kids in our neighborhood and our lifestyle and our, besides the homes and the finance, everything and the buildings, number one should be safety. Oh, I guess that's Thank it. You. Well, at least I made the safety point. Thank you. Thank you. Did Zellman. we get your mic working? Zellman Teitelbaum. Yes. Can everyone hear? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Mayor Brooke, Commission, uh, staff. Um, my name is Ryan Gabauer. Address is 9881 Northwest 37th Street. I'm born and raised here in Coral Springs. Um, as everyone here has witnessed, I have been accommodated with this microphone. My niche as a real estate broker here in, in South Florida is to provide accommodations to individuals with disabilities. I would like to see the city of Coral Springs, as well as other cities, to set precedents, to provide accessible living. We need accessible living. Our baby boomers are aging. Our individuals are becoming disabled, disease, muscular dystrophy, I'm sorry, multiple sclerosis, strokes, 
these individuals are needing accessible homes. Let's use the term universal design. These are living spaces that allow for all those to use an accommodated bathroom, for example. So as we started improving and we start allowing more apartments, condos, townhouses, we need to also allow to have better uh, living arrangements, accessibility for individuals. My job is to find accessible living for those in need. There is a city employee that was severely injured last year. I was tasked two months ago to find an accessible home. It was extremely difficult. If we set precedents today for developers, from today moving forward, to providing these accessible features, it will make my life easy. It will make those that have a need easier to live. And when we want to provide the social uh, aspect for the new development in the northwest corner, in the northeast corner, and all the other corners that we decide to move forward with building, we need to remember the disabled population. When everyone leaves here today, there is no discrimination on becoming disabled. I was injured with a spinal cord injury at the age of 16, 20 years ago. And I'm here to help those with disabilities and hope to set the future to allow accessible living for all. Thank you, Ryan. Thank it's you. good to see you. God bless you. Sarah Herrera. All right, Sarah's gonna come over here, and it's your turn. Zalman Tarabam, 9502 Northwest 38th Street. It's nice to see you all again. Welcome. I'd like to start by saying I have no issue with progress and with, with, and with some of what the developers have planned, except for, my, except for the main entrance they want to use for the better part of the plaza. My main concern is for the safety of my kids and the 100 plus kids in our small community. From my understanding, there will be 700 to 1,500 cars a day for Whole Foods, at least 500 to 1,000 cars for the apartments and offices, and hundreds of more cars for all the other retail stores. Most of these cars and trucks will be utilizing Broken Woods Entrance, which is the road leading directly into our small knit community. This road was never intended for this purpose. When law maintenance companies park their truck, there's hardly room for one car to pass. People walk their kids and pets in the streets, and kids feel safe to walk themselves to friends' houses. Does Whole Foods come before the safety of our whole community? I brought with me a few photos to show you. These are the kids. I'll give them to you. In this picture, there's at least 12. And here you have kids driving in scooters. I want you to picture this. The kids in the afternoon riding their bikes and scooters in the streets, neighbors walking their dogs or taking a stroll. Where do you expect them all to go when cars are flying by them? Most of us moved into this development because it was beautiful, quiet, and safe for our kids. This will all change if nothing is done. Everyone here has been given notice of the real dangers and concerns we have for the safety of our children. We need you, our representatives, to really think about the implications. The way I see it, there is an easy solution. Close off Broken Woods entrance into the plaza and have everyone use university and sample to enter and exit. Our whole community in Broken Woods signed a petition, which I believe you all received. If not, I can give you a copy now, where 100% of the 50 households have signed. Not sure how many petitions get 100% participation, but I have to imagine not many, but this one does. Everyone in our community thinks this is a really bad idea to have the main entrance to the new plaza coming down our little tiny street. I'm pleading with all of you not to approve anything until we have a solution for this. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You want me to give you the petition and the photos? Of course. Brittany okay. Weisberg. It's your turn. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, Sarah Harari, 9668 Northwest 36th Place. My husband and I have been in Coral Springs. We've been residents for 45 years. Our four children were born and raised here. We have lived in our current home for 25 years. It's on 36th Place, just northwest of the City Village Project. Our backyard is literally on, third, on Coral Hills Drive. Over the years, traffic between Wiles and Sample has increased tremendously. 
Much of the traffic consists of cars and trucks using Coral Hills as a through street. <clears throat> traffic is constant and fast. The roundabouts are ineffective in slowing this traffic down. Reckless drivers treat them as obstacle courses to see how fast they can maneuver them. I've had to replace hedges two times because cars have lost control coming out of them and crashed into my yard. The intersection on Coral Hills and Sample is already pushed beyond its safe limits. There are cars coming from all directions wanting to make the green light for Coral Hills Drive. There are no turning arrows, which means people get aggressive in order to make the light. There have been numerous bad accidents there. The additional traffic that the Amera project will generate will make it impossible. I'd also like to add that I have grandchildren that live in Broken Woods and play on those streets. Closing the entrance on University, on the, the entrance on University Drive that is already there will cause traffic to use 38th Street and Broken Woods Drive as an access into the Amera development. This will jeopardize the safety of the families and the over 100 children who live there. I urge the commission to please honor our request to prohibit traffic from making a right turn onto Coral Hills Drive from the Amera development and no left turn into the development from Coral Hills Drive. Additionally, there should be no entry and no exit out of Broken Woods by any vehicle going to or coming from the Amera development. All traffic into, in and out of the Amera development should use the University and University Drive and Sample Road ex entrances exclusively. Thank you. Thank you. And you're up next. Robert Weisberg. My name is Brittany Weisberg and I live at 3500 Broken Woods Drive, which is directly behind the proposed Whole Foods and within feet of the sole entrance for all customers driving on Broken Woods or University Drive. This includes semi-trucks. First and foremost, I would like to say I'm a Coral Springs resident for 12 years and a, life, a lifetime Broward County resident. We moved west because we did not want to live downtown. Otherwise, we would have purchased in New York, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. We do not feel this project takes into account the want, needs, or concerns of current residents as it is instead a plan to bring in more residents and appeal to them. While it seems the majority of current residents seem to prefer a couple story shopping plaza with restaurants and entertainment, we are being told that does not matter, this development is happening regardless, so we are being forced to solely address the smaller issues in an attempt to preserve our quality of life. Aside from the above, my family's number one concerns are traffic and noise. We are requesting a 14 foot wall be put around the shopping plaza on the development sides side of the canal, not our side. We would also appreciate foliage to cover the sound barrier wall. We are also requesting the development is moved closer to sample and university and away from our homes in compliance with the code. As to traffic, we are requesting a cul-de-sac on Broken Woods or in the alternative, no entry or exit into the development from Broken Woods or in the alternative, a gate. However, we feel we are being strung along and don't know what is feasible, what is not, and who is in charge of assisting us in protecting our neighborhoods and keeping our children safe. Additionally, why have I had to spend numerous hours of my time when I should be working or taking care of my three young children to fight for the current life we have instead of this being taken into account by the city and developers? I've heard over and over about what Whole Foods wants and what the city wants and what the developers want, but what about us? What about the residents? What about what we want? I feel that we should be the focus of the project in our city that we all chose to move to. Finally, I would like to say the developers have been very generous with their time in meeting with us, which we are appreciative of, but we still have no concrete resolutions to our above concerns, which we are seeking here today. Um, and here's photographs of the wall that's at Costco and that we're requesting. All right, Mr. Weisberg, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I don't even know where to go with this. Um, everyone's kind of touched on, on on all of our concerns with Broken Woods. My name's Robert Weisberg, by the way, Broken Woods, 3500. Um, I'm the first house on the left. I would be the, the uh, first house behind the Whole Foods. Brittany's my wife. Um, everyone's kind of addressed the, the concerns already. The, our, it's a small neighborhood. It's, a, it's just a circle in and out. It just seems like it hasn't been taken into consideration thoroughly 
the neighborhood's concerns. If you look at, at the drawings and, the, and everything that we've looked at, it's all been about Whole Foods or what the developer needs or what Whole Food needs or the city's needs. There hasn't been much talk about in anything other than what we're presenting, our concerns and our needs. Um, bringing, bringing trucks, it, well, here's another thing. The, the loading dock for the Whole Foods would be directly in my backyard, 100 foot away. So you would, air brakes, backup alarm, loading all day, trucks in and out. It's, it's just, there needs to be more thought. Maybe people need to come out and look at this in depth. When we, sh when we seen the maps, all we really seen was the development, not much of what the surrounding area and how traffic would come in and out. The current, the current shopping center there has five entrances. What they're planning to build only has three. That was built in 1970. <clears throat> I think there needs to be more thought put into traffic in, traffic out, noise, and, and the effect that this is going to have on current residents. That's all I got. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our, our next two speakers? Emsley Armfield and Joshua Levy. Sure. Imsley Armfield III, I'm at uh, 9403 uh, Northwest 36 Court. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and the Council, thank you for your time. Thank you, George, and your team, and the city staff for all that you're doing to really make this work. So there's really not much more I could say than all of what these people have said and the people that you've heard already and probably the people after me. The main thing I want to really implore you to do is really work hard at saving the privacy and the safety and the value of these homeowners and residents in this community. This community with 50 homes is an incredible gem. When they talk about kids playing in the street, you read it in the newspaper about kids that are always inside, always on their screens and all that. This neighborhood is incredibly unique. They're playing in the streets, they're having fun, and there are a ton of them. So I just ask you to think hard and work hard, both the council, city staff, George and his team, to really come up with some solutions. There have been a lot of solutions given to them. You've heard of some of them tonight. Even buying big legacy trees and putting up there behind it could help a little bit. But the main thing is, that the uh, buildings and things of that sort are away from broken woods, away from the clusters, and that you know the safety and sanctity of these neighborhoods is really safe. So I want to thank you ahead of time for working hard on it and coming up with some really good solutions because we're really counting on you to do that. Thank you. Sarah Harvitz and Brad Horvitz. Horwitz. Mayor, uh, Commissioners Joshua Levy, 9505 Northwest, Northwest 38th Street, north side of Broken Woods. It's been said in prior commissioners' meetings that we must protect the most vulnerable among us. And there's no pri higher priority than their safety, than our children. And we sincerely ask that you do not approve the plans as, as they've been submitted without further consideration to the traffic, like we've heard from so many people today, <clears throat> through 38th Street and Broken Woods, and consider the privacy of the homes on the border to city village development. And uh, I strongly suggest adding to the agenda, as we all signed in a petition, keeping open the primary ingress and egress that already exists on university. Um, why should one retailer dictate terms and uh, put profit over safety to add parking spaces, which is, which is what comes out clearly from uh, the way the negotiations with uh, Whole Foods have been described. Um, in terms of privacy, four-story maximums, th there has to be more consideration to the privacy. A privacy wall has been discussed, just like Costco put up between them and uh, 
uh, 46th Drive, and uh, abundant signage, everything that can be po made possible. We, we realize something will be built there, but uh, uh, to paraphrase Abraham's negotiations with the Almighty, will you spare the city for 50 righteous men? Will you slow down the progress of this? Will you consider voting no to potentially save one child from an accident? Um, should we not take more planning and consideration rather than figuring out what to do after an accident, God forbid? So uh, that's it. There's a, we feel that the progress should be slowed, not rushed forward due to all the uh, potential hazards that have been brought up today. Thank you. Thank you. Brad Horwitz. Um, he's not here. I'm taking his time. He just left. There. He didn't see this time, so you have two and a half minutes. Oh, I married him for 45 years. <laughs> he did. Um, <laughs> Mayor, commission, city staff. First of all, I want to thank Julie and Tina, who come to everything. They just don't work nine to five. They're really, they're, you know, Corrine, uh, John Pierre, and her binder. There's the binders. So um, thank you. I've attended many city commission meetings and appreciate the need for due process in order to have synchronicity with all parts of the city and its residents. I, for one, embrace the zoning and codes of us that our city enforces. We all benefit from the clean, coordinated safety of Carl Springs until now. Having taken the initiative to foster a relationship between the local residents and Amera, I have mediated three meetings um, and feel capable of giving you a short summary. Amera is an involved company, a family business. They gave many hours of their time and effort to talk to the local city residents. Their previous projects are attractive. They're pedestrian friendly. I have no problem. I mean, the devil we know versus the devil we don't know as far as a, a developer. The concerns of Carl's, um, the hills, the lakes, the clusters, Carl Hills Drive is our main street. For the above neighborhoods, being used as a cut through from Wiles to Sample is a problem. No, the roundabouts don't, don't slow them down. We already have a bottleneck at Carl Hills and Sample. We object, object strongly to the ability of those traveling south on Carl Hills to make a left into the Amera development to go to Whole Foods. We would like new signage with it landscaping for our individual neighborhoods as the developer or our higher taxes can fund. This will help maintain the original fundamental nature of our neighborhood. We have been plagued with the drug treatment issue, the Airbnb fiasco, and we appreciate that the city intervened in those measures, uh, created ordinances and protected us. The Hills wants protection now. We agree with the non-recommendation of the right turn on, on uh, uh, the left turn on Carl Hills from Main Street and City Village, and we ask that there be no left turn from Carl Hills into City Village. We appreciate the City Commission voting to enforce ordinances as seen fit to correct this previous is issue in our community and encourage you to do the same in this case, as you did with the drug treatment and Airbnb issues. Thank you thank for you. being so responsive, and thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Oh, and our next two? Thank you. Penny Bartfield and Ida Janowski. Probably Ida. 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 Oh, it's a beautiful name. I've never met an Ida. <laughs> Penny. Sure. Uh, actually, so much was said tonight that I have so much to respond to, but you caught our time. So. I'm gonna to have to try to figure out what I want to talk about first, but I'll read my email to get it on record. Um, I stand here today, my deep concerns and, and objections regarding the Amera proposed development of the large shopping center adjacent to Broken Woods residential development, particularly in relation to the decision to close the University Drive entrance into the shopping center and the inadequate inadequate infrastructure for handling the increased traffic. I believe this development could have detrimental effects on the safety, well-being, and quality of life of the residents in this area. Everybody has echoed that tonight here over and over again, and I really think closing off that exit completely into the shopping center is imperative. It is the only way, if, if making a barrier 
or a gate going in and out of these of this road because it is a public road is not an option, then it cannot be an entrance at all being used into the development. If there's five other ent entrances and exits right now, one can be closed, university should stay open, samples should stay open, and a residential area and a residential small community should not be part of that egress in and out, especially since, like everyone else said, they're gonna be trying to jump the traffic coming in through the 38th Street Drive um, entrance, which I am the second house on that street. So it is unimaginable to think what could God forbid happen. When I drive in that neighborhood, as soon as dusk hits, I am literally going five miles an hour. There are kids zooming in and out on scooters. There are kids playing, kids coming back from synagogue at all hours of the day especially on Saturday, which is a high peak time for shoppers. So imagine how many cars are gonna be going through on a Saturday when kids are outside literally from sunrise to sunset and beyond. They're playing outside, walking across the street to the synagogue, congregating, and cars are gonna be flying by, not because people are intentionally wanna be harmful, but because they just don't know that there's 100 kids on the street and kids are coming in and out of those driveways on scooters. It is literally putting a stumbling block in front of a blind person. It is dangerous and I think personally it's reckless and I request you guys to please reconsider totally closing off that entrance. My husband unfortunately had to concluded. leave. I'm sorry. I know he wanted to speak three hours ago. And he left, so I would have liked to take his time, but I thank you for yours. You're welcome. I live in Broken Woods, 9405 Northwest 37th Court. I'm gonna echo what everybody said about the number of children that are in our neighborhood on the street, a small, tiny, one street that goes through the entire neighborhood. If that is open to traffic entering the plaza, then as everybody said, that is a recipe for worst case scenario. Now, a few people have insinuated this. It has been said many, many times among ourselves, among the people in my neighborhood. I've heard it numerous times in this room tonight that the question clearly here is what's more important? Is it the revenue that this project will generate or is it the lives of the people and specifically the children who live in this neighborhood? So for us, we vote for our children's safety over money and we really, would hope, and I hope that we can have the confidence to say that the city would vote the same way and has that same priority, that our children and their safety come first. That's all, have a great Thank night. Jennifer, Jennifer Levy and Gerald Dunn. So Jennifer would come on my right, and Gerald, you said? Gerald, Gerald Dunn. Gerald Dunn. If Gerald Dunn would come to this speaker. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, nice to see everyone again. So um, my name is Jennifer Levy. Please vote tonight with the priority of protecting our Coral Springs children. I am a resident of the Lakes off Northwest 37th Street and Coral Hills, and I want to ask for your commitment tonight in saying no in regards to the project's plan to allow a left turn from Coral Hills Drive into the new city development. The turn into this plaza will undoubtedly turn Coral Hills Drive into a shortcut for not only every new resident moving into the proposed condos, but everyone in North Springs and Parkland wanting to avoid University Drive. We request that a motion be added to include the already recommended no right turn from Amera City Village to include no left turn into Amera City Village from Coral Hills. The idea was mentioned at a zoning meeting but was taken out of the final recommendation. Remember, especially now with MSD rezoning, there's more bus routes that use Coral Hills Drive for our children to now get to Coral Glades High School. Our neighborhood children use Coral Hills to walk and ride bikes, ride, ride bikes to Coral Springs Middle School. Our Country Hills Elementary School bus routes are on Coral Hills. Our children are using Coral Hills for every single level of school. In addition, no to the request for an exception for an eight-story building, yes to privacy walls, 
using Costco's wall as an example, clear no commercial vehicles, no trucks, no throughway to city village signage with patrols and enforcement, and keep open University Drive and promote that along with Sample Road as the primary and only ingress and egress. We have faith that you will do the right thing tonight in order to maintain the safety of our children, living, playing, and commuting to school in the hills, the clusters, and the lakes. No left turn from Coral Hills into the plaza. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And our next two? Aaron Bartfield and Mendy Delphin. If you'd like to, to, uh, to someone that hasn't come, you can. If they've already spoken, you cannot. If you remember my rule was seed at the beginning before somebody speaks. Okay. But you can speak. Um, so I think uh, this meeting with the turnout will probably uh, be a little bit of noise in Coral Springs media, you know, and all the Coral Springs will reverberate a little bit. So I think the message tonight that everyone spoke about is not just a message of Broken Woods. It's not just a message of the hills, the clusters. It's really a message that's going to extend. Your decision tonight is going to be a message that extends the whole entire Coral Springs. And people are watching. And people want to know, where does our city government stand when it comes to the safety of a city that is known as a family city, a bedroom community. We're, on what side is our government gonna stand? And I think that's a message that's gonna carry from tonight, based on your decisions tonight, to the whole community at large. This is, a, I think, one of the larger, there was almost been 100% representation for Broker Woods a tremendous amount of people, and we just represent a small fraction of the many people that are in groups talking about this issue. Um, I know a friend of mine is here tonight, he could speak for himself, but about, he's, and he's not from our community, and he's here because people are talking to him about this issue. Uh, it's gonna have reverberations throughout Coral Springs, and I think it's important to be on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you. And our next two, George. Ronnie Morrell and Matthew Hamburger. Good evening. Hi. I just wanted to say that I've lived uh, in Coral Springs since 1983. When we, um, when we moved here, I lived off 114th. They built a building, an apartment building, that wound up having to uh, put a police substation in there because things got really bad in the neighborhood. Next, all the empty lots were built into fourplexes. So we basically got ran out of there for the safety of our children. We went to um, look around. We found a beautiful home in clusters, and I've been there for 31 years. Um, when we decided to move to the clusters, it was a beautiful home. My husband and I decided that it was time to move there. We raised our children and now our grandchildren here, and it's been a great quiet neighborhood. We knew all our neighbors, new and old, and when I learned of the monstrosities going up right down the block, it made me wonder, are they considering the neighbors that live there? These high-rise buildings are unacceptable. Who's gonna occupy them? Many hundreds of, uh, hundreds over priced apartments. I understand Cornerstone isn't even 30% occupied yet. Please, when you consider road safety, consider our neighborhood of many children, the elderly, the disabled, along with the walkers, the runners, the bike riders, exercising, and our Jewish neighbors walking on their Sabbath. Public school bus route runs right down Coral Hills, and this is where all the bus stops are. I want to remind you, Coral Hills also has a bridle path. We are zoned to have horses but too much traffic will not be safe for horse owners or riders. I'd like for you to take a look at the corner of Coral Hills and Sample Road, one-way traffic from the shopping center west of Coral Hills Drive 
and an exit and or entrance on the east side of Coral Hills with homeowners and convenience traffic from the north end of Wiles, Coral Hills coming out of the neighborhood and traffic coming from Sample Road. This road is not wide enough for the seven to 1400 or more vehicles that will be traveling that corner. I haven't seen any strips for uh, recording traffic for what I was told that gets done after the project's done. This community does not want traffic directed from miles through Coral Hills to sample, let alone south. So no entrance or exit on Coral Hills is our request. As a community, some thoughts were to put up signs or at a gate, which I understand can be done. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Matthew, good evening. Good evening. Um, there are three main reasons that I am here, and although I know virtually all of you, this is my first commission meeting I've ever spoken. Uh, many Coral Springs community members and my diverse students of my, my community have s expressed their anxiety about basically this intersection as a whole, but this, this topic is why I'm here, because they didn't feel comfortable coming, or they didn't want to. So I realized that this was my time to come. Um, and I have friends that I consider family members that live in broken woods and I see the children and it distresses me. This city is my home. I care about the decisions and the progress of this community. Um, I was surprisingly satisfied with the exceptions that the city staff recommended. And do we really need additional, 400 additional expensive apartments? And aren't the schools already overcrowded and where are they gonna be zoned for? What schools? So I'm grateful for the progress of the city and I wanna see more progress made, but I hope you prioritize people uh, in this decision. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Have a balanced night. Mm -hmm. You as well. And our next two. Maria Caldor and Judith Greenberg. Good evening, Maria. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for having us, and um, we thank the, the, C the city staff for their good work, and of course our commissioners, uh, mayor and vice mayor, and the mayor developers, thank you and of course our neighbors. Um, and I will echo my, my, um, my neighbors, um, you know, there should be no exit or entry between Coral Hills Drive and Broken Woods uh, and Amera, the, the, the city development by Amera. Um, the entry and exit should just be sample and, and university drive. Having said that, I want to say something else. Um, Whole Foods, I, I hear that mentioned over and over again, seems to be the cause of all our woes tonight. Um, it's really not worth the hardships it will bring the neighborhoods of broken woods, the hills, clusters, the lakes. Um, it's just not worth it. And uh, from, from when I heard Giselle in her explanation tonight, it seems that their original plan was really residential, um, it was um, retail and commercial, right? Uh, they only had to now um, include these apartment buildings, they have to build them because they're giving up uh, commercial and retail space to the grocery, in this case, Whole Foods. So if we, get, if we give up Whole Foods, then you, all, you can also give up the apartments and we go back to what we all, we all want, which is retail and commercial spaces. So that, you know, I mean, that's probably going to um, pause the development, you know, uh, but for me, like all this talk about traffic and entry and exit and all these things, um, and even um, asking for, co you know, code um, exemptions, all these problems go away if we just go back to their original plan without Whole Foods and without the apartment buildings. Thank you, Teresa. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. So my name is Yehuda Gershberg, also Greenberg, but anyway. So I live in the hills at 9621 Northwest 41st Street. 
And like everybody else, I'm concerned about the traffic because I know coming down Carl Hills, getting onto sample as it is right now, there's always bottlenecks. But you've heard it from everybody and also the problem with broken woods, you've heard too. But what shocked me, and you probably can't see this, is they showed a picture. You guys talked about a vision. And when you talked about your vision from 20 years ago, I don't think this picture of all these high rises on sample is what you were talking about. You were talking about a vision that looks more like Meisner Park, of little fountains and pretty um, stores and restaurants and something simple. And that's not what this is. We're developing a corridor between university and sample that's full of apartments, 30% are rented, how many more are gonna be rented? And I don't know if this is what you really want. But somehow it's like a cycle, and you're getting stuck into a rolling ball. But somebody has to sit and look at this and say, is this what we want of our city? Yes, it's going to make all our lives miserable. Every one of us is going to have trouble getting in and out. People are going to be cutting from sample to wiles. Broken Woods is going to be traumatized because of their children. The rest of us, I have a dog. We're going to be traumatized because of our dogs. And I don't really think this is what you want. Now, also, in terms of direction, I lived in Aventura, there's a Whole Foods. You get in and out on Biscayne Boulevard. In Coral Springs, there's a Whole Foods. You get in and out on University. So all this nonsense about they're insisting that you shouldn't come in on the main roads doesn't make any sense. So hopefully you guys are gonna vote to save our lives because all of us are gonna be miserable otherwise. <laughs> and then we'll make you miserable. <laughs> you might have had the most waves. No clapping, no clapping, but a lot of waves. And our next two? Nicole Kearney and Cynthia Weiner. And after that, how many have signed up? How many more? Five. Okay. Welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Nicole Kearney, 9405 Northwest 38th Street. I'm in Broken Woods. I support all of the city staff's recommendations for denial for the exemptions. I absolutely support their new condition F to revise the site plan to maintain the university drive existing exit. This could look very similar to what we already have on the northbound university drive before sample right in front of the library and the charter school. Um, the developer has suggested adding landscape between the houses and the new apartment complexes, but like Mr. Stone said, nothing that it will do will give back the view that's gonna be lost, so I still think that you should definitely vote no for that. Um, they, Mara had it up today that they were acceptable about putting in no through truck sign on Broken Woods Drive. You guys can do that. Just make a motion and tell your staff to begin the process to put in no through truck zone, and that will reduce a lot of our community's issues. Um, and then as to the through traffic on Coral Hills and Broken Woods Drive, I know that they want certain lanes closed and stuff like that, but you can also just direct your staff to do other things for signage, um, adding a turn light for both ways on Coral Hills Drive, if we can petition the county to add turning lights there, that would probably reduce a lot of the traffic that you have there. And then at the PNZ meeting, they added a condition about the traffic warrant analysis study. Um, it's a very limited analysis for just traffic signals for cars. That there's other traffic warrant studies that you can do that you can put in pedestrian crosswalks over there if the, if the you know we have the need for it. So I think that the condition that they put in is limits what you can do, what we can provide for. And then the traffic studies that we've done previously were done weekdays. I know that that's probably typical, but our community has a very active, different pattern of when we are pedestrian traffic. So if um, they can, when they do the next study, if we can have one done on the evening, Friday evening to Saturday evening, that would probably be, show a very different traffic pattern for our community and would give you a better idea of what you can do. Um, I'm very excited for all of the construction to be done. <laughs> I can't wait for it. Amera is not Mill Creek, and we're very happy with them. And I hope that what we get is something we can all live with. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And our next two? Uh, was Cynthia Weiner here? Robert Fogel? He said he was going to save us. OK. <laughs> Scott, Scott Lombard? Lombard, and Dave Kendricks. Okay. Um, my name is Scott Lombard, and Mr. Mayor and Vice Mayor and Commissioners, thank you. I didn't think I'd be here this late. Good evening. Um, and not to be remiss, uh, how many kids I live in, uh, well, all right, let me tell you, it's 3600 Broken Woods Drive 
I am the sixth house up on Broken Woods Drive. And um, one of the reasons I love my neighborhood is because I grew up in a neighborhood up in New York where kids played in the street. I'm also a realtor in this town, so I have a lot of interest in what goes on in Carl Springs. And this is one of the few neighborhoods that kids play on the street. And they're not watching TVs, they're not on iPads, they're out playing on the street. One of them even comes to my, door, my house to play with my Boston. So, little Boston Terrier. So, my, my point is, I was, these presentations, these PowerPoints, they were great. They absolutely were. The vision, you know, the, the beautiful apartments and all. But what really stuck out to me was when George said, he can't close Broken Woods Drive, it, uh, you know, the entrance onto Broken Woods, because Whole Foods just won't allow it. So I can't believe if it's, if the building's coming down, it's an empty lot. Why does Whole Food get to dictate the safety of the kids in Broken Woods? 18 wheelers cutting into a little narrow street by a bridge where kids are playing all over the streets there. I, I just can't believe that a developer would even allow a box store, a grocer, to dictate how a development should be. And if that's the case, maybe they should go and ask Sprouts to take over and you know, move in. And if it's starting as an empty, clean canvas, Whole Foods could be put anywhere. It doesn't have to be put there where there's a loading dock behind a neighbor's house with the, you know, beep, beep, beep of the sounds. And, and, and one other thing before my time is up, we can't get out of Broken Woods now. Sorry, Scott. We need a light. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Thanks. My name's Dave Kendricks. I'm a veteran. I've been in Coral Springs for over 40 years. I've owned multiple houses, multiple businesses, commercial. I have four children. Three are still in Coral Springs that own their own home. So I consider myself a true Coral Springs patriot, okay? So it has aggravated me for the last few years that the traffic now, without any other, and some is construction, but it's just more and more apartments and more and more buildings that are going up that makes the traffic this way. So I have some questions, and I, want, I don't want you to answer them because I, wanna, I don't want to use all my time, but who performed a traffic study for those two that are going up now? And the other question is, did he have any affiliation with the contractor that's building those buildings right now? The other is, have you guys done a study on the cost to the city for the traffic? From a previous meeting, someone said it would only be four or five minutes additional for the stoplights. <clears throat> well, I don't know how many city vehicles leave this location or come to this location, but if you had five minutes to every hour of that, that's 40 minutes per day per whatever the hourly rate is, plus the gas, plus all of it. You guys do the math, but who's gonna pay for that? I'll answer that for you. We are, okay? Because it's gonna impact you too as far as the study and the budget that you have to do. You're either gonna have to hire more people and or do something different. Um, <clears throat> the Chick-fil-A <laughs> thing kind of spurred something or an idea on, and that is, do you have a contingency plan if the plan that is put in front of us says there's not going to be a traffic jam, there's not going to be this, there's not going to be that, do you have another lot to buy like Chick-fil-A? Again, I think the answer is no. The other comment that I have, and this is just me, okay, we're talking about an eight-story, you know, I don't know how many apartment buildings. In my opinion, that's a bait and switch. That's being presented to everybody out here to say, that's what they want to do. They're going to reduce that down and they're going to build X amount there. I don't want any more apartments. What's going to happen on the northeast corner of Sample and University? What's going to happen if you go south on Coral Hill? Thank Drive, you, Dave. All those apartments. So it is 1044. 
Uh, in an hour and 16 minutes, we have two birthdays on the dais. <laughs> we might still be here, uh, and we likely will, just a heads up. So uh, some of you say, oh, well, you know, I had to go, or my, my family had to go early. We're sticking around. You guys are welcome to stick around. Uh, this is our meeting. We are your commission. We are your commission. Any others from the public would like to be heard on this item? We have two okay. more signed signs. Oh, two more signed? Great. Well, good to know who wasn't signed, but okay. go ahead. Next two signed. Sandy Lopel and Wally Rosen. So Sandy on my right and Wally on my left. Hi, Sandy. Good thing I know my right from my left. <laughs> my name is Sandy Lobel, and I live at 10777 West Sample Road, apartment 216. I'm not a stranger to Carl Springs. I've almost lived here for 40 years. You chose me to be an ambassador. That's why I stayed so late, to be the ambassador of the residents of Carl Springs. Um, Carl Springs was built to be a community development, a excuse me, a family community. What family can afford a rental? What family with children is going to move into an apartment with the rental fees of about $3,200 or $3,500? I want to know if this um, development is a done deal. You told us to embrace the traffic, Scott. I want you tonight to embrace us. And I was part of that vision 20 years ago, and I don't recall any kind of development that we're talking about tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Wally Jrosson, and uh, I live in the, the affected area. Uh, first of all, we always make a left turn at Carl Hills Drive. We have to go by way of China to get home. And if you're on the, if you're on the parking lot that exits at Carl Hills Drive, with the stores there, it's one way, it would be very difficult to make a left turn with all the proposed traffic there's going to be. Um, and so, um, now, the eight-story building, you know, no one wants to be in display for people to see how you people live, their children, and everything else. Uh, and although there could be some foliage, some vegetation growing, I don't know what you're going to grow in a short period of time to cover eight stories. And people who are really affected by these high buildings, when they go to sell the property, many will not buy a property with eight stories hovering over them, which, re which reduces the quality of and the price of the property. Now, um, as far as the apartments are concerned, in Southern California, I sold real estate. My husband and I had a large paralegal business, and we specialized in tenant uh, relationships, landlord-tenant relationships. I don't know why you're going to have apartment buildings. Why don't you have a condos where there's a pride of ownership? Because the, the, the condos, yeah, if, they have CCNR showing that you can rent. Second. I'll give you extra 10, 10, 15 seconds. I'm asking you, please, no more clapping. If you do clap, instead of a silent clap, you will be escorted out. Are you clear with my instructions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, condos have CCNRs, uh, most likely, that will allow rentals within specific, specific guidelines. And my husband and I, with our paralegal business, we were number one of all of Southern California. And I feel by doing this in rentals, you're really opening up a can of worms. And believe me, I know all about that. Um, and I think that, you know. You got an extra 10 seconds. <laughs> OK, it's, when you're building all these big uh, residential areas, was, is all of New York coming, coming, yeah, coming down here? We're entitled for our peaceful existence. And this does not comply. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And any other signed speakers? 
Hey, you have no more signed speakers. Okay, Ed, I saw your hand up. Please come to the mic on my right. Good evening. I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but first of all, thank you all for taking the time to see me uh, individually, uh, the member, all of you, the entire city staff, and I want to acknowledge the wonderful presentation that Tina gave on, on the exceptions. Most importantly, I've gotten to know George and his family over the last several weeks, several months, and they're wonderful people, and I do think that he is the right person to commercially develop this property. Uh, he's done wonderful things for the city, and I think he has the city's best interest in heart. With all of that being said, uh, we're looking to solve the problem. I can't articulate what everybody else has said any better than they have. They've all nailed everything. Uh, two particular things come to mind. One, if we flipped the commercial with the residential, we eliminate all of the setback requirements. You put the uh, residential along university, and you bring the commercial uh, to the west side of Coral, uh, by Coral Hills Drive. Not only does that eliminate the exceptions, but that becomes a lead-in for the continued CRA district that you have going down Sample Road. And if you're looking, as Tina said, for the original vision of what Coral Springs was to create uh, pedestrian traffic, that's the way you do that. You bring people in so that they have other places to walk to. People don't want to walk to a Whole Foods, walk through 400 units, and then walk to the people that are on Sample Road to the ice cream shops and the various other shops. Uh, I understand doing that will uh, eliminate or possibly uh, with the Whole Foods situation, and I understand the financial burden that that will occur. Um, unfortunately, Whole Foods several years ago was on the verge of bankruptcy. I understand it was purchased. We are in living in such uncertain economic times that there's no guarantee that Whole Foods would, su would succeed there or that uh, economic conditions won't change, that they'll get rid of that. And what will they have at the end of the time? A, a big lot store will be there to replace, which will be the reverse of everything that you want to do. Uh, I think it's an inefficient use of the space by leaving all the single uh, parking spaces along university. Yes, it looks beautiful there, but it's not efficient and it's not accomplishing what the vision of the city wanted. So my suggestion is, is I'm sorry, Whole Foods doesn't kind of meet it. They may not be around in two, three, four, five years. It, things may change and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for yours, Ed. Hi, Richard Please. Masters, Broken with the States. There's three issues, safety, traffic, and privacy. Those high rises that they're gonna build are gonna be an invasion of privacy for a lot of the citizens of that community of Broken Woods. <clears throat> Secondly, the traffic, we have 1,500 rentals coming in. God knows how many cars that's gonna consist of, how many commercial vehicles are gonna be in that area. We're gonna have chaos in that area. As it is now, I leave 38th Street, Northwest 38th Street in the morning to bring my grandson to school, and I have to dodge the traffic to get across into the north lane of University Drive. And when I say dodge, I mean dodge. Secondly, we can resolve that problem by putting a traffic light there, number one. That will resolve that issue. As far as the traffic goes, we can also put a gated community and have the city and the developers share the cost of re repairing and taking care of the streets of that community so the citizens don't have to take care of it. And thirdly, remove the stories on some of these high rises down to three stories or move the buildings to the forward part of Sample Road where they can't look down on the citizens of the community of Broken Woods. I think we have a situation where in history they call it taxation without representation. And I demand that the city follow suit and take care of the citizens and be accountable to the citizens of this community. Thank you. Would somebody else like to be heard at one of the mics? All right, I see one hand up. Come on up. Uh, 
Hi, um, my name is Pesha Kirsner. I'm a resident of Broken Woods. Please, if everybody can be quiet. So I have. Uh, I've lived in the Parkland Coral Springs area for 30 years. I am going to uh, Your read. Your name one more time. Pesha Kirsner. I'm going to read a letter uh, from a neighbor of mine who couldn't read the letter. The decision to close the University Drive entrance into the shopping centers is both dangerous and quite frankly ludicrous. This major road serves as a primary access point for the shopping center. Closing it will force all shoppers to rely on the entrance road of the Broken Woods residential community to gain access to the shopping center. This increased traffic through our small neighborhood, Broken Woods Road, poses a serious threat to the safety of more than 100 children who reside in this community, as you've heard. Additionally, the 38th Street Road, the neighborhood, the neighborhood road that should ideally service members of the Broken Woods community, will inevitably, inevitably be used as a shortcut to gain quicker access to and from the shopping center. The increased volume of vehicles on 38th Street due to this development is a matter of serious concern. The road was never designed to handle this level of traffic. Its use as a thoroughfare for shopping center access puts the well-being of our residents at risk, especially children who may be playing, biking, scootering, or walking along these roads. It is our shared responsibility to ensure the safety and security of our community. And it's evident that this proposed development jeopardizes that fundamental obligation. Furthermore, I'd like to stress that Saturdays our Sabbath, poses a particularly significant concern in our community. This is the day when children are most likely to be out in the streets at all hours of the day, playing, congregating, and walking to the synagogue. It's precisely during these hours that a substantial number of people will be rushing to Whole Foods to do their shopping, as it is often a peak shopping day. Finally, the city intends to bring thousands of new residents and shoppers to the Sample and University Drive intersection. It would be prudent to designate a portion of that area as a park to serve the recreational and green space needs of the community. Preserving a proper balance between commercial development and green space is essential for the well-being of our residents and is in alignment with the city's charter. I urge you to consider the green to land ratio and the quality of life for the people who call this area their home. In light of these concerns, I kindly request that the City of Coral Springs reevaluates the proposed shopping center development. Thank you. Thank you. Can I submit this as uh, for you, you guys? You can give, give it to the city clerk <coughs> or Frank. Hi. Hi, welcome. Oops. Oh, sorry. Okay. Please. Okay. Can you reset that, the timer? Sure. We'll okay, reset. thank you. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but this just popped into my head literally about half an hour ago. Um, my name is Kana Scheinberger. I live at um, 9500, sorry, I'm very nervous, Northwest um, 38th Street. And um, I remember reading, a, there's a history book about Coral Springs, and I can't remember if it was the first mayor or somebody else from way back was saying that he was in a plane flying over Hawaii and when he looked out the window, all he saw were treetops, and he said that was his vision for Coral Springs. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, I'm going to have to find them. Okay, I'll have, have to, to find the book. If you wouldn't mind, yes. address us. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, so that just stuck in my mind, because if you're driving a flying a plane over Coral Springs, you're not just going to see treetops now, you're going to see all these things. And I'm just going to read something very quickly. When McDonald's first opened in 1975 in Coral Springs, it was the first McDonald's that did not have golden arches on the exterior. Since signs above six feet tall, as well as signs with multiple colors are not permitted by city code, McDonald's used a smaller version of the arches. This anomaly was featured as a question in the original edition of tr the 1985 Trivial Pursuit. And that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you for being here. Would somebody else from the public like to be heard? Please come on up. Good evening, my name is Debbie Lombard. I live at 3600 Broken Woods Drive. I have been a Coral Springs resident for 37, almost 38 years, and proud to be one. Um, I can tell you that I moved from Miami because of the major crime that was going on in those days in the 80s. Um, because I moved here to Coral Springs because of the safety and because it was a children's, it was a family area. Living in Broken Woods has been wonderful. I will just say briefly, because I 
resonate everything. I have four children that have grown up here in Coral Springs, eight grandchildren. Yes, they're there, but I do have a sign outside in front of my house, please drive slowly. Why? Because we care about the children in our neighborhood. I know that the city understands the importance of that neighborhood because every year during the holiday parade, they set the police um, police cars at either end so no one comes through because it becomes a cut through and they know that it's unsafe. I can tell you now, you know this, please reconsider for our safety and for all of the residents there and mostly for the children. The first mayor of Coral Springs did live in our neighborhood and from what I know, and I don't know this for a fact, so please if I'm repeating the story wrong. At the time during the holidays, they used to have a fire truck that would come through and throw out candy to the children. And unfortunately, one child was killed. It was a good thing. It was something that was going to make the city better and made us more together. But it didn't happen that way. Please consider if 100 children, one child, just one child, who's gonna call that parent and say, I'm sorry? I wasn't thinking, is it Whole Foods, is it you, is it us? Please consider our children and our families and our city. Thank you. You're welcome. So I just want to let you all know uh, how the rest of this evening will go. Uh, you still have a chance, if you haven't spoken, to come on up. Um, after the public is closed, there's a final presentation by the petitioner in response to any testimony from other parties. Uh, then there's a final presentation by the city in response to any testimony from other parties. Uh, us here on the dais will be able to ask the petitioner our questions. We'll be uh, able to ask our city staff our questions. After that, in discretion of the commission, not just me, uh, the petitioner may be permitted to respond to final staff recommendations, and then we deliberate. Would anybody else from the public like to be heard? Okay, our public hearing is closed. So uh, at this time, I'll invite the petitioner to make its final presentation to respond to any testimony from other parties. Uh, it says any testimony, but I'm happy if you want to respond to any of the comments made by the public. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Matthew Scott, again, for the record. I, uh, I'm just gonna go over some of oh, the and hold on matthew if you don't mind one moment so i just want to acknowledge uh the members of the public that were here are here that spoke and that you're still here and maybe just listened uh i have found you to be respectful i have found you to be kind i have found you to be thoughtful um, and we appreciate the opportunity you extend to us to let us hear you uh, in as kind, as graceful a way as you've been able to. Some of you are very passionate uh, about being here, and we respect your passion. Back over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, you know, if I could just for a moment, so I do this for a living in a lot of cities in Brown and Palm Beach County. I just want to tell you, you guys should be proud of your city. I go to a lot of cities where it is way less respectful than this on contentious projects, particularly projects for redevelopment of commercial areas with, with residential behind it. This is kind of a consistent development pattern in Broward County, all along Federal Highway as an example, all along 441, there's residential in the back. So I just wanna say, to, you may disagree with this project, but you've been very respectful and thoughtful, and, and, and I personally appreciate that because sometimes it can get um, much more disrespectful. So I just wanted to share that with you. That being said, uh, of course we disagree with some of the comments you made or some of the concerns you raised, and so I wanna run through some of that. Um, First and foremost, and I'll try to go quickly because it's late, with regard to any noise concerns. So your city has uh, review requirements for grocery stores like this. And so we were required to obtain a noise study uh, by a uh, noise professional to analyze the noise and the impacts. And there are thresholds your code has. And so what I can tell you about that noise study is it was reviewed by your staff. There were no concerns with that. And so the distance of the, distance of the grocer from the neighboring properties and uh, the mitigation measures such as the walls on the sides of where the trucks will come all met your code requirements. So there were no issues there relative to the grocer. Now, uh, 
With regard to the affected parties who, uh, to sort of summarize their main concerns, it was the height relative to their backyards and how close the residential development's gonna come to them. I think it's important that there always be perspective um, and consideration of alternatives. So as I said in my presentation, but I wanna just elaborate on quickly. Um, there, the, 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 the city years ago made the decision to allow a certain level of development in this area. And so your code permits as of right with no special exception needed, no conditional use application needed. As of right, it allows up to 50 feet of height within the 100 foot setback. So I just wanna clarify that because I believe a few of the affected parties are under the impression that there's a no build zone from their property line to 100 feet. Rather, what the code states is, you can go up to 50 feet if it's residential in that 100 foot area, and then you can go up to 62 feet once you get to 250 feet. The only other thing I'll add is that if there were to be commercial place there, you can go to, I believe the number is 56 feet. Now again, I'm not saying it's the same as eight stories. What I am saying, however, is that the current code regulations allow for some level of intense residential development or commercial development in what these people's backyards are. And that's sort of a common theme you see in, as I said, commercial areas that back up to residential. It's a, it's a very uh, common development scheme. Now, I'm not saying they should be excited about it. I understand their concerns. But this is something that homeowners, purchases are aware of when they're making their purchasing decision. When you buy behind a shopping center, there should be some um, level of caveat emptor, buyer beware, that this is an area that has commercial activity. And so what your code currently permits I can say with a pretty high level of confidence, is generally consistent with what the code permitted for decades, which is some pretty con intense level of activity in these shopping center areas. And so while there may be larger concern with eight stories, denying this, that special exception right, relative to, to those neighbors will not block pretty intense development along the entire north side of this property. Uh, jumping ahead, this is sort of an important matter. My, my client's been a, a member of this community for many years. And so I just want to respond to the, to the greed element here. So all of the homes in this community, I, I grew up in Coral Springs. My grandfather worked for one of the developers that built all these homes. Everywhere we live was by a developer that had a profit motive, right? Homes are generally not built at scale for charitable uh, nonprofit purposes. And so my client is not pursuing the greedy approach here. In fact, in point of fact, this site could accommodate much more intense development. This site could accommodate hundreds more units. In fact, the downtown activity center permits as of right 1.2 million square feet of commercial development. And so the site plan you saw tonight that we talked about in detail is something that they spent an exhaustive amount of time on that they want to be their legacy for the city, that they want to make the downtown what many stakeholders outside of this little area, many stakeholders in the community want to see here, which is a highly walkable, active, uh, restaurant-focused, fun, inviting area. This is not about pure profit motive or greed. Rather, the residential units that were added and some of the development uh, configurations you see were to make the project work, to make it be something that will pencil. It is not about pure greed, and so I wanted to respond to that because that's when it sort of gets personal, and I, and I think it's unfair uh, to, to categorize it in those terms. Access, I think, is the clearly the most biggest concern relative to the neighbors that are not affected parties, the neighbors that got up during public comment. What I want to share uh, for the record is that we have to replat the property as part of this project. Any new development of this project will have to replat. We didn't show the access driveway on university. We showed, we proposed eliminating it because our engineering staff tells us most likely the county won't let us keep that driveway. So typically you'll see driveways all the time. We, we, we heard from the community that, why can't they keep it? It's there now. There are countless driveways you see in Coral Springs and everywhere that could never be built again. When you see a, a, a gas station that has two driveways on either side of the pumps, never be allowed in, 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 in today's development review. So. We didn't want to show it because if we showed it and then the platting process, which we have to go through the county, that has nothing to do with the city. If the county said no, well, that the community would be screaming bloody murder. How, how could you do this? So we thought the safer approach was to not show it. 
That being said, if the county allows for that access, which we're gonna have to plot, we will keep the university drive driveway open. We understand that concern and would love to accommodate that. The only thing I wanna share, because there is a give and take here, is that if the university drive access is maintained, it makes it much more likely that you get a light on uh, Broken Woods. Because the light only happens there if there's a significant enough traffic element, if there's enough trips using that on a daily basis when we do the traffic warrant study that we're happy to pay for. Having said that, I think the smarter approach from a planning perspective is to keep the university drive access open. That'll of course redirect most of the traffic to there. Most people coming southbound on, on university won't necessarily know to use the Broken Woods. They'll see the signage for the Whole Foods if this is approved and come in through University Drive. Uh, now, with the, with the Broken Woods access, there's a lot of major, major concern. As my client said, I just want to reiterate, we're, we're happy to provide and pay for traffic calming measures that the city will allow us to do. We're happy to install a gate if the Broken Woods community wants to create an HOA. We're happy to pay for that. But we can't do that, as the city commission likely knows, unless an HOA exists there because it's a public road. Uh, other traffic calming measures, happy to pay for as part of this project. As, as we said during our presentation, we're happy to make it a, a right out only. We're happy to inst pay for and install uh, no through trucks there. And so there's an open mindedness on our part to working with you on that because we understand your concerns in that regard, but it's not so simple as uh, just shutting that off. It's an existing driveway access. And I think I've covered most of it. Um, most of what we, we wanted to rebut to some of the comments that, that were made. Uh, with that being said, we have to answer any questions. Great. I'm going to start with you, if it's okay, Commissioner Carter. You want me to go <laughs> elsewhere? Okay. Is anybody ready for a couple of questions, even if I come back to you? Are you ready, Nancy? Okay. Commissioner Mateo Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, George. <laughs> so my question goes for the po pocket park. Is this a public park? Is it for public use? Yes, Commissioner. Okay, so if it's for public use, um, have you had conversations with our city on who's going to manage and do maintenance and upkeep? No. I've not had that discussion yet. It sort of would, would be preliminary to talk about that, but give me one second. I, 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 think, I, I think that it's safe to say that we would take responsibility for that as opposed to assuming the city would, it would be a maintenance obligation to the city. It would be something that my client or the you know successors and assigns would be responsible for maintaining. Okay, Mr. Mayor, am I going through all my comments? Or you you can it's yeah you, it's <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it is, it is late my so to be let me uh, be open uh, with you all and with you all so it being eleven twelve and us potentially being a little tired if not more. Uh, you know, the question in my mind rings, if we are going through true deliberation, mm -hmm. our deliberation is going to be at least an hour, right. I imagine. So my open question to you all is, you know, do you want to just push through? Do you need a break? Do we somehow resume this another day? Um, you know, so I'm open-minded to your thoughts. I Mr. prefer Simmons. Mr. Mayor. Uh, because of the importance of this project. This is a historic project. And since it will be our birthday in about 45 minutes, um, this is what we got elected to do, man. Yeah, we agree. You're here. So we need to push through. All right. Uh, deliberate, do what we got to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see our families tomorrow. <laughs> got you. Okay. I agree All right, so through. that's our position. We're here, and we're deliberating, and uh, we're going to ask all the questions we have. And if you only have three now and you want to ask more later, fine. Uh, I'd rather focus now still, though, Nancy and team, on our questions as opposed to our comments. Questions for the petitioner. At this point, yes. For the petitioner. Okay, yeah. thank you for the clarification. Um, my other question for you is, you, are you not considering um, the closure of Broken Woods? I understand Whole Foods has said they will not move forward with it. Is there something that you would, basically, if we decide that we want this closure on Broken Woods, what do, where does that leave the development? 
Sure. So okay. if if the um, if the approval is conditioned on the closure of Broken Woods, it would likely lead to us not moving forward with the iteration of the plan we presented. It would require revisions, modification of the current mix of, of uses. Okay. My next question is around the pool on um, Garage B. Is that open to everyone? No, Commissioner. So it's only it's only to for the individuals who live in this complex. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, so my my next question is: Can you please walk through why you want the eight feet opposed to the five feet? Uh, why you want this exemption from the eight to five feet? Start five stories. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Five stories. Sure. So uh, the as as we discussed in the in our presentation, um, Whole Foods as an anchor uh, ends up exacting a cost on the overall development, and so to make the rest of it work and be a uh, profitable endeavor for our client, not a money losing endeavor, there needs to be a certain number of residential units, because full disclosure, there's a value associated with those residential units, and so we got to the number that we landed on with the residential units. Um, running the math of how this would all work. And so once we identified that number that we needed, we needed to find the places for those units. And um, we thought that positioning the buildings and having a bunch of different buildings was a thoughtful design. And then the last thing I'll add, which I should have said in my rebuttal, but I'm happy for you, that your question reminded me of it, is that the parking garage where it's sited was a thoughtful decision. The thought process was that would be the least active use in the project. There, were, there wouldn't be people hanging out in the garage looking in people's backyards. And so while some may disagree, our, our, our thought process was put that element to closer to the residents because it would have the least impact on them. But in, to answer your question briefly, eight stories are needed to accommodate the number of units we need to build to make this project work. Next question, can a 14 foot wall be incorporated into this design as a buffer? So we're, we're happy, as I said in my presentation, we're happy to install um, heightened landscaping. We're happy to install a wall. The concern with installing the wall on the south side of the existing canal is that that's a maintenance obligation of my client. Mm. And so it's a challenge to create, put a wall up when there's access needed to, um, to that canal for maintenance purposes. But we're open to installing some sort of wall. I don't know, as I stand here, if, if the, your code permits 14 foot walls but we're open to features like that being added. I'll be more than happy to repeat this question for city staff when they come up. I have a, um, a list of questions for them. For loading and unloading, will there be a time um, that they aren't allowed to unload and load? It's a great question. So there's uh, no loading and unloading between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., correct? So in the middle of the night? No, that's not, it's not permitted, permitted during that time. Okay, so only during daylight hours. Okay. And that's all for me, Mr. Mayor. Okay, is somebody ready next? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Matero. I've got two of mine. So I just had a clarification question. Um, the pool was moved forward closer to sample. Is that correct on garage? Yes, Commissioner. It was it was moved south, right? Okay. And um, in for clarification, you said that you per code you could build a lot more units on this. Correct. Hundreds more. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Very good, Commissioner Simmons. You know, I was looking at everything that I wrote down, um, and it's more comments than it is questions, so I'm good. Okay. Vice Mayor. I just sift through all my notes here. <laughs> um, speaker two brought up uh, the opportunity for accessible living conditions. Can any of that be considered? Well, uh, you know, cer certainly it goes without saying that current building codes and ADA requirements will have to comply with. I don't know that in our current plans we've contemplated anything for that. Um, Uh, 
I, I, so as I said, there's, there's the Fair Housing Act, right? There's ADA requirements. There's the, sorry. Right, I mean, yes, there's no denying the speakers how compelling his comments were. My client would be happy to meet with him. In full disclosure, I don't know that we fully understand what that means as I stand here in a way that I could commit. But if there's a condition, so frequently what your city does, which I think is smart, is make conditions that compel us to work with some work with your staff or others on things. I think it's a thoughtful thing that we'd be happy to, to, to work with them on. I mean, there's how can you not <laughs> hearing what he had to say? I just don't know fully understand know what it specifically he'd like to see. Okay. Um, speaker seven brought up that there were three entrances. Um, you have one on Broken Woods, you got one on Sample, and one potentially on, on Coral Hills Drive. Um, you know, the University Drive, um, what I'm hearing is that you guys are amenable to that, uh, with the idea of working with the Broken Woods community with the right turn only out and the Coral Hills community with the left turn out, correct, of the opposite side. Yes, Vice Mayor. Okay. And I apologize, I'm gonna go as fast as I can, but I had uh, hopes that we could ask questions on both sides at the same time. Um, well, it might be easier to just go this way. And we can ask questions later as well. Understood, I appreciate that. Let me get my main notes. As the vice mayor is looking, you know, when I decided to run for city commission years ago, and I served initially in 2002, uh, one of my commitments was to help educate people about government. And uh, a lot of you may even be here at a city commission meeting for the first time. So I can tell you, while I've had a lot of practice on the dais, I am far from perfect. Uh, we are far from perfect as a commission. Um, and we're all kind of learning a little bit this evening since I got back on the dais as the mayor in March of 19. This is really what I recall as our first controversial uh, project uh, that is, you know, um, uh, very impactful one way or the other and is causing us to have this quasi-judicial hearing. So the five of us actually act as judges. So to see us, you know, kind of, well, we got some notes here, we have some notes here, uh, bear with us, you know, give us grace as well. Uh, my notes are in seven different places, and I'm an attorney. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're going we're gonna to give each other grace, and we're going to get to ask all of our questions, and we'll deliberate as we need. Back to you, Vice Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Um, with regards to the eight floors compared to the five, which was in the original plan, um, what exactly would be the end result if we went from the eight floors to the five. I know that in George's presentation, he was talking about shifting some things around building, uh, if I understood it correctly, apartment A and um, garage B with building seven. Um, what would that be with regards to a reduction in, in rental opportunity? Sure, so uh, likely would require losing roughly 50 to 80 units okay. is, is the general is the we we took a look at that to see sorry yeah go ahead you go ahead the consequence of reducing within the 250 feet from eight to five is that we would have to try to make it up somewhere else um, it was suggested earlier maybe we could take the Sample Road, um, the two buildings on Sample Road from eight stories to 10 stories and make up for some of the def deficiency. The problem with that, and I hear it's a problem, is we, you would have to, it, it would impact the construction cost of those two buildings. Once you go beyond eight stories, your construction costs 
you may as well go up to 15 or 16 stories, up to 20 stories. When you go beyond 20 stories, there's another jump in construction cost. So there are thresholds, and that's why most, the other buildings that you're around that are being built are eight stories and not nine or 10. And by the way, our site allows us to go to 10 floors. By right, we can, it's been zoned for 10 floors. But, but to go to 10 floors would mean an additional and cost in construction of, of those two buildings. So that leaves us with finding other solutions. The courtyard where we have the little restaurant and the outdoor seating and that, that will have to disappear because we'll have to convert that entire section into all residential, turning the ground floor, ground floor retail to residential. So it'll become a residential building with no retail. We would also have to look at eliminating some of the retail on the um, on the on the ground floors on the eastern portion to make up for the um, for the loss of having to come down from eight stories to five stories. Whether or not we'll we'll be able to get back to the number of units is something that we haven't. Um, but that to, to, that's to me that spoils the plan. Ed talked about having walkability so it can connect to the other side of Coral Hills Drive. Our plan bears that in mind. Our plan is exactly designed to do that. Our plan is so that the other side of Coral Hills Drive, those other merchants are connected. That's one of the reasons why we have retail under the garage on the on the Western half of the property where the residential are. And we have the, res the little, uh, at the corners of the uh, residential building on Sample Road. So we've actually added little retail um, components so that you're not walking past 400 units, as someone earlier said, to get to the other side of Coral Hill Drive. There will be retail activity. Feeling, having to drop, having to recapture that and put apartments in is, you know, it's, 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 it's going to impact that feel of having the open public space, the retail, and, the, and it, it, spo it, it, it will spoil the project. I, I, I can't be a, a more straightforward than that. And, you know. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, as far as the um, negotiations with Whole Foods, a potential grocer that could go into this space. When did you guys start that? When, when did we? Yeah, could when you? did you guys start talking to them? We, we started talking to them late last year. Okay. Um, um, staff, with regards to, and this will be a question, I guess I'll ask for follow-up, but uh, and a follow-up question with you, but um, it, it's my understanding that the city staff just got involved in conversations with them. Is that? Yes, um, at the request, we, we, we ended up having a conversation with city staff, had a conversation with the Whole Foods, the, the president or the person in charge of Whole Foods in the Southeast United States. We, we got hold of him, he was in a car with his brokers touring, and we arranged for a communication between city staff and them, and they, they spoke for about 15 minutes. Okay, um, staff, I'm gonna be coming back on that um, in preparation for it. Um, did you by chance develop the property down off of 17th Street that had uh, Whole Foods on it? No. No, just the... Um, you mentioned it. It was a different grocer, right? We we actually we, we we did a road trip with staff about four years ago, I think, a few years ago, when we were contemplating what to do with um, the downtown. Um, and with the market. members of staff, we went down to Fort Lauderdale Federal Highway. We stopped off at at um, Whole Foods because um, there was talk about Whole Foods even then, um, and we looked at. And that one, the one on 17th Street, although it's it, it's self-contained, there's no surface parking because there was no land for it, but there's not, no other activity. It's strictly Whole Foods and parking. 
So it doesn't excite, it doesn't generate any energy, it doesn't do anything for, for any of the neighboring businesses. The businesses across the street are not benefiting from having a Whole Foods there because of the way it was done. Um, Fresh Market, on the other hand, uh, north of Broad Boulevard on Federal Highway, is similar to what we're proposing here with the trellises and all that stuff. City of Fort Lauderdale did, wanted us also to come hard up on the street and what we did with Fresh Market was a compromise. But look what happened after that. It, it stimulated the activity that happened um, in Flagler with all these high rises, all the apartments started. There were only two apartment buildings in Flagler when Fresh, Fresh Market was built. The, the all along Federal Highway is now, it, uh, it's wall to wall development along Federal Highway. Fresh Market was the was one of the impetus that created that energy and that uh, de development. So yes, if uh, you look at fresh, you look at Federal Highway now, all the buildings are hard up on the street except for Fresh Market. But the the Whole Foods on Seventeenth Street is kind of on the the roadside now. Yeah, it's 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 it covers the entire block. There is no surface park. But you're saying it's the reason why they did that was because it, there wasn't it, anything really. They had nothing it. left. That they couldn't do anything else. Right. I, I once a month I go down to my South Miami. There's a Whole Foods that on the ground floor of South Miami where I go. My, the upper floors are medical offices, and I go to get check my eyes once a month. I I end up. You have to when you get into this. There's no surface parking. Whole Foods takes up the entire block in South Miami, and um, to get to get to Whole Foods, when you drive up, you have to go onto the second floor, but that's all there is. No other retailer above that is only offices, so th there is no benefit from having a Whole Foods to s stimulate the energy of the surrounding areas. So I'd like to get your opinion um, because you're a long time resident and you've developed a lot of property in our city. Um, and you've had uh, a lot of success, obviously, but also, you know, you brought a lot of good businesses into our city. So the corner that you now own is not going to have property potentially on the university side, on running, where the parking lot is there, Whole Foods is set back, right? Right. But the other two corners look completely different. Yeah. So from an aesthetic standpoint and the original vision of downtown, um, and then also, like, I know that Whole Foods is quite the catch potentially, but is that more the recommendation or is that the way, you know, you think it should be done? We pleaded with Whole Foods for an entire year knowing that the city wanted the buildings hard up on the street, knowing that the code required it. And, and knowing how members of staff felt, we pleaded with Whole Foods numerous times. Let us make, a, you know, let's figure it out. Let's bring you to the corner. But we'll give you some surface, but let's get your building at least up to the street so we can at least satisfy a part of the code. To the extent that the, the, the medical building that was occupied, that yeah. was 20,000 square feet, two floors, 40,000 square feet, we had to get rid of that for them. The, we also, the, the, at the 11th hour, they had us pull back building number three. But if you notice, you have 169, 165 foot setback, and then 189, that quite frankly didn't make sense. But they... But I guess just kind of circling back, because I know that... Um I believe we all met with you. Um, if the Whole Foods was aligned to university in parallel, that project still could be a good one, but the Whole Foods is just not cooperating. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, you, we, we would still need to orient it in a way that, they, that the rest of the project could benefit from it. It just, they can't be ice. No, they can't be isolated. Ed had a suggestion that we should move Whole Foods further in, more to the center of the site, to energize the rest of Sample Road and move the the, um, the the residential onto University Drive. That was one of Ed's suggestions earlier today. He had mentioned it to me a few days ago. The problem with that is 
Whole Foods wants to be on University Drive. Almost all commercial activity wants University Drive. So to take a resident, to take a residential building and put it on University Drive, is is counter to what is is what they would do. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Um, with regards to the twenty nine exceptions, in the presentation, you guys had made some recommendations of taking parts or some of the buildings from eight to five. Yes. Um, I don't, it's my understanding, I could be wrong, that that has not been vetted, approved, or reviewed no, by we, staff, correct? I just want yeah, to make that sure. Was only a f that we, 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 we came up to, with that only a few days ago. Uh, there's within the 100 foot, with, within 100 feet, you're allowed to build four stories by code. The setback is 25 feet, I think, and we're actually at 36 feet. So we're a little further off from what the code requires, but we're still pretty close to the, to the boundary. The, the misconception is that you, that, uh, that have been, I, I, that we've been hearing is that they, we have to step back 100 feet before we can build a four-story building, and that's not accurate. All we have to do is to step back four feet 25 feet to build a four-story building, but it has to be within 100 feet. So step back 25, and the other 75 feet, you could build four floors. Then you go on to the, you go on to the other 150 feet. That is your, the first 100 feet, it's four floors. The second 150 feet, you go up to five floors. That takes us almost to the edge of Sample Road. All that, after that, all we have are the sliver of buildings hard up on sample road that we've shown on the plan. That's all that's left. You can't, so. <coughs> the eight-story buildings could only go hard on the street. It can, really, if it goes anywhere else, it violates the code. Okay. So I'll come back on this, but if possible, if you guys could identify out of the 29 exceptions where you're proposing to make changes uh, based on your presentation tonight, and then I'm going to ask legal, I mean, um, if they're proposing to make changes, can we even vote on that exception tonight, or are we voting as is? It depends on uh, whether we're able to understand that change fully tonight on the run. Okay. So. Yeah, and that, and I'm going to interrupt for a moment because uh, Vice Mayor, you've really asked a very, very intelligent and insightful and discerning question um, because we up here. We definitely want our staff to have enough time to review something that is relatively new to make their recommendation. We don't rubber stamp anything from staff. Uh, and of course, we don't just say no to what staff says. Uh, we brief with them. You know, probably each of us brief with staff about this at least two hours a piece, maybe more. Uh, maybe some of us, you know, four or five. Uh, and a lot of thought and homework is going into this. So, um, you know, I, I w my question would be specifically in regards to the 14 no's out of the 29 special exceptions sought, uh, if you can identify maybe later on, or unless you know it now, uh, which of these now you have a new proposal for, and as you're sharing it, maybe identify the number. When it's my turn, I was going to ask you to put back on the screen what you hadn't shared uh, you know, ver visually with our staff before, and then maybe have that tie us into which of these 14 uh, recommendations of no, you're saying, well, let's try to work something out. Sure. OK. Do that. that makes sense to you, Sean? Yes. I mean, I think I can help. <clears throat> it certainly makes sense what you're saying in all ways. None of the things we're proposing eliminate any of the special exceptions that staff are recommending denial on. Gotcha. Rather, Perfect. they are things that we got together and said, what can we do to help minimize the perceived or real impacts or concerns from the neighbors? So my thought process, because the city attorney's right, that it's a question of whether you're able to digest the changes we're making, and then assuming you vote to approve, add them as conditions in an identifiable and enforceable way. 
And so our thought process is what we're proposing is some of them will have to be work with staff on traffic calming measures, as an example. So perhaps if the consensus or thought process is that we're leading in a direction that the items we're proposing um, help us get your support, then we would pull that up, that slide, and discuss it there in a way where how do we um, put that down on paper as a condition. Gotcha. Thank you. Anything else of the petitioner at this time? Vice yeah, it was um, one of the impacted parties had mentioned that there's, you know, made a comment, there's no holding back this development um, and that we have codes to protect, you know, 29 exceptions being brought. And I know we had talked, I mean, 29 exceptions is quite a bit for one property, but I know that we need to make decisions and, and figure things out. Um, I guess my question back to the petitioner is, how many of these 29 exceptions can you get in to play with, with um, a lot of due diligence to make sure that we're, out of the 29, how many can we get code compliant by adjusting this project? Well, the first thing I would wanna say, I'll, I'll let you, is that, um, so the other two projects in that have come forward so far in the city's new downtown mixed use zoning, both had special exceptions, right? The other thing I'll say is that it's very common in my experience at least with new form based codes. This is a new code in the span of history, in the span of the history of the city, right? It's maybe five years, five years old maybe. You should expect that people, the first applicants coming in are gonna say, hey look, we know some consultant you paid thought this was a great idea, this totally doesn't work for this part of the city and we need to figure out a way around it. And so it is zero surprise to me that the other two projects that came in were seeking relief by a special exception and it's something you see in other cities as well. Having said that, George can speak to which we can eliminate, I guess is your question. Well, um, yeah, let me just state, uh, I mean, I'm not expecting, you know, 29 of them, but. Let, let me give you a couple of examples of, we could eliminate one or two special exceptions very easily. I choose not to because I didn't think it made sense. I didn't think it, it violated the intent of the code, but it, it, I could very easily have eliminated those two by, by following the letter of the code and not the intent. The two examples are actually maybe more than two codes. One is that one building on Sample Road that has the indentations that's opposite City Hall, directly opposite City Hall, that is two feet, the, the indentations is two feet more than it should be. So if we bring that building closer by two feet, we'll have to bring the entire building closer or lose the indentation, narrowing the landscaping and all the sidewalk on the sample road side. Yes, we could do it. But does it make sense? And the answer is no. But if all we're doing here is just following the code, please the code, eliminate as many special exceptions as we can, yes, we could do it. That's easily done, but what do you end up with? You compromise here on quality, on, some, on something that is quality driven, just to satisfy a code or not, uh, um, not, not having to ask for a special exception on a code. The other example is Coral Hills Drive, right? We have two buildings on Coral Hills Drive. The, one of them is five feet further away from the curb the, than the code allows. The code tells you you need to be between five feet and 15 feet. So that means we could bring those buildings up as, as close as five feet to Coral Hill Drive. The maximum we are allowed to do is pull it back by four, 15 or whatever feet. We have 17 feet or 20 feet. Those five feet is, is really, we, very easily we could shift the buildings up and, and, and fill in those five feet and we no longer have a special exception. We, we lose the special exception for building C being set back from Coral Hills Drive. We lose the exception for building D. That's three exceptions just like that. I, we could do it with, with a blink of an eye. But the quality of the project, the entrance into Coral Hills Drive gets impacted, the landscaping. I would rather drive into Coral, if I'm living in, in Coral, uh, 
If I'm living in clusters and in Coral Hills, I would rather drive when I'm entering my neighborhood that I don't have a building right as right up on my face when I'm driving by, that it's set back a little bit, that there's some landscaping between the driveway and the building. That makes sense. And that's why that's why I'm here. I I was accused by my by my team of being too stubborn. And yes, I am stubborn. When it comes when it comes to quality, I am stubborn. I, I, if I would, get, I'm, if something is reasonable, if there is a reasonable solution, trust me, I do, I will not sleep. I, I I wake night trying to find that solution. If it's a reasonable um, ask, but pulling the buildings closer to Coral Hill Drive is not reasonable. I don't care what the code says; it's not reasonable, and that's why I the code is not to be followed slavishly. The code is there to guide us, to give us some di direction, but we, don't, we, we, we should be living by the intent of the code rather than the letter of the code. The code should never trump common sense. There are some legitimate issues that were raised here, privacy, um, how, 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 how People would be looking down, and one gentleman, Mark, I think, um, showed, shared a, a photograph where he stood up 28 feet or 26 feet from corals, um, from Corners. corners from the cornerstone eight-story building. Well, there will be no eight-story building 28 feet away from his from his boundary, because the first hundred feet we're talking about four stories. It's the other 150 feet, the up to 250, that the eight stories go up. That's what, so we need to have some clarity as to where are the eight stories and where is the four stories. So the four stories are, is the ones closest that's allowable by code today. One of the things that was missing in this photograph, and I, and I get it, but if he stood up in his backyard and he took that photograph, you know, the, the, what was missing in that photograph at Cornerstone were the trees that, that now is lining his boundary. It's impossible to stand up 25 feet or 26 feet uh, and take a photograph and see those buildings. You'll have to go above the trees to do that. If you step back, you may see it. And that's when we did the, the study with, with, with Ed, with the drone, we stepped back, we stepped back on, uh, into the cul-de-sac to see what impact those eight stories will have and that's the exercise you do to the head. And to find the drone, we had to walk out to Coral Hills Drive from the cul-de-sac to see the, the, where the eight stories were going to be. So, you know, we, when, we, when we, I, I, I am a problem solver. I, 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 I like to think of myself as a problem solver. So there isn't anything I don't think can be solved. When we went and visited the broken, Hills, uh, Broken Woods community. They have, they have an issue. They, they, this is a genuine concern. The kids playing on the street is a genuine concern, and the protection of those kids is real. That, that I, I understand that. I feel it. I know it. We talked about clo closing off the street. We spoke with staff. How could we close off? How could we put a gate? How could we secure this neighborhood? I was told that the city would gladly hand over the street to the neighborhood if they would form a HOA. The neighborhood, and then there's a private street, they could do whatever they want with it. We could put gates, we could close it off, have one entrance, do whatever they wanted to do with it. But as long as it's a public road, the city's hands are tied. That was my understanding when we met with staff. You meet with the, the citizens, and well, we don't want a HOA. We, 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 we could never get a HOA here because some of the residents are totally opposed to a HOA. Okay, so here we have a, a problem. How do we solve it? We started looking at solutions. Maybe we could put the entry features. We could do signs, traffic calming, so that any, any unintended vehicle that comes up there will know you, hey, wake up, you're, you're in a row. There are things that we, and that's what we, we, I promise that we would explore, that we would do. But this can all go away if the city would allow a gate to go up or if they would take possession of the street. Neither one can happen, so we, 
I haven't given up. I still think we should find a solution. No left turn into the, in, into the, um, into the community um, makes a lot of sense. That's a given. I do, I do, we don't even have to think about that. The answer is yes, we could do that. So where, wherever the, there was another request tonight that there should be no left turn off of Coral Hills Drive into the, into the, um, into the shop, into the um, property. Maybe, I, but that is not as simple as, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem, that's a no-brainer. My response to the young lady today was, we should really consult with traffic, the traffic people who knows more about this. I instinctively don't think it'll be a problem, but you know, there are unintended consequences when you do something that you haven't thought through, and I am not an expert on traffic, we'll need to, to consult with that. And do, that's the approach we've taken with this project. Sorry, um, I, didn't meant, I didn't mean to ramble, didn't mean to ramble on, but uh, any Anything other questions? Else, Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'm good. So, um, so I think you, George, may have just answered the question um, that wasn't asked uh, directly, but I'm gonna ask it directly. So we've heard from many, many residents, uh, especially in Broken Woods, about safety for their families and safety for the children. Am I understanding you correctly that if they had an HOA, they'd be safe? If they had an HOA, the road becomes a private road. The city has, no, the city has indicated that if there was an HOA, they could hand over the, the road to the HOA. The HOA takes charge of the road, and then the HOA could put up the gates, do a cul-de-sac, do whatever they want. So that I'll get clarity from the city when the city comes back. And then um, my second question is, you can't, no, I'm sorry. So, no, you can't, you, you can't. No, now you're out of here. Take care. Take care, please, please, please. That's not, that's not nice. I thank the rest of you. So Mr. Rahal, what I'm asking you next is, in regards to, I'm gonna be frank. So I was here 21 years ago. Um, and what I had thought the vision was for downtown is not how things are evolving. Correct. And of course, I think, you know, we're we're a pretty agile community, very agile staff. I think our city manager is second to none. Um, I think what you did uh, at the walk uh, is wonderful. What you did for the uh, southeast corner uh, was great, and then you know some timing fell off. So you know I'm kind of prefacing my question with me feeling that where we are, I'm not finding a solution readily. And I am also extraordinarily solution oriented. Um, and for me, especially with the safety concerns, you know, you and I both have five children. We've got grandchildren. Correct. We love our kids. Absolutely. We want their kids to be safe. Definitely. So, got to be paramount. That's a given. <laughs> so, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm asking a rhetorical question. My question, really it's for all of us, is how do we get there? How do we have them be safe and potentially have this wonderful downtown project complete a different vision? than what we had 20 years ago. That's rhetorical, no answer yet. But what I would like you to share is, and maybe you'll have to bring up some of the screens, I'm still not seeing how this is really meeting the pedestrian friendly, walkable area. I'm, I don't see that vision with what's been shared with us yet. Right. Originally, the pedestrian friendly um, or the pedestrian street was supposed to be on the other side of the road where 
the, the first plan, said. Yes, the first plan Giselle showed you, and I don't know if we could bring it up, the first plan that was showed you that was done in 1999 incorporated all four corners. It, it reflected part of the, um, the western part of the CRA. It was a comprehensive shot at that, that's it there. It incorporated the post office, it incorporated the Bank of America building, it, the gas station on Coral Hills Drive, it was the entire block. If you look at that, there's an entire block. And the pedestrian friendly was an internal street that w would have generated all the, uh, all the energy was, was centered in there. A lot more commercial and a lot less residential. Yes, there was residential, but not as much. City Hall was actually on where we're now proposing City Village to be. City Hall was going to be, if you look at the plan, the, 21 years ago we contemplated putting City Hall next to sit where old City Hall was and line it up with the, court, with the center court. If you look closely to it, you can see office buildings, retail, um, residential, the, all the components was into that plan. We spent years trying to get the post office to, to release it. We actually acquired the Bank of America building. Unfortunately, it had a, a six-day lease encumbering, and we couldn't get Bank mm -hmm. of America to relinquish the lease. And we ended up losing it in the Great Recession. But we, at one time, owned the bank. With, with the intent was to assemble that entire block so as to put together that plan, which was a pedestrian-oriented plan. Well, that ship has sailed. What we have today is uh, essentially uh, residential-centric development on the other two corners. What we have left is the last man standing. City Village is the last man standing to create what we had originally contemplated, which would have more commercial, less residential. That's what this plan is. We have a main drive. We have. Uh, the reason we populated the bottom of the garage, garage B with, with, with retail, was so to encourage people to walk. Uh, if, you, if you just have a garage and nothing else in it, why would anybody walk by it? Put, put, the retail, put the retail on the ground floor of that garage and all of a sudden you have activity. There's a reason for people to walk. You encourage walkability by giving them a reason to walk. People don't walk just for the sake of walking. They walk to, to go from one place to the next. And that's what we try to do in the connection, in doing the connecting. And that's why I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I feel pretty good about this plan in that Ed doesn't think it, uh, it does the connecting, but it, as much as we could, connect it to the other side of Coral Hills Drive. We, look, I'm big on connecting stuff. We spoke with, with, city, with, with the city staff as well about how do we how do we how do we um, connect the south side from the north side where city hall is? How do we connect these two blocks? We talked about putting a crosswalk, which is why the entrance that we have the the entrance is, that is lined up there that main entrance with the roundabout lines up with your entrance off a of sample road. We talked about how do we connect it. We talked about putting overhead bridges, which doesn't really work. We talked about crosswalks. We talked about installing lights. We've been having this discussion now for a long time. So this plan isn't something that we just whip together to say, well, let's figure out how to make the most money out of this. If this was all about making money, <laughs> we would have, a, excuse the expression, a hell of a lot more residential units and a lot less commercial. That's not the vision. That's not what we wanted to do. That's not what the intent was. And I, I have 25 years invested in this downtown, 25 years of emotion in trying to make this happen and trying to make it the way it should be done. And I understand the impact it will have on residents. I, I get it. And whatever we could do to try to mitigate it, to try to minimize it, we have to. But I don't know that you could make the problem go away because if we don't do a project that is in keeping with what we're proposing, 
what you'll end up with is a project that is going to be similar to what you have across the street with 800 residential units, 60,000 60, square feet of retail, and I have news for you. It would not require a single special exception, not one. That could be done now on that site, and it will make a hell of a lot more money than this project would. And not one single special exception would be required. No conditional use, nothing. So, you know, I've listened, I've listened, I've read about the greedy developer, but they have, they, they have no idea what a greedy developer is, if they're calling us greedy developers. This downtown came about in the 90s, that's in the last century. We, my daughter and myself put together on our mother's 50th birthday, we were at, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and she, she had just come out of school, she had just joined the business, and she had put together the package that we were submitting to the city. We had a deadline to meet to respond to the RFP re concerning the downtown. What, what, what was then referred to, not as downtown, but as, a, as the town center project. When Ed, when I read Ed's, Ed note about that, that plan, we went back into, and that's how we came up with this picture today, to show we took a, a one, sh one picture of it to, sh to show you that it was 1999 that this was submitted. So I have a lot of emotions invested in this project, not because I need to make more money. I don't need to make more money, but it would be, it would be good to have something that we can be proud of, something that works, something that the entire city can be proud of. You know, they call me Mr. Fountains. I've been pushing to have the four fountains. I have a picture of the four fountains that was done 20 years ago. It's still on my office. <laughs> and it, uh, anybody walks in the office, they'll see the four fountains. I haven't given up on it because I think it would, it would just give me Give us an ident this, give this downtown, give Coral Springs an identifying feature, something that people can see and say, oh, that's Coral Springs. That, that's the kind of stuff that motivates me. That's the kind of stuff that drives me. I pleaded with Frank to get, to try to get some space. Make, if we can't build it today, but at least have the space ready so that when we can afford to build the fountains, we're going to be able to do it. When we did chart a place in the early 20, 2005, 2005, if you look at the front of charter place, there is an oval shaped lawn with a, with a, a, with a, a, a pretzel, a, a stainless steel pretzel on it, a public art. But that, 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 that oval shape was designed and measured to fit those fountains. And I recall, I recall. Uh, and if you look at our plan, you'll see a similar one, and we're hoping that we could get the same thing on the other two corners, so we'll have back our four fountains. Well, George, I had four more questions, <coughs> but since you give 12 minutes an answer, I'm complete. <laughs> that is to avoid the questions. <laughs> Go ahead, Commissioner Mateo Bowen. George, if someone from your team can respond to this, um, can you explain to us why um, you're doing this project in phases. From my understanding, it was originally presented to us as happening in one phase. The way we submitted the plan was one phase, um, but based on the timeline of what's required, it will need to be done in two phases at least. So we would need to resubmit and resubmit our phasing, but we, we wanted to be upfront when we talked about the conditions of the project. We don't want you to think when we come back later, oh, we're changing our mind. We know now that it definitely does need to be done in multiple phases. Part, par partially because of the timeline for Whole Foods and what's required, their lease is expiring down the street. They need to be in by a certain time. Our lease, um, should this project get approved and should we sign the lease, we have times and deadlines by which we have to get the project done, and it will be a different timeline than a residential developer who would be doing the more western portion of the parcel. 
So uh, I'm just going to ask if it's okay to uh, take a five-minute recess. I know I have to use the facilities, and I want to wish Joy and Josh happy birthday. It's now your birthday. You okay with a five-minute break? All right. We will see you back at 12.10. 12.10. We're on recess.
going to resume as everybody settles back in. And as everybody's settling back in, uh, which one of my teammates up here would like to present their questions to city staff first? All right, Commissioner Mateo Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my first question for city staff is, um, do, I'm sorry, just for clarification, does staff do our closing uh, yeah, comments can, first or go and go into questions? Yeah, I think staff wants to do their, their presentation. Oh, then go right ahead. Thank you do that first, then we'll give you our It's questions. been a while since we did this, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, that. No, perfect. I'm glad <laughs> and John explained it like, what, four or five hours ago? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's right, yesterday. I just wanted to, to touch on a few things holistically about the downtown and, and traffic and things like that before Tina comes in. There's a few things we just want to clarify for the record too, statements that have been made by the petitioner as well as the public and the affected parties that we just kind of want to clarify for you all. Um, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about the vision and, and for the downtown and how long it's been in place and things like that. I do want to clarify though, with the zoning that was put into place in 2018, that did not increase the number of units for the downtown. It didn't increase the intensities or anything like that. Those were all established when the local activity center and the DRI were approved. So those were approved at the state level, the county level, as well as here at the city. I wholeheartedly agree though, we would like to see those uses mixing better. And I think the applicant has done, probably I could arguably say the best out of all four corners so far in trying to get all those different types of uses, the retail and restaurants, the office, the, um, the residential even, and really creating a true mixed use within their own development as well. Having said that, I also think that there are, we have to think about the downtown holistically, even between each development. Yes, the, we are sticking to the code for the, to the letter for things such as the maximum. Don't forget, it's, we're exceeding the maximum. It's not that we're not meeting minimums for some of these. We have concerns with exceeding those maximums. Are they small amounts here and there? Do we understand the landscaping? Of course. But also shifting everything to the south would give two more feet to the residents to the north. Um, we have to think about what those streetscapes look like and how they start to work together. You know, City Hall, we have the landscaping out front here and the sidewalks out front here. And while City Hall was approved before the, the um, the zoning regs were adopted, we still tried to get the building as much as we could to know where that vision was going. Things like the Grand Lawn, mixing of uses in that way too, because things like the parks are additional uses that we want within the downtown. Um, when we talk about traffic, um, I will have a couple things we'll touch on. You, you know we have a number of conditions relating to the traffic, Coral Hills, Broken Woods, University. Um, I just, and Joaquin had a family emergency, so unfortunately he had to leave. Um, when the traffic studies are submitted to us for any project, they take into account all the, uh, you know, the nearby roadways. They are also cumulative in the fact that since Cornerstone is, has been approved already, since Northeast Corner has been approved already, when Amera did their traffic study, they included those projects in potential impacts to the roadways. So it's looking again, we, got, we wanna think holistically here, the whole 167 acres, while we're looking at the core right now, and that's the regs we have right now, we wanna think about the whole downtown itself. And we're gonna be working on regulations for the rest of sample here in the next year or so. When we came up with the regulations for the zoning, that was a three to four year process. It was one of the first things that I, I worked on when I started here. I remember telling Susie, I may not be the one to write it, but I'm gonna get it done because that's what we need to really see the zoning, the, the development start to happen in the downtown. We had numerous meetings with the neighborhoods nearby, with the developers. We gave them the code and said, pull it apart. Tell us what works, tell us what doesn't work because we want it to succeed for them as well because it doesn't do any good if it's a code that doesn't help them develop what we wanna see. I would caution a few things if we're going to be looking at conditions relating to closing entrances, adding entrances, whatever it might be, aside from the conditions that staff has already vetted with our traffic engineer. Um, we might wanna be careful about where that, the traffic has to go somewhere. So if we're closing, you know, ins are out in one place and closing it in another, then that's gonna shift impacts potentially to other places that the traffic study may not have accounted for yet. So I would um, just 
put a little bit of caution there that maybe if we do have some conditions relating to that, it's working with the city staff and we're working with our transportation engineer to address those in the proper manner and not just say, just close it and not, and not think about what those impacts might be. Um, I think that was everything I had, but uh, Tina, like I said, Tina's gonna walk through a few things that we just wanted to clarify for you all as well, and all three of us will be here for questions when we're done. Thank you, Julie. Happy birthday again, <laughs> and thank you for being here so late. Uh, so I, originally I was going to just kind of step us through their PowerPoint to see if there's anything that needed to be corrected, um, but I'm just going to flip through them and just um, call out the slide number if there's anything specific I want to point your eye to. But um, overall, as you know, and as the um, applicant has stated, there are items that were introduced tonight that either were um, given to us, um, you know, in a, in a meeting briefly that we didn't have the ability to review. So similar to the things that Julie said about, you know, making, um, adding additional conditions to the, to the special exception or conditional use request that we haven't really reviewed yet. We just hope that we would have the opportunity to review those items. So there were um, a few slides that spoke to the neighborhood concerns, and we certainly do want to address the neighborhood concerns. But you know, for, for, I'll give, a, give an example. Um, in terms of the wall, we want to make sure the wall would meet code requirements. And if it doesn't, you know, it would have to come back to you for a, another special exception. So just think, you know, just something to think about. Um, Yes. By the conditions? Give me one minute on that. Um, oh, actually, can I? Yep. Uh, that one, yes, please. And while Tina's gathering your thoughts on that, I, I forgot to touch on one other thing too. Um, relating to having an HOA versus not and being able to close Broken Woods Drive, I want to be very clear. It's not that the city isn't amenable to that or that you know we didn't even consider it, but when roadways are dedicated via plat, when the development first comes in, there are spe usually specific dedications. They're dedicated for use of the public. Um, you know, you might have specific dedications that are for, let's say, one of the water districts, things like that. So when something is dedicated to the use of the public in general as right-of-way, it's not as easy as us just vacating it and saying, you know, here, it's for you now, or even just putting arms across the roadway and limiting that access because it's supposed to be used in perpetual, perpetu perpetuity, it's getting late, or it is late, not getting late, um, by the public. So just know that we um, have had talks with the neighborhoods about that or, you know, some folks at the community meetings, and, and that's where that concern is coming in with staff is how those roads were dedicated and if we ha even have the ability to do something like that, even if they have an HOA. That's good clarity. We definitely needed that. So um, following one of the neighborhood meetings um, where it was suggested that we have bamboo, we, we followed up with Casey, um, our city arborist, to just you know kind of chat with her about what was being proposed. And I think the applicant reached out to her as well about that request. Um, she did state that um, the existing ficus along the north side, um, they're in poor condition, um, but she is recommending that they install live oak or gumbo limbo trees every 30 feet at a height 18 to 20 feet tall at the time of installation. And what she means by the tiered and substantial buffers, it's not 
Um, it's not only hedges, it could all, it also means trees at various heights and different types of material that could create a layered approach, if you will. It includes hedges, but it's not only hedges. So if you're looking at that condition and what that substantial and tiered buffer condition means, it's varied tree material, varied heights, and um, you know to really enhance it. And she even said, look, Tina, I, um, I helped do City Hall. So if you look um, along the west property line, um, you know, she's like, that's where we suggested those tiered buffers. So um, I just w I wanted to clarify that. Um, yes. So um, the height comparison diagram that was shown, again, this is not one of the items that we were able to um, review in depth, and sometimes you need to see elevations, floor plans, um, site plan to make sure you're matching up your heights with everything, right? Um, it, it, we have a definition for height, um, and our code does, our DTMU district does have maximum um, floor heights for each of the ground floors, and I kind of stepped you through that in the beginning. So um, it may say four stories or five stories, but we have a maximum ground floor height for commercial and residential, and then floors above that, and that's 12 feet. So just looking at the uh, height comparison diagram that was shown, I think they're what our maximum height allowances that are on the diagram, just that first, quick, first look, was um, a foot higher. But I mean, again, these are something. These are things that staff reviews when when the, these um, items are submitted. And I don't think it was anything ill will on the applicant's part. I just these are things that we review. So um, we we can't really speak to whether or not you know based on this development at this moment, you know whether it's apples to apples. Good to know. Appreciate that. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just flipping through my notes. I'm trying to go as quickly as possible. I'm at the conditions. Okay. Um, I want. I want to. Um, one, the condition that we have about phasing um, is is very important um, because when when. Projects, not just this project, any project, when projects are first submitted, that's, and, and at a scale like this, it's one of the questions that we ask first because understandably, sometimes development gets built at different times. And we ask that question um, since the first time they submitted, you know, is this going to be a phased development? Um, because the way we review the plans and what we recommend is different if it's phased versus, versus if it's built at one time, right? We want to make sure the perimeter landscaping is there. We want to make sure the infrastructure is there. We want to make sure any types of improvements that are required for the DRI by our code or by things that just need improvements to the site in order for it to fully function as a full development, that it's constructed at the time when the first building is done. So that if somebody comes in and says, well, I'm not doing phase two, or I'm changing phase two, we have that foresight and, and saying, okay, well, at least we planned ahead as planners, right? to have these types of conditions. And we're not saying, um, we're just asking for the opportunity to review a phasing plan, which is very normal, um, so that we can then bring it back to the commission um, for review and approval after, after we've reviewed it. And that's usually a good time to, Cornerstone did it, there, there's, developers will come back to commission um, to, um, to review phasing plans as necessary. And it's a good update type of thing too. Oh, I'm, there's, sorry, I'm getting tired. Mm -hmm. Tina, if you're only getting tired, you're better than most of us. <laughs> I was pumped for tonight. 
<laughs> um, there was a question about the LMA and whether or not um, it would be uh, needed. And, and um, I want to say, you know, Amara does, I, it's been echoed here before, Amara does a fantastic job um, on their developments. I love the walk. My husband loves going there. Um, we go there often. Um, but uh, we, we didn't put this condition in because we felt that the landscaping wouldn't be maintained or they wouldn't accomplish what they needed to with the landscaping. It's a code requirement. It's a requirement of this specific conditional use. So it has to be there unless the commission, if they would like to ex you know, request a special exception for it, approves that. Um, I guess Matt's lucky I'm out of time or I'm getting tired. I think that's it for me. Thank you. All right. You're complete, Tina? You're complete? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sure we have questions. I know I have a few. I'm going to ask the first one, then I'm going to let Commissioner Mateo Bowen go. Uh, so you heard, you heard argument, if not testimony, about you know these units and how they shouldn't be allowed, and then you heard from the petitioner saying they could, without seeking special exceptions, have I don't remember the number, but sounded like could be over a thousand. Uh, what do you all say? The number of units? Yeah, without having to file a special exception uh, for this acreage, what could be the amount of units built? The amount of units that can be built for the whole downtown is 1,200. 2,400, yeah, but um, there have been approvals since then. Um, so I wrote that down. And you can, you can investigate it and come back to my question, and we'll go to Commissioner Mateo Bowen's questions now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My first question is, um, can we create or enforce or prevent trucks or trailers from driving through residential roads? There's, I can answer that. It depends on uh, several factors. Um, one is the width of the road. One is whether or not the surface of the road uh, can maintain the, 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 the tonnage. Um, and uh, there's also some, there has to be another access for, for the trucks and also whether uh, on, on the sides is residential. There's a statute that, that addresses it. Just just heard about this tonight personally, but there is a statute, and if it meets part of that statute, you can have a no through trucks. I'm not sure that this one does. I haven't had a chance to look at that. The reason why I pose this question is to limit that um, traffic through um, broken woods, um, just seeing if that can be a, a solution there. Um, so I don't know if you can investigate and then get back to us. That's something I would like to. to know. That's absolutely not tonight, but not tonight. Yeah. I know, obviously, yeah. but yeah, get back to us at two, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my next question is around lights on broken woods. I know, staff, we've brought that up several times in this conversation. Is that something that we're looking into? I'm looking over at um, Frank. city manager. So I have not been sworn in. Am I permitted to answer, John, or you want me to have staff answer it? Staff's better to answer that if you haven't been sworn in. The question was related to rights. Oh, we've requested um, from... Broken woods. 
um, for Broken Wood, staff has reached out to the county to request um, a light, and they've stated that until um, the development is constructed, they wouldn't, um, they don't, wouldn't normally um, have a study like that occur because um, they base their studies on, um, you know, the what's occurring at that moment, not projected. Not um, street lights. I'm talking about. Um lights overall because it's very dark in that area um, and they've expressed several times that their neighborhood is dark. I think we'd have to work with public works, public works on that to see. Okay, perfect. And I'm not sure if this is a staff question or a developer question. Um, possibly adding the gate, would that be something that we would do or something that the developer would do if that's a decision we would like to move forward with? Well, we would need to research first if that, if, if having a gate at Broken Woods so you're not able to enter the neighborhood. So um, we would need to research if that is something that we would be able to do because it's a platted um, uh, street that's dedicated to the public. We want to know more information and see how that would affect us. N nothing to reduce speed, um, maybe, we could certainly look at different traffic calming measures and work with Joaquin to, to you know, drive the site with us or walk the site with us and certainly um, work with the applicant team to um, determine which is best. I appreciate it. That concludes my questions, Mr. Mayor. Great. Anybody like to go next? Commissioner Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I wanted to talk about, I guess, some of the... Uh, some of the staff recommendations. So item B, um, as, I, as I'm looking at this and we talked about phasing and I think as a, uh, I think the petitioner, the applicant mentioned um, that they are looking at doing two phases. So, um, Do we need to change, I guess, item B on the staff recommendation? Well, um, if I don't think so because I think we've covered it. Okay. Um, be, only because giving us the opportunity to review a plan that includes phasing um, would allow us the opportunity to see which conditions need to be in the first phase versus which conditions need to be on a second phase or a third phase if that's proposed. Okay. Um, on item D, uh, which talks about the, uh, it says petitioner shall work with staff and the city's traffic consultant to minimize traffic impacts of Coral Hills Drive to eliminate the right turn out of project site onto Coral Hills Drive. Uh, that first part, why did you, I guess, why did staff not recommend uh, no ingress or egress onto Coral Hills, or I guess on or, yeah, on or from Coral Hills? Why just the right turn and not anything else? In working with Joaquin, and, and again, we spoke about it tonight even before he left, so my apologies, like I said, he had a family emergency, but again, the traffic has to be able to come in and out of the project. So if we start closing all of the other ones, except for, let's say, sample right now, if, if the petitioner is, is um, stating that the county is unlikely to give them the entrance at University Drive, um, then everything would be going to sample. And then what impacts does that have to sample road? Now, while we do have a condition that they have to lengthen the median opening there so that it can store more cars, if every single car for the development and all the trucks are then only going to one spot, we're creating a, another bottleneck somewhere else instead of having multiple entrances, like most of our plazas do in the city and most of the developments do in the city, by limiting down just to one, I think is gonna create problems other places. Right, gotcha. Uh, for item G, it talks about the uh, restrictions on delivery trucks. When there was the discussion or the decisions made about Costco, if I remember, and maybe I'm remembering wrong, wasn't there some requirements put on the delivery trucks times as far as like when they could or something like that? Uh, 
I, I don't remember. Was it the 7 a.m.? Was that made citywide or was that made just site specific? They offered that up just similar to what the applicant is doing here because we had the same concerns because in that case, the loading was also facing the residential. So we had those same concerns about evening hours and stuff and they made that same concession. Do we need to add that to staff recommendation for item G? It would certainly strengthen it so that we wouldn't have a problem with that if, if the commission wanted to add that. Okay. Uh, two, two more questions. Um, we've heard a lot tonight about traffic calming measures um, with regards to broken woods. Um, but I know there are certain traffic calming measures generally that could impede emergency services. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess what would be some of the, in your opinion or in your professional opinion, what are some traffic calming measures that wouldn't impede or become problematic for emergency services? And I don't know if it's just you that could answer or? Sure, so um, a few years ago, you may remember we also adopted um, standards for our speed humps, speed tables, things like that within the city. Before that, we were really kind of doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. And when we adopted those regulations, we also worked with fire, we worked with PD on that, on what those needed to look like in order not to impede emergency vehicles. So if they were to meet those standards, then theoretically they would be okay. Um, the, I think the idea for broken woods, you know, maybe something, um, we, again, we talked to Joaquin about this, maybe a speed table as you enter into the neighborhood, like at the canal there, just so that it doesn't look quite so open and inviting. And, and if you're going back there, you know you need to slow down before you even enter within the neighborhood. Having, and then moving over to Coral Hills, Coral Hills is a collector roadway. We traditionally don't put um, traffic calming such as speed humps and things like that on collectors for that exact reason. Emergency vehicles want to come out of the, the neighborhoods and head down those collectors to be able to get to their arterials to get to where they need to, to go. Having, having said that, we know there are already speed calming, traffic calming chicanes, the kind of little mini roundabouts that are along Coral Hills. The commission recently approved, um, I believe it was about $200,000 um, for us to go out for design for Coral Hills to add new sidewalks and then we also included as part of that project, looking at the traffic calming that's out there right now to make sure that what's out there is working properly, make sure they're in the right spots and to see if there's any improvements we can do to help slow down the cars on Coral Hills. Um, I don't think it will affect the number of vehicles. Um, we recently did, a, to, did counts at certain spots along Coral Hills and when Joaquin reviewed those counts, um, it's still working with acceptable limits for a collector roadway like it is. And uh, well, you kind of answered my, my last question about the improvements on Coral mm -hmm. Hills. Has, have those improvements been communicated to the community as far as like what, you know, as far as the design or the potential potentials for improvements? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, that's kind of our lead in. We just had our kickoff um, with the consultant that we hired. Um, so uh, there will be a few public meetings. We um, actually worked into the contract with the consultant that there, we there would be outreach and public communication and education as part of it. Gotcha. So it's coming. Yeah, and I mean, and in, in, in transparency in our agenda brief, and I asked about expanding the roundabouts, um, you know, to not be such a short little turn, but maybe, you know, make it a little bit more, you know, uh, of a, a roundabout that slows you down as you get around it. Um, but that actually, that conversation was in addition to, uh, in addition to this briefing versus it being a part of. So these are improvements and things for Coral Hills that have been in the works uh, prior to this. Uh, and with that, Mr. Mayor, I'm complete. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Carter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The only question I had was 1A, has an, um, on staff recommendations. I mean, I heard multiple comments tonight that they are unwilling to comply with that, Whole Foods. That's our understanding from the petitioner as well. Um, so if the commission chooses to um, approve the special exceptions relating to the setbacks for that building, then you may want to remove condition A if that's um, a concern. What is condition A? That the building one has building to be on university. Say no. that again? So there's no street parking. The, the building has to go forward to university, right? Yes. Correct. Right. 
Uh, Vice Mayor. Okay, um, just this afternoon we were briefed that we got involved with conversations with Whole Foods. Is there a scheduled follow-up? Uh, not at this time. Um, so just out of curiosity, I mean, I know bits and pieces, but what was their position of the call? Um, we walked through a vision for the downtown and kind of what we were hoping to see and what the other developments are going through so that we wanted to make sure they, they kind of understood the whole picture as well. Um, and they expressed to us that the design as it is right now um, meets the the vision for what they're they're looking for for this site and they think it provides the best um, the best site for their customers. Um, the, the layout is the best for their customers right now, the most convenient and the most appropriate. Okay, thank you for that. Um, as far as the exceptions that were listed and then um, the petitioner obviously um, was putting a lot of great thought and, and trying to make some recommendations that were different than what you guys have reviewed. Have we been able to identify what numbers those are? The recommendations to change the plans? Well, you guys reviewed the plans, you made your recommendations, but then there were some modifications that were presented tonight that were We not. have not had a chance to review it. Mm -mm. No, I know, but do you know which numbers those are? Yeah. If oh, it would be the related to the height. Um, if you give me a few minutes, I can tell you exactly, because some may overlap. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, so you're complete, Vice Mayor? I believe I am at this time. Okay. Yeah, and if you uh, come up with something else, that's fine. So um, I'm going back to my original question, uh, essentially checking on what their attorney had uh, indicated was, well, this proposal is only for 400 some odd units they could actually do considerably more. Um, so based on what has already been approved, um, I think my rough calculation was about 1,300 units, and that would be for the entire downtown area. Remain. So on this site, you know, if, if they, they could potentially flip, let's say, the development and fit, um, w without looking at a site plan, it's hard to see how many units can actually fit on a property because um, there are several um, things that we need to take into consideration. I'm trusting you guys with this question. And it's not an easy question to answer. Your staff, you have some new information. You're processing the new information. Would you like us to move to continue this hearing? Yes. I'll entertain a motion to continue the hearing, if there is one. Up to you guys. But I'll share with you a little bit more of my thoughts. Can I just clarify that, Mayor? I'm sorry. And not to, to negate what Tina said, but yes, if the petitioner plans on making a formal submittal, because just the diagram that we have is not the full picture of the changes to the building, so that wouldn't be enough for us to come back and give you a 100% answer on what it may or may not change for the project. Um, so that, that would be one caveat there, and, and I don't know to what extent they're they have changed the overall plans yet of the elevations of the building and the site plan itself to match the diagram, basically, that they've showed you this evening. So JJ, I'm gonna to look to you for a little bit of guidance and a little bit of wisdom. Okay, um, I will tell you that that being an issue, I would ask the petitioner if he is planning a formal submittal. We're asking. Not quite sure what would be involved in a formal submittal. Is that a complete new DRI, DR, DRC submittal with everything, or just a site plan that shows where the adjustments are? The elevations, I'm trying to understand the site, how much. Okay, site plan and elevations. And the elevations. Mm -hmm. So you, you can hold on to your answer for the moment because I have yeah. two commissioners on my right that would like to be heard. So hold on. And Commissioner Mateo Bowen first and then the Vice Mayor. With that submission, can we also include um, the phases 
be planned for the various phases and how that would be planned out? If, I mean, absolutely. If that is what they're requesting, we would be more than happy to review those plans and provide a recommendation based on that. So I'm going to explain to everybody the context in which I, um, I made this request and is engaging in this dialogue. Um, you know, this is a tough meeting. It's a tough decision. I, I don't think there's any person in this room that is uh, wanting, oh, let's have something and have these children, um, you know, that live in broken woods and that you know, maybe observe the Sabbath and your kids are out and if they're my kids, I want them to be safe. And I want to make sure that my commission uh, is fully engaged in protecting my children. And I also have, you know, I think fantastic developer that's been invested, is invested in our community He's invested a lot more than money. And if you've gotten to know George to whatever extent and his family, he's not interested in the bottom line of dollars and getting out of here and rolling. He's invested in our community. We have to walk because of George and his family and because of collaboration with the community and whoever was engaged in steady staff back then. Um, and I don't want there to be a necessarily winner and loser. And you hear, you know, this is a process and it's an imperfect process. And ideally things would look one way or another and we don't have those ideals. You know, matter of fact, you know, part of the world we're living in and we're kind of insulated in some ways is crazy. And we have an unbelievable, beautiful community here, and we want to keep it that way. So I just, so my context is I, I believe, I believe there's an opportunity to potentially create something that has a lot less division and a lot greater safety. I believe that. I don't know if anybody else does, but I'm sharing with you my belief as your mayor and as your fellow citizen, you know, if I was if I was out there, that's what I would have shared. So that's my context. Over to you, Vice Mayor. Um, great comments. So my rebuttal to this is not to take away from anything that you said because I was heartfelt. My concern is that if we don't give the petitioner a clear direction on where we stand, they could potentially go back and modify this to the, what they feel we would agree to, and then they come back and it gets voted down. And I don't think that that's the respectful thing to do to the petitioner, and that's not why I invested six hours in this meeting. I think we need to make a decision tonight on what we are agreeing to or not agreeing to, and, um, you know, because, I mean, I'm, I can't share what I'm voting for or against, but, um, you know, just based on what I heard, um, I'm going to still have no votes on some of these exceptions, even with what they're proposing. So um, that's just my thoughts. You know, we'll vote on it, but I, I think that um, kicking the can down the road is, is not, and at least in my professional opinion, and the reason why I'm on this dais is to protect and defend this city. We want the very best project. We want to make sure we're supporting the residents that are impacted and the people that were part of this hearing. Um, we're going to go through the entire process again. Uh, I, I'd rather make a decision tonight on um, the things, the exceptions that we could live with and the ones that they absolutely need to revisit. I, I can I truly respect what you're sharing, Sean. And just to be clear, there is no such motion on the floor. But I appreciate the conversation and being able to share the context and not having a negative judgment about my context. Anything on this side? Okay. Uh, further questions of the petitioner? Anybody else besides me have questions of the petitioner? I mean of the city. So I have, I have a few. Um, 
So I did read uh, Mark Magley's <coughs> uh, email that he sent on Sunday. And one of my questions is how many apartments could be built within 100 feet away from the Magleys? If you know that answer. I don't think staff can answer that. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how many could be built between 100 and 250 feet? I can't answer that. No problem. <clears throat> there were some uh, exceptions that you were not agreeing to between the mid-rise, so 16 through 20. <clears throat> Can you explain a little bit about why those special exceptions would not work? And this these have to do Exhibit with B the special setbacks. Exceptions. These, with the setbacks, correct? Yeah, so 16 is apartment C, apartment mm -hmm. D, 17, apartment B is 18. Sure. So um, over, overall, um, our DTMU zoning district calls for minimums and maximums, right? Um, in order to, we call it in urban design or um, planning world, world, world placemaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, in order to have a, um, in a relationship with the buildings as a human, right? When you're walking down the street, all of our great um, downtown areas, across the world have similar characteristics and usually that is um, having providing for those um, uh, sidewalks building and with that human walkable perspective so is it your position that the exceptions they're seeking between 16 and 20 would essentially take away or substantially reduce the walkability uh, certainly for building one, um, in terms of, um, providing for that setback and that building, um, to the, the street kind of feel, um, that's not in line with what the code permits. Um, but, you know, the, the 32 foot setback, um, I know they had mentioned previously that they, um, were providing for, you know, increased sidewalk widths and landscaping. Um, they have a 12 foot sidewalk in that area. Um, and as Julie had mentioned previously before, that is additional two feet that could be given to the residents in the rear. And Mary, if I may, before you go to the sure. next question, and staff is giving you our technical yep. recommendation. Mm -hmm. What does the code require? Why does it require that? And as we spoke about earlier, it, there's a difference between when you're starting with a blank slate, like this would be, versus making additions and things like that. We're giving you our recommendation based on the criteria of whether or not it's a burdensome hardship to meet those minimum and maximums. Now, if the commission decides as part of policy with this project, you know, we, we think it's worth the additional landscaping, we think it meets the criteria in order to provide those things to help with that placemaking, then by all means. But that's where staff is coming from with our recommendations on whether or not meeting the code is, is meeting that hardship or not. Okay. So the petitioner was distinguishing about the code that really maybe code should talk about feet as opposed to stories. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about the code actually talking about both. So to me, can you reconcile what you're both sharing? Sure. Um, so I, I mentioned it before, but you know, the the code section that speaks to the maximum amount of stories in relation to residential zoning districts, that's to ensure that um, you're, you're stepping back the, the, the buildings in terms of height to reduce the impact on the residential neighborhoods surrounding the project. Um, so we do have minimums and maximums for each floor. 
um, I'm sorry, we have maximums for each floor that then determine how much, uh, what your height can be for the number of stories that you have. So uh, they also made a comment about there could be a 10-story building on this land. Is that accurate? Um, along the, the road, yeah, potentially they could. It could be multiple 10-story buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they wouldn't have to seek a special exception. We, 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 don't, we don't know that without reviewing plans. Okay. But on, on its story alone, yes. On the surface, it would mm. appear. Gotcha. Depends on the particular plans. Yes. Okay. So have you ever said yes to 15 special exceptions in one, like one, you know, place setting? I, no. Okay. Um, how you and Amara began discussions two years ago mm -hmm. about this? I, actually, it's one of the, maybe the first projects that I started working on, yeah. Gotcha. Could we have had a five-story city hall where the old city hall is? I, I don't Outside know. Outside of the 250 context. feet, potentially. Okay. Right, because the 250 feet is anything above the four stories as well, or it allows for five story. Yeah. I'm getting confused. Okay. Did the citizens that spoke up tonight from two particular areas, did they have input into this prior to the last three months? And or could they have input? prior to the last three months into what was happening in this quadrant of downtown? I can't speak to what the, de how, what the developer did on their own. Aside from the developer. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, could they have had input in terms of the plans that were submitted to us? Again, I'm gonna give you some context to my S question. Sorry. Well, and it's really for everybody, but oh, you have to step me through some, some of this, yeah. So there are a few people I've seen here tonight that I've seen several occasions on different things. And there's probably about 30 people I've seen here tonight for the first time. And so I'm wondering, is some of the disconnect because of a lack of awareness of ability to come and be heard, you know, or ability to engage in our visioning process or blah, blah, blah. In other words, kind of aside from the developer reaching out to the community, that they were potentially impacting and or definitely impacting, what opportunities have we given them over time to share their input before these last three months, if at all? Specific to the project or for the downtown? Downtown. We had many community meetings when we did the rezoning. Mm -hmm. Um, multiple that were, they were in the old city hall. We met with um, several times with business owners, property owners, um, developers. Um, and received input from all of them. Um, we did many mailings with that. We also have done numerous forms of outreach when it comes to vision, visioning that's going on right now. I think part of, of the, the folks that you may have seen, a lot of them were from the hills and they have other things that have been going on within their community that I think now they're, they've become more savvy on how to stay involved and where to look for things and, and questions to ask of us even on how to stay involved. And I think that's maybe newer for, let's say, the Broken Woods community. And over the last few weeks, they've, they've certainly taken to it and, and are asking questions and giving good suggestions and things like that. For sure. I've, I heard a lot of good input tonight. I think that's all I have. I want to double check my notes. Because I was writing in about six different places. Same. Joy, did you have something? Yeah, I just had a clarification question on the 10-story building with no exceptions. Is that re relative to the Live Local Act? No, no, that's what our code allows. Okay. Mm. And that's not just within the downtown. Uh, B B2 throughout the city mm -hmm. allows for that 100-foot height. Okay. Could you point to any particular special exceptions that you are not in alignment with that really directly relate to the safety issues that were expressed this evening? 
So again, there are 29 special exceptions. You are all recommending yes to 15 of them and no to 14. Of the 14 that you're recommending no to, do any of them stand out for you as to somehow relating specifically to the safety issues expressed by any of the residents this evening? I don't think it's the special exceptions themselves. I think we are trying to address whether or not they're real or perceived traffic concerns and safety concerns via the conditions we've included for Coral Hills, University Sample, and Broken Woods. Gotcha. Combined. Gotcha. Okay. I'm satisfied. You've answered all my questions. And you're doing great. Thank you. All right. So uh, next in this procedure, if I recall correctly, yep, I have it in front of me. Uh, and Final presentation of the city in response to any testimony from the other parties. It's our discretion that the petitioner be permitted to respond to final staff recommendations. Uh, so, Commissioner Carter, you have the most consecutive tenure here. What's your wish? All right. Uh, so essentially, would you like the petitioner another opportunity to respond to what staff just said? Okay. okay with you all? All right. So petitioner, if you'd like to respond to uh, what the staff has shared, you're welcome to. Uh, I don't think at this point we want to formally respond much other than to say that we understand the items we proposed in the way of mitigation of the concerns um, put staff in a difficult position to weigh in on them. So if the commission is inclined to um, approve the special exception to the conditional use, we'd be amenable to a condition consistent with what staff often does, which is that we continue to work with them on the north side heights where we can, because they need to look at how we're modifying it and then also the safety concerns or the roadway concerns because those were the two biggies the, the major ones great okay thank you thank very you. much thank you very much so uh now we get to deliberate on the petition john do we need do we need a motion before the deliberation um i think um you can talk for a couple of minutes before you, you do a motion mm -hmm. but just to remind <clears throat> what we're going to do here is look at these 29 special exceptions, whatever your decisions are, then there's conditions, A through T, um, from staff, which is in your agenda package. Um, so that, that's a two-part process. I may suggest that part of the conversation may start with um, staff's recommendations to approve the, the special exceptions. Is the commission generally good with those or not? And then you'll have to go through the other ones. Sure. Than the conditions, but that's up to you, Mayor. Great. So, so I will ask that question and entertain any one of you to answer initially. Uh, are you all okay with staff's recommendations at the least for the 15 special exceptions that they're recommending uh, be given? The, the ones in green. The ones in green, correct. I mean, staff doesn't have a problem with them, and that's fine, but. Right, that's why they've agreed. And uh, Commissioner Mateo Bowen? Yes. Commissioner Simmons? Yes. Vice Mayor. Okay, so we've got that preliminarily. Who'd like to share their deliberations first? In, in, I'm things like, we're concerned about. <laughs> now I'm ready. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go left to right. Thank you. So this is things that we that have been discussed tonight and things that we're concerned about or right. things that, yeah, okay. Or things that you love. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that did not come up tonight is the fact that University Drive is being expanded to accommodate all of the traffic and traffic issues that we're having. And I'm taking a straightaway before I'm cutting through a neighborhood any day, speed, just speed related. Um, the other comment was how uh, traffic is worse with, um, 
commercial, residential, retail, and all that. So traffic is actually worse with commercial retail than it is with residential. And I know everybody's concerned about the number of residential or units downtown, but that doesn't generate the traffic that commercial and retail does. And the, the last point that I, that I need to make, and, and the first point I should make is that we are concerned about children, very, very concerned, hence the, all these discussions. But most people are not gonna remember back to 2003, 2004, when the market did, I'm a, real, I'm a residential real estate agent, and the market did this, and the rental inventory that we had in this city converted to condos. We lost our rental inventory. So this is replenishing what we lost. And that's a big deal because every community does need rental inventories. And then we were talking about pricing. A one bedroom is for rent right now, not in one of these buildings, $1,500. A two bedroom, $1,800. A three bedroom, $2,300. In single family, three bedrooms start at $4,000 and a four bedroom is at 5,500. Aren't you glad you own a single family home right now? Because rents are ridiculous. And maybe that's why developers are interested in having rentals. But the point is, is that rental inventory is being replaced from what was lost in this city. And those, those were points that weren't brought up tonight. And, and then lastly, as a residential real estate agent, when I am showing high rise buildings, you have got to walk to the sliding glass door or the balcony to see down. If you are in the unit, anywhere, the kitchen, the bedrooms, anywhere, all you can see is straight out and maybe a couple of floors down. But you cannot, unless you go to the balcony or the sliding glass door, see all the way down. And that's how people live. They live in their homes. They generally, I mean, if you look around a balcony, you see even now, you don't see a lot of people hanging around on their balconies, but the opportunity is there that they certainly could. If I bought a home, a single family home, and it was located next to a commercial piece of property, I have to be assured that there's a potential for change next to that property. You know, it's, it's not a given that it's gonna stay the same. And for many, many years, that view was a 100 foot communication tower that recently was removed, or within the last couple of years, it was removed. But that was your view for a long time. And that's, I'm not excited about disappointing you at all. Yeah, would, if you don't mind, please. I, I, I am looking at him, I and I think, I, he was, I think he was justified to respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No problem. Commissioner Simmons. All right. Uh, this is comments, too, as well. So yes, I'm going to be talking for a bit. No problem. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I got papers all over the place. All right. So let's see. How am I going to do this? Okay. Um, so let's talk about the things I would like to see or not see. Just... If, if I could just wave my magic wand and things and, and everybody would be happy and, and, and I'd be happy with this. Um, apartment D, I would love for that not to be there. I'd love for that pocket park to be an actual park. I don't even, I don't really like the term pocket park. It just sounds weird. Um, uh, I would love for that to be a, a general park. Um, I would love for uh, if, if apartment D and A are reduced to four stories, I would love for garage B to go to five stories. Uh, as far as, and I'm, I'm trying to work my way across this entire thing to get out everything. Uh, for Coral Hills, I, uh, we all know what happened with the school board, and I, I hope people still aren't trying to blame the city commission for that because I thought we fought as hard as we could. And fought against an unfair situation as far as what happened because we actively really worked hard to try to keep um, this area zoned for MSD. Uh, and so I, uh, even even when, uh, you know, people tried to use this development as saying, oh, well, Coral Springs doesn't care about the number of students or whatnot going to, you know, coming into this area, and that wasn't the case. Uh, as far as completely closing off Coral Hills, and shifting traffic, I don't know if I can completely agree with closing Coral Hills completely off. 
I do agree with um, staff recommendation of um, of uh, what was that one? Staff recommendation was uh, no no right turn. I think it was right. No right turn out onto Coral Hills. I'm 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 okay with that. Um, I will say Coral Hills is a collector road, and obviously it, it's. For us to talk about all these words and things like that that often run into reality, um, I know that it is crowded. Broward County period is crowded. We've run out of space as an entire county. I'm the uh, liaison or representative for this commission to the MPO, and so we're dealing with traffic issues throughout the entire county all the time, and Coral Springs is no uh, different than most other of the 30, uh, the other 31 cities uh, in Broward. And so as far as that, I, 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 you know, would love for that to happen, but I don't want to impact traffic so much in a way that it, it creates other problems elsewhere. Um, as far as Coral Hills, I would love to add a condition. Uh, if this project were to get, or the exceptions and everything were to get approved, I would love to add a condition to add a left turn arrow, uh, a left turn arrow out on that light uh, from uh, Coral Hills because um, that, inter that intersection already is a nightmare to you begin mean to with. have a light. Well, the light, the light's there. Oh, there is a light. It yeah. doesn't have the actual left. All of it is the yield left turn, but they actually have a dedicated left turn light. Um, so that's that. Let me keep working my way across. Um, As far as, I guess I'll go up to Broken Woods. I would not like that entrance to be there. I would love to keep the entrance on university. Um, I think I think that's, I mean, I'm not a fan. Obviously you have to have flow for people to get into the garages on the backside. Um, I mean, even as I look at this way, I see it, I, I just see, I don't know what traffic measures will be put on this back road going through the development, but I just see people speeding through that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's problematic for all kinds of everything for pedestrians and the people that live there. Uh, so as it stands for me, I don't, I don't like that entrance, uh, back there. Um, the, the entrance, keeping the entrance on university. And I'm sorry, I don't, I, I can't control what the county does. I can't control what any other level of government does as much as I would like to. Um, I think you all have seen me speak enough about Tallahassee, which I'll get to in a second. Um, as far as, as far as the frontage of uh, building one, um, I, I don't, I am not one that gets moved by names. So cool, cool the Whole Foods wants to come. I'm reading this as building one and what could go there. Uh, and I am okay with it not being fronted on the street. And no, it doesn't match what the other developments are doing, but you know, the landscaping and everything if done properly will look very beautiful uh, in that area. Uh, I mean, we still have the charter school there. There's all kinds of just stuff uh, going on. Um, but you know, I, I am okay, okay there. Uh, as far as the ap apartments, and I've, I've kind of spoken about this before, um, I get that people have some negative view of people that live in apartments, um, and I, and I wish that weren't so because people commit crimes that are single-family homeowners. People commit crimes that live in apartments. People commit crimes if they're not in any of these. People commit crimes. Period. <laughs> Um, and I, and I, I would hate that we continue to do that. As I've said, my story in Coral Springs started because I was able to move into an apartment with my sister who I was her guardian of and a dog, and we had been trying to find somewhere to live for two days, and we were living in a, a, a thing because we just couldn't get into a place yet. Um, and we were able to get one here in Coral Springs. Uh, and so, you know, uh, and even sometimes as a homeowner now, I wish I still lived in an apartment so I didn't have to try to fix everything myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so as far as the apartments go, and, and we've talked about this, I mean, ad nauseum, 
no one could have expected what happened in Surfside, right? And um, and and a lot of what we and, and honestly, as a commission, we've learned quite a bit more because of what has happened with Cornerstone uh, and some of the changes and things that have happened there. It wasn't that we were falling asleep at the wheel. It's just we had to understand a little bit more about this entire process. And Florida is a developer-friendly state. And I really want everyone to think about that. We are starting to see the ineffectiveness of the Florida state government. Look at our insurance market. Florida is a developer-friendly state, and that's not an, a negative attack on developers. People are just doing their jobs. People are going to make money however they're going to make money, however they can make money. Um, and that's not the case for Amera and the, the, the applicants um, because we know them well. They're great people, good people. They do some incredible work in the community, not because they want pats on the back or because they want to – curry favor but because they actually do care about coral springs um but yes florida is a developer friendly state and so as has been said and i really want you guys to think about this um if we were to you know do take an action that tanks this entire project somebody could come in they could sell the land to whoever they could come in and build whatever it is they want, as long as it meets the code. And we would not have any say at all. Is that what? what you just well, 40% affordable housing and all that. But in general, if, it, if somebody came in, met the code, they could build whatever it is they want to build, and we couldn't say much about that. And a lot of you wouldn't get that. A lot of you would come here and scream at us. And then when we would say, we can't do anything, you would get mad at us even more. Uh, you know, uh, and th that's kind of how it's been going. Uh, and so I think some of the emails, some of the things we've gotten, I, I appreciate everyone reaching out. Um, I wish everybody was still here hanging out with us, mm -hmm. uh, but I understand families, things like that. Uh, I want to thank you all for expressing your concerns and reaching out. Uh, I don't think the people that were being mean and nasty, I'll never, ever think that. I don't care. Uh, there's no room for that. Um, but for all of you that have been just pleading and asking and trying to figure out how to, you know, get your concerns heard, we do appreciate you being here. And, you know, this is what this is all about. I think I heard a couple of folks say, you know, what about the people's needs? That's where it comes to us when we hear from you, right? The city is going to do their job as far as what's best for the city. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, the developers are going to look at what do they need to do for their jobs as far as what it is that they, what project it is that they want to bring. As far as the people, your voices have been heard. We have heard you. We've, we heard everything from the PNZ meetings and, uh, social media, cause we're on social media. Uh, <laughs> we see and we hear, uh, and we got all the emails. I think I, I've seen every single email that came in on this issue. Uh, and so I, I just, you know, um, none of us came in here with our minds made up on this decision um, at all. And because we know how important this project is and how big of an impact it is, not just to your area, but unfortunately the entire city. And I think I really want you guys to think about that, too, as far as the five of us up here who uh, you couldn't find a more caring commission in this entire state. And we know because we, we get to see them all. Um, the struggle for all of us is that we have to think about the concerns of this area versus the entire city. That's always the push and pull here, right? Uh, and uh, so while you know we're going to try to make the best decision that we can, um, I have said the two, I think the two, oh, the setbacks. Sorry, the setbacks. Um, I did speak about kind of what I would like as far as the setbacks. Um, I don't know, you know, to be honest, if I were in my backyard, I don't know that I would want to see, you know, such tall buildings. However, I do understand living, I live, I live up against Riverside Road. 
Um, I have a two month old, so everybody better wake up because I'm up. Mm -hmm. I don't sleep. Everybody better wake up. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of noise that's on that road, but you know what? Every time I hear something, or I hear some Mustang with some tricked out kid driving down, speeding, Chief, Chief McKean, speeding down Riverside. Um, you know, I, I won't say I don't get mad, but I'm just like, you know, hey, I live up against Riverside. It's a busy thoroughfare. Um, and so it, I also understand that living up against a commercial project, this is a massive, massive massive project i know that uh and we've been dealing with issues of change and how things used to be for a few years now and i've been very clear on the record saying that if we don't progress and innovate as a city then we begin to lose and that was something we were headed towards um uh eight almost almost a decade ago and so uh we are doing our best trying to balance this uh trying to make sure we are hearing what's going on uh, and, uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, that's, that concludes my comment. All right. Very good. Commissioner Mateo Bowen. Thank you, Commissioner Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first and foremost, I would like to see the entrance in Broken Woods closed. Um, I would like to open the entrance on University. Um, if Whole Foods is not okay with this set up, I think we need to revisit what grocery we put in there. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to be innovative and really create a vibrant downtown with green space and gathering spaces in which the developer has worked really hard to do. But I've said time and time again, I do not like the amount of units um, in this project. We already have Cornerstone. We already have another where the old Publix is going up, an apartment building going up there. Um, so super interested to hear if we can have multi layers of retail and try to see if we can decrease the amount of units there because I want to go to a downtown where I'm entertained. I, I, I just don't want to go somewhere where I'm staring at a bunch of residential, especially in a housing crisis. Like, we can't even fill up Cornerstone. I'm, I'm not hopeful we're going to be filling up these, these apartment buildings. But that's my opinion, and um, that is the type of thriving downtown that I had envisioned, as well as I would love to see places where um, ride share drop off somewhere. If it's gonna be a downtown area, like where can people be dropped off and picked up? I don't see that, especially we've talked about freebies, like where are they going to park? I do love that we are having the um, supercharging stations here. I think that's super important as we're trying to be a little bit more innovative I would like to see a privacy wall included on in this project, as well as folks have talked about safety and privacy. Um, I am not a fan of the pool on the garage, being that there's no public access and this is supposed to be downtown. It would be fun if it was a, a rooftop bar or something and folks can everybody can enjoy it, but if it's not open to everyone. I don't think um, it, it should. We should include it in the project. I still would love clarity around um, the park. Who's going to maintain that? Whether that's the city or the developer, um, because then we have to look at our general funds and maintenance and staff, and that's an added expense. So it's either, yeah. Let's let's discuss that. Um, I do like um, pushing the project a little back so folks can park on the roads to make it a more walkable or for folks to have that separation. Um, so I do like that, um, what the developer has shared. I would prefer to see public art than a fountain. 
Um, and I know that is something that um, the developer has been pushing. Um, and yeah, I, I when I envision downtown, I want a place for me and my husband to go out on a date night, enjoy a meal, enjoy a drink, enjoy live music, um, not to be pushed up against a bunch of residential property. Mr. Mayor, that's um, my comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to go about this a little bit different. I'm going to take the exceptions that um, I have concerns with and then the ones that I could support that have been not um, recommended by staff. I want to start with the America, America Group, but I'm going to be brief on my comments. Um, respected developer, I heard comments about greed and they're chasing the money. That couldn't, at least in my heart, be any further from the truth. Um, in all the years that they've been developing in Coral Springs, it's my understanding this is their first quasi-judicial hearing. So, I mean, that must stand for something. Um, but I am gonna say that, you know, I am concerned a little bit about um, the approach that we're taking here. I cannot support um, exceptions one and two in 27 and 28. I'm not in favor of um, going from um, five stories to eight. I'm not in favor of additional rental. I would like to see that space um, revisited like the petitioner was willing to do. Um, so tonight, you know, I won't be supporting one, two, 27 and 28 for those reasons. I can't support three and 29. Um, I was just based on the fact that I feel that there could be some additional office space there instead of apartments. Um, and also I'm, I'm keeping uh, 1, 2, 27, 23, and 29 with the residential impact that they have by not being in code. We heard tonight that um, they could put additional apartments on the property. If that's the case and they meet code, um, then it wouldn't come to this commission and it would be that. I know the Amero group well enough that they care deeply about this project. I don't foresee them putting 1,200 departments on that corner. Uh, I know that they want something that we're very proud of. They articulated that. Uh, but once again, um, and I've echoed this in previous items, I just, I feel like the downtown does need to have office space. I don't feel like we need to increase the amount of rentals um, so once again, for 1, 2, 27, 28, 3, and 29, I can't support. Um, you know, I went through the entire process and hearing on 4 and 14 about Whole Foods. I visited Whole Foods on 17th Street. First time I've ever been in there, to be honest with you. Um, same thing when we were talking about Trader Joe's. Never went to Trader Joe's in my life until we started talking about bringing Trader Joe's. I went to the Trader Joe's down on Federal Highway. Um, because I felt like I needed to take in that space. Whole Foods looks like a, a phenomenal grocer, but what I'm struggling with is this is our project, and Whole Foods is dictating what we're doing, and I have a serious problem with that. Um, I can't approve Forum 14 for the simple fact that they've been in contact with them for over a year. Our city just got in negotiations or talks with them, and um, we don't have a follow-up meeting. So if Whole Foods really wants to come to Coral Springs, they will do it the Coral Springs way, not the Whole Foods way. So I hope, because I hear that they're a driving force in this project, I really hope that Whole Foods will come to the table with the idea of being a partner with the city of Coral Springs and not dictating to us how this property is gonna be laid out. Um, as George mentioned, um, I have no problem supporting 16 through 20 um, and previous opportunities that we voted an inch here, a foot there. I don't really think that that drives a project one way or another. Um, so I'm going to be openly saying 16 through 20 is fine with me. I've heard from the Broken Woods, drove through that community. I love that community. That's a hidden gem. I gotta be honest with you, I haven't driven through Broken Woods in a long time. I did look drive through it when I was looking um, to buy in the hills. Um, 
I love my house in the hills, but I would proudly buy a home in Broken um, Woods. And I, I love the kids being in the street. I got three kids of my own. That's what we lived with in Eagle Trace. And that's why I loved Eagle Trace. Um, I would support whatever we need to do to protect that community. Um, definitely in support of a right turn only. Um, you know, putting whatever signage with the trucks, uh, figuring out if there's an opportunity to, um, you know, make it more secure. And I'm in full support of putting an entrance off of University Drive. I, I feel that the University Drive entrance is critical. Um, right now you got one on sample. It, it doesn't even make sense to me that there's not one on University. And I do feel like the people that are driving into that space and enjoying the amenities that are there would probably appreciate an entrance off of University like we have off a of sample. For Coral Hills, um, I'm in support of a left turn exit only. Um, I would like to challenge staff to figure out what the impact would be with the left turn in, um, but I definitely don't wanna see the Coral Hills, Coral Hills community um, become a cut through, uh, which it could potentially be if that left turn in is there. Um, we have the challenge in, in really looking at this from every angle. Staff had a really tough job. I was really happy to hear a lot of people say positive things about staff. Um, I interacted with them today on a different project and I'm pretty damn proud of our staff and what they do. Um, they are having uh, the residents' best interests at heart, uh, but they also are wanting to support the developers in every way and that includes the Amerigroup. Group. Uh, another thing I'm struggling with is the P&Z. This is a committee that we have for a reason. They did not, su they supported staff's exceptions, um, ones that they were for and the ones that they were against. Um, I mean, like I said, I can, I can buck that a little bit with um, 16 through 20, but I, I just can't do that for, for the others. Um, I'm not in favor of two phases unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and that I was pushing for this conversation to be now um, because I respect the family too much. Uh, whether I'm, my position is the right one or the wrong one, I just think that you guys could have come back after done a lot, doing a lot of work and spending some money and it could have gotten voted for or might have gotten voted down. So. I'd rather just put it out there now, where we stand, let staff go after it. I think we gotta get whole foods to the table. And I'm just gonna close by saying that um, I was looking forward to this meeting because we get to actually make a decision. And we have a big job here because people vote us into these seats for a reason. And we do have to take everyone's position into consideration and this is a tough vote um, but it's a necessary vote for the future of this city and I've been a resident here since 93 and my last breath will be in the city of Coral Springs unless my wife tells me differently <laughs> and um, ultimately um, we have to protect and defend everyone so we heard a lot of voices tonight I encourage you guys to get involved um, not only for when things get questionable or challenging for you personally, um, but you know, get involved. We got a lot of committees and a lot of opportunities to have your voice heard, but also give you a sense of opportunity to lead. Uh, at this time, those are my comments. Great, so I'm gonna follow up immediately on two of the things that our vice mayor said. Uh, and one is for those of you, it's your first time really engaging with us. We have lots of openings on different committees. You have ideas, hopefully you have a little bit of time, and you becoming that much more connected with your city, uh, we're gonna collaborate even more and potentially even earlier than we did in regards to this particular proposed project. Uh, one other tag on to what the vice mayor said is my biggest issues uh, similarly are with request number four and 14 um, I put double circles around them, uh, three X's around them. Um, and essentially this is where, you know, Whole Foods are making these unilateral demands that are really pretty far uh, from our vision and 
certainly very far from my vision of downtown. So I have the unique position of being the only member on this commission uh, that's here now, you know, and was here back in 2002 around when the vision was created. And yeah, the vision has changed uh, to some extent, market interests, uh, economics, uh, but we still have a very similar vision. We want entertainment. I want live music. I want a rooftop bar. Maybe those are not possible. Uh, and I'm not a developer. I don't have the expertise of Amara and George and his family. Um, so, I, and if I, as you really listen to the five of us, all of you, the public, city staff, Amara, we don't have an, a great answer yet, but I can tell you, we will. I have no doubt, we will. I have no doubt that Amera wants something to work that works. And I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that there are other options because if you close out 4 and 14, my understanding is Whole Foods says, you know, don't worry about the safety, we're not coming in. And uh, for me, that's probably my biggest issue. So I also want to share that I get uh, the context, the context and intent of the petitioner. Uh, because truly, as they shared, relative to the residential and commercial retail and the other corners, they're presenting the most other opportunities that are more in alignment with our downtown vision. Um, and they could be presenting something else. They might be presenting something else with another you know, 400 units. It's possible. Uh, we've heard that that's possible uh, without necessarily having special exceptions. And what I'm hopeful of is that the vision that, George, you were part of helping to create back in 01 or 02, uh, and of course, you know, all of your uh, commitment and your family's commitment to the growth development of our community. Uh, I think all of you and your children live here still. Um, that's a great commitment. You, you want your developer to live in your community. Most don't. So for those, you know, for those few that had concerns with the agenda of America, I hope that, you know, those concerns are addressed. Uh, in regards to, you know, just about the profits. Definitely not just about the profits. Uh, I'll also go down uh, the items. So I question about items one and two, about eight stories and the height. I'd like to engage in a little bit more discussion with staff and city attorney and our city manager about that. I don't necessarily have to say yes or no to that because I'm definitely saying no to four and 14. I'm not sure about the other three commissioners. Uh, in regards to item three, I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm okay with the garage being six floors and uh, having rooftop amenities. I think that sounds good. Uh, I like the public art pad that will be part of number five. Again, we've accepted all the things that are in green. Uh, I'm okay with number six uh, being uh, moved forward uh, despite staff's recommendation against. Uh, again, I'm not okay with 14, those spaces fronting university and sample. Um, just not my vision for that. Uh, I'm okay with 16 through 18, uh, not much more of setbacks than what they're looking for. Um, because of the reduced walkability and leased with 19, I would not be okay with that. And I've got a question mark about 20. And then in regards to uh, 27 and 28, similar questions because of the story uh, limitations. Uh, and again, I'm okay with 29. Uh, but just overall, I wanna share with everybody, I appreciate the process. I don't mind working late. Uh, I put the context out there about a potential uh, continuation wasn't taken up. I respect the answers, and I'm also happy to give a definitive answer uh, before we leave this evening for everybody's sake. 
so, you know, the commentary is well, well accepted by me, Vice Mayor. Uh, definitely keep the entrance on university. Uh, no doubt about that. I want us to find out about uh, the issue regarding that road uh, that is just south of Broken Woods, if that can be worked out so that's not uh, a safety issue. I, I believe in order for us to get to where we want to be as a community uh, and continue to diversify our tax base and continue to want to have our children become 28 and 29 and then raise their kids here. We need entertainment. Uh, we need venues where we can gather uh, and more than we currently have. Uh, we need that. So we need someone like Amera, I think, to help us achieve that vision. Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that, you know, if this is denied this evening, uh, that with your solution orientation uh, and ours, there'll be another solution that will be created. I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, it's certainly, I don't have that answer right now, but I'm very, very hopeful. I also think part of, you know, part of my hope is that, you know, you have some creative people that are in our community that shared some good ideas tonight that I might have heard from the, for the first time. So now that so many more people are engaged, you know, I, I think there is better chance for solution. And one other concern that uh, concerns me too is this is a unique neighborhood that has unique uh, values on the Sabbath, right? And that's a Saturday, you know, Friday night to Saturday sundown. Uh, and I wanna make sure that those concerns and that neighborhood is addressed uh, to the, in the best possible way. I think that's all the comments I have for now for my deliberation. So with that, any further deliberation from you all? Yes, Commissioner. And I, I want to make sure as a resident combative commissioner here, I want to make sure people understand we're making these decisions because we have thought deeply through this and not because you wagged your fingers or yelled at us or mm -hmm. put together some nasty email. No, that's not why we made these decisions. We made these decisions because we actually care uh, and care about our job. and. Um, Again, to, to the applicants, um, I want to thank you, and I forgot to mention this, for meeting with the residents, for meeting with the communities. You guys have done more work to get engaged with the community than I've seen any other um, developer do. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I, really, I, I, I saw it and I, I appreciated it. And I know our, our commission appreciated it. Um, yeah. And thank you, and I didn't thank staff. Uh, for all your hard work over the years and and being available and responsive and creative and you know sharing openly and you know I, I've never seen 15 exceptions yes I've never seen it you know I'm serving for a lot of years so so a lot went into really paying attention to the nuances that Amara was sharing with you as to why this code uh, why we should allow for these special exceptions this evening I want to say thank you to you all too. Uh, further comments, John. What's next? So um, you and, and and the vice mayor started, and, and that may be the starting point of going through the special exceptions uh, that are not recommended by staff, and see see where we're at with that. I think. So I'll go to my left then first. I'll start with you, Commissioner Carter. I like that idea. Uh, would you mind going down items, uh, you know, the white items and letting us know what you either say yes or no or question mark to? And I'm happy to take a tally with a different pen. Um, anybody have an extra pen? Blue one? I know George has a blue pen. You got an extra? Ah, Michael. Thank you. I'll tally. Thank you very much, and I will return it. So, Joy, let's take items one through four first, if you're ready. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you, uh, would you agree to go ahead with one through four despite staff's recommendation, or are you agreeing with staff's recommendation to not move forward with it? Can, 
Mr. Mayor? Yeah. May I? Um, before we do that, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, but the petitioner on one through three, despite what I just said on my position of it, um, we offered them an up. They basically said on one through three that they had different vision than what you guys have already reviewed. So, you know, in my opinion, despite my position on rentals and office space and what I said on one through three, not for me not to support it, um, I don't think it would be a good practice of ours to support one through three if, if the petitioner has um, some ideas to get in line with code and compliance and staff hasn't properly vetted and reviewed it. But, but I think, that's, I was gonna say, I don't know if it's the issue that's on the floor, right? And that's, that's what we have to Okay. Right. Okay. That, that was the option to continue. Right, with that. yeah. yeah. All right, but that's what I'm saying, maybe in the motion or some. Uh, well, there's no motion yet. Right, yeah, so at this juncture, we're kind of doing just a tally, and then I'm gonna ask for a motion, but you'll hear what each person is saying about items one through 29 that are in white. And, it, and yeah, go ahead. I know we're going down the tally. Can really quickly staff clarify what exemption number four is? I, I apologize. Julie, you want to take that one? Sure. Number four is relating to the amount of buildings that are, that are right up against the road along University. So in this case, they're not meeting it because they're vastly exceeding that with building one where it's set back. So if you look, Nancy, on the requirements section on the left, the vision is at 75% minimum, and when the request is around 10%. Commissioner Simmons, did you want to share something else before we go to Commissioner Carter? All right, Commissioner Carter. So on item number four, I mean, it's not part of the vision of what the original code was. You know, I do like the idea of the trellises to make it look more attractive. So that's where I'm kind of lost on. So kind of a question mark. Yeah. Okay. And then how about so, one through three? So I could three. say that I would support it with the exceptions of design and stuff like that, right? Sure. Okay, I would say that for number okay. four. Um, and for one through, one through three, um, this plan that's here wasn't the one that I had met with them and discussed, so I would prefer to see a modified plan. Okay, gotcha. And then uh, item six. I think that's minor, that's acceptable to me. Okay. 14, um, again, that's that's a Whole Foods requirement. I didn't, it really, I, I'm not a fan, because it doesn't meet the, the, well, you know what, I said for number four, we, it'd have to have exceptions for design And we already agreed on 16 through 20, right? Or we didn't agree on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, well, I'm Sean fine with 16 yes through 20. To, I believe yes. all five. But most of them were minor. Huh? Um, 27, 28, and 29. Um, that's the same one. I have a question on the ultimate design. A. Oh, no, wait, that's A. Oh, no, that, that's the same one, yeah. So question marks to 27 through 29? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right, Commissioner Simmons? <laughs> Birthday boy. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right, so for item four, I cannot support. Six, I support. 14, no. 16 through 20, yes. Oh, sorry. 
one through three you okay with? Four, no, no, I'm, I'm coming back to them. Gotcha. Four is a okay. no. Mm -hmm. Six is a yes. 16, six, 14 is a no. 16 through 20 is a yes. Now, one, two, one, two, and three, 27 through 29, they're connected. And I'm trying to figure out, because I don't, I don't like how close the buildings are to the property line. Um, but I also recognize that we need to change the code when it comes to zoned commercial areas. So I'm trying to figure out um, kind of where to, where to go with that because, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have the same questions. I don't have an X or a check next to those. Right. So I, 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 just, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out is like what, which one of these, which one of these, in, in staff's opinion or staff's understanding, between 1, 2, 3, 27, 20, 28, 29, which ones are about the proximity to the residential homes? Technically, per the code, they all are because it's <laughs> it's within that 100 feet and then the 250 feet. It's not necessarily the 25 foot setback because that is permitted by code. It's that they all they're all necessary in the location they are because of, of where they fall within the edge. If there were changes to the code regarding zoned commercial or mixed use areas, which if that if the if, if that if the code was changed to accommodate certain height requirements with regards to a mixed use zoned area, I guess that abuts or is close to residential, which one of these would fall off between one, two, three, or twenty seven? None 30? of them, because the code already does that. By by us creating the edge, Last we time. created that zone for these these buildings to go in and still be at a different height to accommodate for the residential behind it. I am not asking the right question. Okay. <laughs> um, <sighs> See, I'm leaving mine as question marks. I don't think they can answer my questions about this readily. Yeah, but we but we yep. we need to make a decision. Right. Yeah. You'll have to make a decision tonight based on yeah not continuing. We yeah, so here. without me having enough information, my, my answer will then be an X for my question mark. There will be a motion <clears throat> made on all these special exceptions in a second. Correct. There will be votes. So. I'm giving you my visual. Okay, so as I am reading this and how I am trying to understand this, while me saying that I do not like the height of, let me make sure I'm very clear, the height of the buildings as close as they are to the property lines, um, I am not. I am. I am not in favor of 27, 28, 29. And I am okay with one, two, and three. Okay. Well, according to my tally, you have now covered each of the items in white. Sorry, y'all. This is so long. Nothing to be sorry about. All right, Commissioner Mateo Bowen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, no, one through four. Yes, five through 13. No to 14, yes to 15. Hold on, I'm, gonna, I'm doing the tally too. So uh, I'll go again, I'll go again. Thank you, and just a little bit slower for the, those that are a lot older than you. Oh my God. I'm teasing you. I'm one year No <laughs> to one through four. Yeah. Yes, five through 13. No to 14. Yes 
5 through 20, 15 through 20. Yes, 21 through 26. No to 27 through 29. Gotcha. Okay, so so these are my tallies in terms of majority uh, per se. Uh, you'd have two passes for one, two passes for two. I'm unclear about three. One, two, three. No, you'd have three passes for three. Uh, insufficient passes for four, uh, sufficient for six, no for 14, yes for 16 through 20, and no as a majority from 27 through 29. <clears throat> so you could take a motion on that if you wanted to. That's what I'm asking for now. Sure, so what I have in terms of the majority tallies uh, is one is a no, two is a no, three is a yes, four is a no, six is a yes, 14 is a no, 16 through 20 are yeses, and 27 through 29 are noes. And Mayor, the other thing that we need to do, and I don't know if we want to break it up, would be then the conditions that staff has recommended also need to be addressed. Yeah, so the conditions that staff has recommended are iterated on 144 and 145 of the agenda. And it goes from A to T, with A uh, indicating the grocer tenant proposed within building one, with setbacks along University Drive, and T is upon substantial completion, the conditional use shall run with the land and may be transferable from one owner to another. And then you have all of those other uh, recommendations for conditional use in between. And one of the, the highlights of this uh, is F, Petitioner shall work with staff to revise site plan to maintain existing driveway opening on University Drive. So does anybody need any further clarity? And Mr. Mayor, I think we, I need, we need to add, right? Um, so we, the, left, the left turn arrow. On we did. Hill. We had, yeah, I didn't mention, but I, I also asked for a left turn exit only on no, Coral Hill. the arrow at the, the light. Arrow. Yeah. The arrow. Yeah. Arrow. That's what on I meant. On sample. Yeah. yeah. For Coral Hills. Yeah. And then also. Um, the garbage. The, the 7 p.m. The, the, the required time. Um, for the garbage. For the loading. For the the delivery trucks. trucks. The <laughs> required time for the delivery trucks. 7 a.m. Um, 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. No. 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. No, they prohibited come in 7 a.m. to okay, 7 Okay, coming, yes. Yeah, they are allowed. Okay. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and also the closing of uh, Broken Woods. I think that needs to be stated. It's not stated. It just says the maintain the entrance on university, but I don't think in the conditions it says anything about closing. But there's currently an entrance there. You don't have clear consensus on that. I think do we, do. we have. There is currently an. I thought, I thought everyone been said. There since <laughs> no, but the I'm, shopping center was built. I'm pretty sure we all said closing Broken Woods. Oh, well, I don't know. Broken Woods. Not everyone. I don't think. Yeah, well, we're I not sure if we no can left turn. make that requirement. I, I okay. The entrance is still there. I would say no left turn. Entrance From has always been there onto Broken Woods Drive. No left turn onto Broken Woods Drive. And yes, the entrance has always been there, but it has been a highly underutilized area for a very long time, I think. Adding, I used to work there. Yeah, I know. That was my entrance. That's yeah, a fully well, yeah, but I mean, item where it would be better staff will work. Yeah. The petitioner, there's no guarantee we can get that done, so. Yeah, I don't think we, I don't think we can't a guarantee. But that's what John is recommending. Well, I just talked with Julie and it's fully platted, so. Okay. We have to work on that. Got it's you, okay. Said, okay, all right, so then that, so. 
But you could say work, staff will work with petitioner if, if this goes forward. Yes. Eighteen feet was Chick Fil A. Yeah, that was yesterday. Um, so that was yesterday. Tina has been taking notes while you all have been speaking about different conditions you were hoping to see. So would it help for her to run through? Sure. What she's captured while you all have been giving us your thoughts and see if we've captured everything. How, does that we'll does that do help? One at a time, and okay. we'll get five <laughs> nods. Hopefully. <Yeah. laughs> Nancy, CJ. So these are the conditions that I, that I heard while we were in discussions um, that are in addition to what we already have on paper. Okay. okay? And I'm just reading off my raw, raw notes, right? So um, make it an actual park, right? So we want some, um, we need a condition there to make it a park open to the public and to clarify who is maintaining that park. Consensus on that? Yes? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I heard, I'm, not speaking to the actual special exceptions and what we want to do to them, um, unless like to reduce the garage height. No, right? No, I don't want to. Okay. Um, add left turn arrow on to the light for Cor Coral Hills Drive. Yep. So we have that one, right? Um, we talk about. We spoke about broken woods. Um, I heard green space and gathering space. So I don't know if that wants to be an addition to, or if that's um, including the park. Um, the supercharging. No, add, yeah, that would there is the park. You don't need to add okay. a special condition for that. Ride share drop off pickup. I don't have consensus for that. Uh, supercharging stations. I think that was already in that, it's already but I think there. that's in here. No, no? so I want to just be clear. Okay. They introduced oh, that, that as right, part right, of their right, presentation. Right, right. Oh, okay. That was not included on their plans and not something that we had as a condition. They have EV charging stations on their plans, but not superchargers. So if you would like that, that would need to be I a would. condition. Okay. okay. Yeah. I heard privacy wall. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion talking about Costco, but please remember if there is a, um, a wall that is um, conditioned, if it doesn't meet code, it needs to come back to commission for a special exception. So if we, okay, by May. on the north where, property where, okay, line. Is this wall, where is this wall going? Is it going completely behind the entire? If you want to um, make a recommendation that they work with staff to provide a wall um, with sufficient screening, that we could certainly do that. Um, and if it's something greater, or if you want a minimum height, we can look at that too um, when they resubmit plans. Um, we just can't guarantee that they won't be required to come back to you if it's vague. Well, and if it's specific too, we'll need to come back. So again, uh, I, th I thought that was to uh, block off broken woods. Am I misunderstanding? No, a privacy wall along the rear property to um, a, a adjacent to the residential. Gotcha. Okay. I'm okay. Okay. With that. I'll, I'll keep moving on unless you tell me to stop. So, um, Yes, traffic calming measures um, that I think um, we have spoken to traffic circulation and that are conditions for Coral Hills and that's um, the light on Broken Woods Drive, but if you would like a, us to look at additional traffic calming measures with Broken Woods Estates that would need to be um, stated in your condition that we work with the applicant to um, propose additional traffic calming measures. Okay, you have consensus there. I heard something about a no, no left turn, um, no left turn into the project site from Coral Hills Drive. Um, if that is something that we need to seriously look at, then we can. 
That wasn't part of what they were speaking about. No, okay. No, because then that would completely close no. yeah. the hills. Okay. And I think that's all I had. The, okay. oh, sorry. Would you like to make right. a motion, Commissioner? Well, hold on, Mr. Mayor. So the petitioner um, said that they would do a, a no left turn on onto is it onto Broken Woods? Broken right. Broken Woods? Onto Broken Woods. That, Was that uh, is onto? Onto Broken Woods, and that could certainly be something that could at, be added as a condition or be included as that traffic calming measures that we could take a look at in terms of signage. And that's because that's we may not be power. able to, we may, we cannot make a condition to close Broken Woods, right? As I understood. That's right. part of the work to see if that can be, that entrance can be closed. <laughs> We're fine with that. I think you have. I would, I would say, I guess, yeah, in the, I guess that that's a part of that entire yeah. thing then, right? Okay. okay. <clears throat> The, the the entrance to the the, the mall I mean to the to the, the commercial property yes uh, but because it's platted as a public use we can't make any commitment or requirement for that at this juncture and staff already recommended no right turn onto Coral Hills out of the project right okay um, Okay, yeah, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Okay, would somebody like to make a motion? And do you need anything to be clear while or before you're making the motion? Nope. Move to approve the list. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. <laughs> that they presented? The, 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 the motion is consistent the with the- people listening and recording. Motion is consistent. Um, you all tallied and agreed to the special exceptions by majority, and the motion was made would be made based on that. And the conditions uh, that you all agreed to, including the additional ones through Tina and the ones you brought up, we have a record of those. There's a lot. I don't think you can actually list them right now. Okay, I was about to do. So you can make that motion. Okay, I move. Hang on, Sarah. Okay, oh, sorry. I move to approve the special exemptions that we've all agreed on and tallied and discussed, in addition to the list that Tina and team has drafted. Yes, and staff's conditions. As indicated in A through T on pages 144 and 145. Yeah, and just to be clear, the special exceptions, not all of you are in complete agreement with all of them, but what we did is we tallied, and those that were the majority became part of this special exception. Either that or you'd have to take each one of these motions separately. So uh, your motion's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Carter. Discussion. <laughs> We're all kind of, and we have all three right. other things on the agenda after this. I, I just want to be clear on what numbers I'm voting on. Sure. Want me to help you? Or you want to share? Um, no, if you could help me, that'd be great. Yes. So uh, by majority, you have uh, items three, six, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And let me double check. That's it. And right. did I say item three? Yep. Right, plus the ones that are in green. And just again for the record, that's 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. Okay? Discussion. Vice Mayor? I'm in agreement of the motion with the exception of three. I think that if we're voting against 29, it makes no sense that we're voting for three. I agree. And if we're saying that 
We're concerned about the setbacks and the impact to the residents, and we're not supporting one and two, but we're supporting three. It makes no sense to me, but that's just my right. end pick. Perhaps because building seven's on the inside. Commissioner Mateo Bowen, further discussion? Yeah, um, I'm in agreement with the vice mayor. I, I'm not for number three. Um, so then you want to amend your motion to take away number three as yes. moving forward with. I would like okay. to amend the motion to deduct uh, request number three. And now I forget who second. I think it was you, Commissioner, that seconded it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I did second it, but I support number three. Okay. So, so you'll need a second on your amended motion. Okay. Discussion on the amended motion. So for me, I still support number three. Uh, I'm okay with the garage being at that level. Uh, I did see the relative elevations. I recall that. I was okay with it then. I'm okay with it now. Um, so I'm, I would deny this particular motion because of that change. Any further discussion? All right. All, if you're in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 If you are not in favor of this motion, say nay. 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 So the motion fails uh, two to three. Looking for a different motion. Unless everybody has to go to the bathroom. I make the motion that we move the previous list before that, including number three. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion. So I just wanted to share one thing from the criteria for conditional use approval that you see on 149. Um, and one of the conditions is that the use does not negatively impact adjacent residential areas or other existing proposed uses. And in context of the evidence that was presented to me, I do find that there is a safety issue uh, and that the residential areas are negatively impacted. Uh, and that's why some of the special exceptions that the uh, petitioner have sought, um, I'm not in agreement with, especially the two that I highlighted earlier. Any further discussion on the motion? So all in favor, go I was, ahead. I was just gonna say, Mr. Mayor, as far as you, you mentioned at the elevation aspect uh, with regards to the garage and plus, there's a whole nother building attached, you know, there's a building with it as well. Um, so that's why I still moved forward with number three, but um, I still stand by what I said as far as the proximity of the, um, the general buildings towards uh, the residential line. And hopefully that's something we can look at in our code in the future. Is that what we're talking about building good. number seven here? What's that? Are we talking about building number seven here, right here? Yeah, no, not, that's, yeah, that's building number seven. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, that's where I'm confused yeah. because I had I had building seven detached from garage B. Okay. My apology. I thought they were two separate buildings. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. So I have to amend my motion. I have to go back to her because, yeah, because I thought building seven and garage B were separate. I didn't realize building seven was all the same thing. Gotcha. So we, we're hearing a new tally then. Sorry. So give me can John, going to you. Joy, you were on the prevailing side of the motion uh, that was made because you voted against it in one. So you could remake that motion I'll being on the prevailing side if that's what you'd like to do. Okay. So I'm going back to the original motion. Okay. Right? Yeah, it sounds okay. like that's what you want to do. Going back to the original oh, motion. You're going back to the original motion that Nancy is that, that, that Commissioner Mateo. Because I'd like to see the building revised. revised from this plan. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. So is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I think this is important because the affected parties shared the line of sight. And I think as we continue to move forward, the affected parties have shared um, a safety concern. 
as well as um, just a lack of privacy. I do understand that they purchased the home considering that commercial commercial property would eventually be built there, but not to impede on their privacy. So that's my discussion. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion? Sorry, Mr. Mayor, we're gonna keep this thing going. Uh, again, for me, it's garage. Um, cars moving through. Uh, obviously, it's a lot different with the apartments, you know, people being static and whatnot. Um, so just want to make sure I add that one. Okay. The record. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any nays, say nay. It's, yeah, it's her amended one and three moves forward as a no. Okay, so we're an A. <laughs> All right, so it passes four to one. We are complete with that item on the agenda. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for your input. Yes. Oh, that's right. That is correct. That was that one item. And now you have item number three, which is a conditional use petition, City Village CA 23 0001. And now we'll hold a public hearing, another three hours. You ready? No, just kidding. Uh, so we'll entertain a motion to approve, authorize, and adopt. Want to make the same motion, Commissioner Mateo Bowen? Yes, I would like to make um, the motion that we approve the agreed upon exemptions, including staff's recommended exemptions and including items a through t on the correct pages in the agenda is there a second conditions correct is there a second for the motion second all right any discussion all in favor please say aye 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 any nays say nay all right carries unanimously and now I believe we're up to city commission comments. <laughs> Are we, am I right? Yes. I would like to do a possible turkey drive and or a food giveaway or some way, shape, or form, or either Thanksgiving or in between Thanksgiving and the holi the December holidays. Can I do that using my commissioner title? Sounds good to me. Okay, cool. I'm done, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> And it looks like there are no objections to that. Commissioner Carter, you're next. Um, I just want to remind everybody that the Peace Walk is Saturday at 8 a.m. at the International Peace Garden. Peace. Peace. Peace all the way, for sure. <laughs> Commissioner Mateo Bowen. Yes, I just want to remind everyone I have office hours um, every second and fourth Wednesday of the month, but this month I'll be having it on the 13th, and we'll be talking about um, housing counseling. Uh, so if you all would like to attend, please contact Luam at 954-344-5911. And if anybody would like to reach me, please reach me at 954-254-8880 or email me at nmateerbowen at coralsprings.gov. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Vice Mayor. It's been a privilege spending uh, your birthdays with you guys. <laughs> and um, I can be reached at 954-612-7114. Thank you. Great. So uh, I'm uh, going to do my next coffee with the mayor and veterans, hopefully Wednesday morning, January 10th. Today's coffee was great. We had several veteran services, and uh, it's always great to get together and celebrate our veterans. If you're a veteran, thank you for your service. Hope to see you all on November 11th. Uh, if you're a Marine, uh, there's a party. Uh, going on on the Marines' birthday, November 10th, at GW Sharkey's. It's veterans' own uh, Rich Kushner, and it's a great way to connect with the community and connect with veterans. And if you need to reach me, my cell is 954-494-9872. Email is sbrook at coralsprings.gov. And I'm complete. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, real quick, um, so Friday, November 3rd is Love Your Lawyer Day. So, John, thank you. <laughs> you and all your staff for everything you do. Love your lawyer. Huge day. Huge day. <laughs> awesome. Saturday.
Saturday is our final. Oh, God, yeah. Right. <laughs> there you go. I love it. <laughs> our pizza party. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's your, there's your team right there. There you go. Um, and then Saturday is our final 60th event with our pizza party. Yep. Happy birthday, Coral Springs again. Pizza party Saturday beginning at five. Five to nine, and you have to pre-register. Great. CoralSprings.gov slash forward slash events. All right, John. Happy birthday, Josh and Joy. Have a great night, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>